वन थैंक यू पूनम and we are now live on auto tv and we have a very nice session lined up for nearly 4 hours it's going to start now with our first speaker dr shantaram shetty from india and he is going to tell us about avm of the femoral head dr shetty thank you good morning uh, dr arindam and uh, dr fadil hello our, morning uh, our chairman good morning uh, dr fadil and uh, dr arindam the chairman of this session and good dr tanish good morning good morning good morning. it is indeed a pleasure to share few of my thoughts on this very important subject avn of the femoral head the diagnosis and management for a postgraduate student uh, either it is asked as a as a, in the theory a 10 marks or a 20 marks question or very often especially in india it is kept as a long case in the clinical examination so we'll go into the level of postgraduate level and deal with what to do and what not to do in avn of the femoral head osteonecrosis of the femoral head is called this lecture will I, will entitle uh, history definition etiological factors proposed pathogenesis clinical presentation and the evaluation and classification and staging the natural history of the disease and finally the management as for the history it was Cohen noted the condition way back in 1888 and uh, he said the vascular occlusion as a cause of bone necrosis was thought to be the primary cause of osteo necrosis and term it as a vascular necrosis which became popular hennish in 1925 later numerous causes he added on to this interesting condition well osteonecrosis of the hip was first described very scientifically in 1738 by monro and as an incapacitating disease primarily affecting the active population in the third and fifth decade of life and the causes are varied pathogenesis even today is poorly not very well understood with the male predominance of 4 is 2 one ratio by definition osteonecrosis is death of living elements of bone cells including the marrow with progressive destruction and alteration of bone architecture as a result of compromised vascularity i repeat as a result of compromised vascularity thereby it is a vascular necrosis of a particular part of the bone and uh, coming to the etiopathogenic mechanism for osteonecrosis your books will mention nearly about 22 causes i will just go through the main causes just just for completion the one of the important causes is vascular disruption which you classically see as a, as in your in, in the slide there the the femoral head fracture which which you would appreciate there there is a after the after the pinning has been done you would appreciate there is a, a vascular necrosis at the head of the femur the number two is vascular compression or constriction with the increased intraosseous pressure as you would see in the next slide and otherwise it occurs as a intravascular occlusion with the thrombosis of the main vessel it can also be due to hypofibrinolysis embolization direct cellular toxicity like irradiation or altered differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells due to alcohol and steroids it can also be due to intravascular occlusion as i told you thrombosis through to thrombophilia low protein cns activated protein c resistance factor v mutation and hypofibrinolysis and finally embolization either with fat or air and and also in sickle cell occlusion it can also be due to direct cellular toxicity like pharmacological agents like irradiation and oxidative stress finally altered differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells altered differentiation with with steroids or with alcohol induced what's the clinical presentation usually in the initial stages it is asymptomatic 
followed by pain, which is regular or irregular. Pain appears with mobilization with night pains at a later stage. And with a gradual increase of pain, with the collapse of the femoral head, where finally the movements of the hip will be diminished. Ultimately, the symptom and signs of result in an osteoarthritis of the hip joint classical. Radiologically, you must appreciate osteopenia is seen early in the course of the disease. An young man coming just 20 to 25 years of age with odd pain, when you take an X-ray, you may not see anything except for osteopenia, which is followed by sclerosis, which is diffuse, and density changes of the involved region, which is followed by cystic changes and development of irregular dense areas with the subchondral lucencies, which is called the classical crescent sign. And finally, it will result in a half moon sign on radiogra radiographic represent subchondral fracture and collapse as, as, as you see in the next slide. The loss of shape, form, and finally the flattening of the bone. Finally, it results in secondary arthritis of the joint which develops as an end result. MRI has a very important, as an important tool in the diagnosis, especially in the initial stages of AVM. With the decreased signal intensity in the subchondral region on both T1 and T2 images, as you would appreciate here in the arrow, which is shown there. And followed, which is followed by a double line sign which is which which you see here as a double line sign which you see here as a double sign double line i mean double line sign with the depression of the subchondral bone and which is due to fluid fill in the subchondral fractures which is equal to a half moon sign as you see the half moon in the sky you would appreciate a beautiful half moon there Coming to scintigraphic scanning, a donut sign has been described in the initial stages, which is cold in hot. Later, the area becomes grossly hyperemic. Biopsy also is indicated in some cases, but it, usually it is a clinical and then a radiological and an MRI, MRI diagnosis. But for completion of the list, I'm just putting bone biopsy just to show what, what is happening in avian as you, as you would appreciate in that slide, that there is a granulation tissue surrounding the areas of, of bone necrosis, area of creeping substitution and sequestration, as you see here, round with the granulation tissue and uh, almost a sequestration. Various classifications have come into vogue in AVM. Ficket and Arlet classification, which was the first classification which came into vogue, was divided in from 0 to 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But the 0, 0 and 1 are just almost normal radiographical. And only in, in bone scan, there, there can be a decreased uptake or a cold spot in the femoral lead, and an MRI is almost diagnostic, especially in grade 1. Whereas it is grade 2, it is mild, density changes in the femoral lead. Grade three, moderate flattening and present sign, and moderate to severe joint space narrowing will occur. Senberg et al. further classified into almost seven, which almost like Bittender, Fickett, and Harley, but he he classified according to the 15% and 15 to 30%, and, and severe if it is more than 30% of the affected head of the femur and graded as 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5, and 6. Finally, 6 as then one degenerative changes as the difficult and are like that. It is interesting, Karpal et al. came out with this uh, beautiful, be beautiful picture and a beautiful classification, which is a prognostic sign with an MRI, with which gives you an idea what, what prognostically, how will that patient do? As you see in the A and B, the anteroposterior and lateral view, you put a, put, put an angle to the to the height, to the height, to the edge of the avascular necrosis, as you, as you see here, the edge. As you see here, the edge is set. So combined necrotic angle is taken into consideration. A and I mean AP and a lateral view. And the combined necrotic angle is called the CNA. 
and it is modified based on MRI. If it is grade one, it is less than 200, uh, 200 degrees. If it is grade two, 249 degrees. Grade three is 299 degrees and grade four is 400 degrees, which predicts the possibility of collapse of articular surface. And thereby, if it is more than 200 to 249, the prognostically it is poor. And even it emphasizes what treatment has to be undertaken. Carbol et al, this is, this is the, what I was telling, CNA more than 240 degrees is high risk. What's the natural history of osteonecrosis? Usually it is asymptomatic, 30% 30, 30 of the area of the femoral head is involved. And it is shown to remain asymptomatic in most patients, 95% for more than nearly five years in many cases. Whereas large lesions, more than 50% of the area of the femoral head involved, usually it is painful, osteonecrosis is increased up to 83%. Coming to management, management in avian is mainly surgical. Conservative management is undertaken only when there is a comorbid condition where it cannot operate, or primary lesion is so advanced that joint preservation is not possible, or the protected weight bearing plus adjuvant therapy has been indicated in these cases. What is protected weight bearing and adjuvant therapy treatment, uh, treatment uh, of course? Usually, it is bisphosphonate is the mainstay. Patients with, if it is patients with hyperlipidemia, lipid lowering agents like stenozole can be given. Patients with coagulopathies, warfarin or low molecular weight heparin can be given or stenozole. Or transplant patients have been found to get relief from calcium channel blockage. All these evidences from the various publications have proved that uh, the treatment of femoral head with a combined bisphosphonate combination, combination therapy does give re results. And it is interesting to note out of the, out of the six I have, I have put in here, three papers are from India. Coming to protected weight bearing again, you can also inject prostacycline analog eloprost. Many papers have come in. Pulsed electromagnetic fields, Extracorporeal shockwaves have been tried. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy has been tried. Bone marrow injections have been tried. And finally, bone marrow aspirate and platelet rich plasma has been tried with variable results. <clears throat> well, what is the surgical treatment of osteonecrosis? If the hip preserving methods are either code de decompression, vascularized and non vascularized bone grafting, fibular graft, or any other graft. Osteotomies of the proximal femur, different osteotomies. Osteogenic strategies like growth factors have been taken into consideration. Otherwise, an osteochondral reconstruction also has been described. Whereas, if it is advanced stage where there is hip sacrificing, it is the hip orthoplasty which is the mainstay. I will just to complete the list, hip orthodesis and excisional orthoplasty is rarely indicated or I would say not indicated. Coming to bone grafting procedures, techniques, this is the light bulb procedure described by Rosenwasser. You would appreciate in this, in this slide that the trap door is made and a graft is put in and pushed into the trap door with the trap door procedure into the head of the femur. If it is a non-vascular bone graft, as you see here, it is either taken from the iliac crest or from the fibular, vascular or avascular fibula or even a tibial cortical stud graft has been described as you see in that slide. Or local, various local pedicle bone grafts have been described, the mares, the tensor facial atta, the gluteus medius sartorius, and eleosuous muscle pedicle graft have, have been described with variable results again. Coming to osteotomy, a student should also, an Indian student also should know about different types of osteotomies uh, being done. The typical indications are an young patient, stage two or three disease, arco staging or any other staging, limited disease in the femoral head that can be substituted by healthier region. All that is done is that the head of the femur, which is healthier, after an osteotomy articulates with the weight bearing area of the acetabulum. Various angular osteotomies and rotational osteotomies have been described. This slide would, would show you with defect 
either the medial lesion if it is a varus osteotomy lateral lesion if it is a valgus osteotomy if it is, you have to undertake a valgus osteotomy anterior lesion if it is a flexion osteotomy a posterior lesion an extension osteotomy and a posterior lateral lesion a valgus external rotation osteotomy and an anterior lateral valgus flexion osteotomy it is going to the details but just to put it into your mind you see that the, the portion where the head of the femur is is, is healthier is put into the weight bearing area of the acetabulum after different types of osteotomies. A rotational osteotomy, which was described by Sugiyakas, the triple osteotomy, which is undertaken, is a difficult procedure to undertake, but he has given excellent results. It is, if it is done very well, it rotates, it angulates, and does the job so that, as you would appreciate in that slide, the superior, superior portion of the head of the femur almost has come to right. the inferior portion which is not the weight bearing area. Coming to hip sacrificing management, as I told you, it is the, it is the gold standard, the hip orthoplasty, especially if it, it, since it occurs in younger individuals, either a hybrid hip orthoplasty is undertaken with, 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 the, the, with whatever, whatever the, with this weight bearing area has to be stable and it has to be, it has to survive the highest time schedule of a hip joint replacement. Various miscellaneous newer procedures have come into vogue, like acrylic cement injections, porous tantalum, rod insertion. This is all for the postgraduate. Just I, I put it just to understand. People have tried various methods to see that the head is vascularized. So bone, uh, the BMP has been injected, growth factors have been injected, vascular endothelial growth factors have been injected, and the cartilage, nowadays, a cartilage reconstruction strategies also has been undertaken. Now we come to the important uh, aspect of core decompression, which is the most common surgery which is undertaken in different centers of the world, either for an avian of the femoral head. It was described by Paul Fickett and uh, Arlen, in 1960, is the functional exploration of the hip, where stress test and decompression is undertaken. <clears throat> Core decompression indications, I re-emphasize, it is only in stage 1 or 2A. And initial procedure is for bone marrow a stem cell injection. It is also initial procedure for vascularized or non-vascular people are grafting. And the patients who are less than 50 years is the indication. Contraindications are definite advanced disease of the age, of the advanced uh, disease, and patients medically who are unfit for surgery. And relative contraindication is a patient usually who is above 50 or 55 years of age. Even in core decompressions, as you see in those slides, various modifications in the technique have come to making multiple or single cores or 3 mm diameter decompression, as you see here, is a one, one it is a, a three pins are put into the area where, the, where, where it is avascular, or making branching smaller, the smaller cores from the central area core, and which, which can go into different direction. And today, we are undertaking arthroscopic, arthroscopic surgeons are undertaking arthroscopic core decompression, as you would appreciate there. Multiple drill holes are made in the necrotic region from the head and neck junction under fluoroscopic guidance arthroscopically and no lateral opening of the proximal femur here. Various modifications in the technique have come. Bone grafting of the core, cancellous, cancellous bone grafting, fibula, vascular graft, as I told you, PRP or human mesenchymal stem cells, stem cells and growth factors, and delivery of erythropoietin also has been tried. What does core compression do? It removes the reduction of the pain producing substance due to removed necrotic bone, opening of the closed vessels, establishment of new channels, reactive hypervascularity, reduction of intraosseous pressure, removal of necrotic bone facilitating revascularization, and finally, removal of hard sclerotic bone, which is relatively unhealthy and it causes pain. These are, it is either biological or mechanical. And that is the theories which have been profound. We combine both core decompression with keratage and bone marrow aspiration in our own study. 
to compare the functional and radiological outcome and to identify the associated complications. The treatment guidelines were strictly stage one and two, which are divided into asymptomatic and symptomatic, and which are asymptomatic only pharmacological treatment, and which are symptomatic were taken for the study. And selection criteria, inclusion criteria, and exclusion criteria was undertaken. All patients were explained about the nature of the study, and the computerized randomization was done. And this is the operative method methodology as to how we did it. Patient position, a fracture table under spinal epidural anesthesia under GA, CM images check. As you see, there is a lateral incision. And, and for the last 10 years, unfortunately, many publications have come to light where PRP bone marrow aspiration was directly injected into the site of the delayed or non-union or even AVF. But what we should understand, gentlemen, is what we should understand is the aspirated bone marrow will have cellular components of blood, including RBCs, WBCs, platelets, plasma, and even stem cells with limited number present in the area. That's why it is observed that approximately 0.001% of the nucleated cells from bone marrow aspirate are multipotent uh, stem cells. That's why you will have to exclude the RBCs from the picture. Hence, the aspirate is centrifuge to increase the proportion of stem cells, the method of aspiration, the needle used, and the density gradient uh, centrifugation, thereby separating the stem cell population from RBCs and plasma is fairly standardized now. It is also important that stem cells injected into the site require scaffolding for the cells to remain in place and potentially differentiate and into cells and osteoplastic activity. And this is how it, that is the SVRP kit, and that is where it is separated after centrifugation. And the middle area for that is aspirated, which has the highest number of stem cells. And that is, that is the classical kit which is used. And the concentration of stem cells after centrifugation has been found to be from 0.01% to 0.2 to even 5.4 into 10, based on the cell surface markers with the expression profile, which is undertaken. And the number of platelets and residual leukocytes may vary depending on the age, sex, and general health and status of the patient, and in part on the method of preparation as well, which is also important. As I told you, it is important that uh, we, we, we use, uh, it is a major animal protein, the etylocollagen, which is a binder. Otherwise, other, otherwise you can't bind whatever you are injected. And this is the methodology as you see from the aspiration, aspiration as you see from the, from the iliac crest, and that is the aspirated blood. And these are the syringes, and this, this is the centrifuge, and that is centrifuge there, and that is injected into the site, into the avian. This is the methodology as you, as you see here. That is classically, as you see, an avian picture, cross-section, and you put the guide wire, and it is directly on, on, the, on the site, and you take a curate, we have modified the curate, which can go into almost every direction. And the hard, hard bone, avascular bone is curated out. And that is the picture you would see a core is made on the, along the guide wire. And that is the picture you would appreciate. And in, we go in two directions if it, if, it if it is a wider area, which has to be curated out. And this is the 18 months post-operative bilateral, which has the MRI follow-up is undertaken. And you would appreciate this, uh, this is the picture after 18 months of this is another picture which shows the core, core which has been undertaken. And that is that is that is that is how you how you really get into the core and widen it up to the subcondyl bone, and that is the subcondyl bone with the reamer, with the triple reamer. And again, you put in the guide wire and be sure and then inject it there. And these are the different pictures radiologically pre and post operative. And this is the all MRI studies were undertaken. You would appreciate both radiologically and MRI, MRI wise, it has sustained the test of time. And this is after 12 months follow up, you would appreciate the rounded head of the femur. Both sides have been, that is the left side is the avian portion, as you see here, and that is the right side, which has maintained. And this is the 35 year old, again, which is 12 months post-operative. Only core decompression was done, 
where the, the where it was not not as as per our as per our study it has collapsed and this is the another 18 months follow up with good results post operative protocol a simple walker crutches assisted mobilization for 3 weeks or we we give oral alendronate was given to all the patients at a dose of 35 mg twice a week which is, this has been emphasized in different papers and it is reviewed after 1 3 6 months then after every 6 months and plain radiograph at pelvis and mri study was undertaken and with a harris hip score and vas score was recorded comparing both the groups using a pad test radiologically there was reduced incidence of progression of collapse of with bone marrow aspiration concentration as compared to with just a simple core decompression well to conclude avian still remains to be an enigma to the treating surgeon bone marrow aspiration concentrate is a safe efficient and a less technically demanding modality for the treatment of non traumatic avascular necrosis of femoral head in pre collapse stage taking the functional and radiological outcomes into consideration with pain relief and delayed and reduced progression to collapse core decompression bmac is a better treatment modality than core de decompression alone in especially in grade 1 and 2a groups different types of osteotomies are described and they are the other options whereas if it is advanced stage there is no other way but to undertake a good hip replacement thank you very much indeed Thank you, sir, for an excellent lecture. May I request, uh, uh, Professor Fadl, would you like to uh, invite the next speaker? You are still muted, Professor Fadl. You are muted. You are muted. You are muted. Muted. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shiti, for this interesting uh, lecture. I enjoyed it. Uh, actually, uh, may I ask, uh, uh, dear friend Arendam, to present the next speaker because uh, uh, the uh, I think there is some changes in the schedule, and I haven't the uh, uh, the uh, on the desktop uh, this the new uh, okay. schedule. Okay. Maybe I have uh, present something is wrong. Okay. In that case, uh, we have two lectures by Dr. Anil Bhatt of India. the first lecture will be on peripheral nerve injury examinations dr bhat you may start screen sharing now is my screen visible sir yes thank you chairperson uh, for this opportunity and thank you dr kanaja sir again for calling me for this course uh, last time was a physical course and we really enjoyed uh, it when it happened and thank you the faculty who uh, uh, agreed to adjust this schedule of mine because i had some unavoidable uh, circumstance uh, later in the day and uh, so i thank the uh, faculty also for this uh, readjustment now coming to the peripheral nerve examination itself uh, i have two parts one is the management and one is the core examination itself and the examination part will take a, a little longer time uh, so i'll try to finish as much as possible Uh, in the given time so i always ask my uh, postgraduates how do you get the light uh, from a light bulb and uh, why i put this is basically the analogy of how we uh, use it for how the muscle tendon unit works so the bulb is basically the muscle tendon unit actually and the socket if you see if you trace a bulb and its connections and you trace a muscle and tendon and its connections it's very similar to this so the socket is basically the neuromuscular junction and the wires are of peripheral nerves and that is where the injuries happen here and the main switchboard is anti of horn cells and the transformer and the generator is the brain itself so this is how the connection needs to be checked and this is how we have to uh, you know like a detective we need to see where the connections have gone wrong when there's a peripheral nerve injury so this is about clinical examination the learning objective here for a postgraduate is to present a case of peripheral nerve injury in a systematic but smart way and why is it smart way is because uh, the nerve injury cases can take a long time if you don't know the uh, the correct methodology so if you know what to test then you can easily get the answers very quickly 
as examiners, what we want is these three questions, which is which nerve is involved, where has the connection gone wrong, and what is the type of damage. So these are the three questions which all of us will be asking when you when a case is given to a, any candidate uh, during the examination. So for you to get these answers, you have to ask the patient uh, for impairment of function, the weakness and paralysis, what is the alteration and or the loss of sensibility. Some patients might have pain in nerve injuries. Remember that. And finally, the most important thing is you need to ask the patient, what is the disability? Why the patient has come to you? There could be nerve injuries, but they might not have disability, major disabilities, because a lot of times, a lot of adjacent muscles and nerves, you know, they, they try to compensate. So that is what we need to ask the patient specifically. Uh, in the exam scenario, generally, uh, you know, acute onset injuries won't be kept. But of course, in your practice later in, later in life, you need to make sure that you need to see these patients. So acute injuries are like this, wherever there's an open injury, we know that or we should take it for granted that the, all the underlying structures are damaged, unless proved otherwise, which is during your deprivement, right? Sometimes you can straight away see the nerves being damaged. And sometimes when you see an X-ray, we know that definitely there is a problem. So we have to look for nerve injuries in these patients. If you see a patient with supracondylar, uh, I mean, sorry, distal third humerus fracture like this, right? And you need to be checking a supracondylar fracture in a child. You need to be checking all the three nerves. So these are classical X-rays you see uh, in these patients. And that is when you should be alerted that there could be an underlying nerve injury. Birth palsies, uh, sometimes this, uh, a foot drop like this patient would come with an acute uh, kind of foot drop. And in our, uh, especially, we see this kind of things in an injection palsy. So these are the things to be aware of. Uh, but otherwise, during exams, what we generally keep is the chronic cases, the insidious onset ones. So you have some X-ray like this, you have a cubitus valgus, you know there could be a tardy kind of paralysis. You have a swelling like this near the elbow here, and uh, there could be paralysis here in the hand. And you know, especially in our country, we should be talking of Hansen's disease. So these are things which you should be aware of, right? And patient might have, you know, uh, involvement of the nerves distally also in Hansen's disease. Sometimes median nerve is involved near the wrist where it becomes superficial. So the types of injury all of us know, basically the neuropraxia means compression, right? Axonotomesis means stretch and neurotomesis basically means the nerve is completely cut. So at least these three words have to be kept in mind always, the compression, stretch and cut so that you know what is the mechanism of injury and what is the type of injury it results with. And classical examples of neuropraxia is Saturday night palsy, which all of us have been taught and as an undergraduate also. But what we see also is tunicate palsy sometimes in, in the clinical scenario. So remember that too, right? these are neuropraxias, which usually means they recover by themselves. Sometimes these scenarios, like this crutch palsy, if the crutch is too long, or if the crutch is too short, both causes problems, okay? Especially for the posterior cord in, of the brachial plexus or sometimes the axillary rarely. But otherwise, generally, these are also neuropraxia kind of injuries, okay? As I said, the injury like this, we know or you have to be alerted that there could be a radial nerve injury in the, in the spiral groove here. And a lot of times when you explore these uh, for plating and other things, you would see the nerve either contused or caught between the fragments. What we should not be doing is to damage the nerve later on during surgery by either by traction or the implant, you know, impinging onto that. So we need to be very careful with these kind of injuries. A hip dislocation straight away, you should be documenting whether the patient has a sciatic nerve injury, a foot drop is there or not. And these are generally, again, neuropraxia sometimes, but sometimes it could be an axonotomesis because the femoral head stretches the sciatic nerve and can cause axonotomesis kind of injury. Straightforward injuries like this, we know that these are neurotemesis. So it, there's no need to ex, you know, uh, break our head on this because we know the moment we explore that the nerve is cut, especially if the patient has a distal deficit here, you definitely know that the nerve is cut and these are neurotemesis. So when a case is given after your history and you know probably what is the mechanism and what is the type of injury, the first is to start the inspection. So on inspection, basically in nerve injuries, make sure patient moves the hand. It's not just, just looking at the deformity and thinking that is there a wrist drop or what. You can ask the patient to move the hand and the deformity comes out very nicely. Okay. 
uh, uh, and you can ask the patient to do some activities. So that is that again accentuates the deformity. Patient has a wrist drop, patient has a finger drop, patient has a thumb drop, right? So this is a radial nerve. The diagnosis clinically, you should not be giving wrist drop. The diagnosis is radial nerve palsy, which will cause a wrist drop or a finger drop and a thumb drop. So this is how you need to give your diagnosis for these patients, right? Again, as I said, move the ask the patient to move and then check the deformities. So this is a median nerve palsy where the opposition is difficult for the patient and patient uses some trick movements there where he tries to grab bigger and smaller objects like this. So the opposition, classic opposition is lost and they would be using their long flexors like this, the FPL and other tendons for them to do the activity. Uh, this is a claw. Again, if you open up the hand and ask the patient to open up the hand, show, then only you will see that claw very nicely. And if you move, then you know the disability also, how the MCPs are not flexing and how the IP flex first and then the MCP joint. Yeah. Okay. And again, ask the patient to do the activities like this. And then... I think somebody is uh, switched on their mobile also. I think two devices. So you can make out these disabilities here very nicely. Uh, this is your inspection, actually. It's not just looking at the patient and telling there's a deformity, right? This is a brachial plexus. This is a normal side here. And here, this is an upper brachial plexus, classic deformity here. Patient is not able to abduct the elbow. Patient is not able to flex the, I mean, abduct the shoulder and flex the elbow. So these are the classical ones during inspection. Also look at the limb length discrepancy. This is a birth palsy and usually have, they have shortening here and deformities here, contractures and muscle wasting. So these are the things you have to document from the front, from the back. Again, you see the wasting of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus fossa. Sometimes in isolated serratus nerve palsy like this, you would see the winging scapula or even the brachial plexus injury, right? One of the things I would like to emphasize is to expose the patient completely up to the, like if it's the upper limb up to the neck, because a lot of times there could be proximal injuries or proximal pathologies, which you might miss if you don't expose the limb completely. So this is the ulna claw hand. And if you see this also, there is a concept of ulna paradox, which I'll come later. And so the problem is here, the elbow, right? There's a swelling there and that's why the claw is here versus the scar is here and this the claw is here, which is much more. So the paradox is that basically that, lower the deformity, you would see, you think that there should be less, I mean, lower the injury, less the deformity, but here it's reverse. And I'll come to the reasons later. But the lesson we have to learn during inspection is that expose the patient adequately to look for proximal lesions and look for clues for previous injury, especially near the neck. And you know, it could be, so even a foot drop patient comes, make sure you examine the spine. Don't assume everything is common peroneal nerve injury. Distal deformities like this, no skin changes will be there. There could be damage here. There could be, you know, uh, other changes like uh, nail changes and other things has to be checked for. So skin changes, as I told, is very, very important. There's a small scar here. This lady had a median nerve injury and she came here with this burn and, uh, you know, an ulcer here that tells that there's a problem here. The sensation is damaged here and that is why patient has come with these problems. Muzzle wastings, again, classical muzzle wastings in different, this is this is a median nerve. So you have the thinar eminence, hyper, uh, the hypo, uh, you know, there is there is a wasting there. Then this is a total claw hand, both thinar and hypothenar muzzle wasting, and also especially dorsal introsia wasting is very nicely seen in these patients. So these are the things, trophic changes is one. So all the components of the nerve has to be looked for, motor, sensory, and autonomic changes and reflexes. So trophic changes is basically change in the skin, loss of sweating, dry skin, change in the nails, the loss of uh, uh, you know, luster of the nails, it will chip, uh, chipped out and brittle. Then the hair growth might be less. So all these are called trophic changes and basically uh, governed by the autonomic system. When you come to palpation, the first is always temperature. And remember that the uh, paralyzed limb is always cold. So this is one examination you should do initially, make sure you document that because once you start examining the patient, the temperature difference might not be much. But otherwise, most of the paralyzed limbs are always cold. And tenderness is for the nerve tenderness we are looking at and scar tenderness here. So if the scar is bad and the nerve is underlying there and it is stuck under the scar, patient might have a local kind of tingling and you know neuroma formation. 
but sometimes the nerve could be tender especially in hansen's disease in our country we see the nerve could be inflamed which we call it as neuritis and the nerve could be tender muscle and tendons contractures should be checked for nerve as i said thickening and also the tunnel sign these are all coming tunnel sign is not a special test as such it, you can do it in palpation itself because you want that information quite early during your examination and skin as i said look for the scars right and also always palpate the pulse the nerve and vessels always go together most of the areas so if there is a major damage to nerve sometimes there could be damage to the vessel also of course patient with a, a decreased vascularity might come much earlier but otherwise uh, pulse can be sometimes feeble also okay palpation as i said the nerve this is the thickening of the nerve in hansen's wherever the superficial nerves are thickened start looking for hyperpigmented patches this is a nerve abscess actually there is a swelling here okay and uh, you need to know which all the nerves to palpate in hansen's this is there's no excuse for that if you have a hansen's case examiners expect you to know to dive to palpate the supraorbital nerves greater auricular nerves supraclavicular and infraclavicular nerves all these have to be these are all superficial nerves which could be thickened right ulnar nerve at the cubital tunnel right and so these are things you need to know and where to palpate for that superficially the the median nerve becomes superficial near the wrist here so sometimes you can palpate a nerve abscess here and then when you go to the and superficial branch of the radial nerve can be palpable they become thickened sometimes in some patients so these are all the areas in upper limb lower limb you come down you go along the neck of the fibula and palpate for the common peroneal nerve so thickening of the common peroneal nerve so all these so it's a, a a good general examination for a hansen's kind of patients right so these are the things you have to examine in the patient contractures especially in in uh, birth palsies right birth brachial plexus palsies they might children might have contractures they might also have what's called as co contractures so you need to document this where there's limited amount of range of motion so your management depends on how bad the contractures are okay this is co contracture co contracture is where both now the biceps and the triceps both are firing for this patient so he is not able to completely flex because the triceps so it, this happened basically because of cross innervation during the recovery right so you have to neutralize one for this other one to work so a lot of times we give a bottle in an injection for the triceps so that the biceps will start working nicely right so that is how we release the co contractures temporarily uh, tunnel sign as i said is very important during a palpation palpate from distal to proximal right remember always that palpate from distal to proximal and then the patient should uh, feel the high, the paresthesia or tingling in the course of the nerve this is a classic positive tunnel sign so two sentences distal to proximal palpation patient should feel the the tingling or paresthesia in the course of the nerve not locally if there is a problem there if you tap and over that there it doesn't you know show this kind of irradiation means there is a neuroma there and the nerve is probably stuck in the scar there so this is what is the interpretation of a tunnel sign is very very important as i said pulse is also important uh, if especially in brachial plexus injury almost 30% in infraclavicular injury high chance of injury in fracture dislocations of elbow and knee so those are things we should document coming to movements measurements and neurological examination both active and passive range of motion should be checked in these and muscle wasting has to be documented and your neurological examination basically starts with motor which is tone bulk and power so the tone you know you would have during examination you would have checked which is a peripheral nerve injury is always a flaccid paralysis the bulk is basically the muscle wasting and finally you come to the power and then sensory autonomic reflexes as i already showed you all these three components have to be checked during your examination now some basic rules of steps of motor examination which is uh, explain to the patient and demonstrate on the normal side always always do this especially nerve examination uh, because patients don't know what you want they don't know mrc grading they don't know what is grade 4 grade 3 grade 5 so you have to demonstrate and explain to the patient on the normal side and sometimes there could be factors which can confound your power grading right and one of the things obviously is pain so pain is one thing second is the joint stiffness so these are the two things we should always always document so checking and the passive range of joint movement so even if there is great five power but the joint is stiff you won't get that great five power and rarely patient might have a lot of pain also so these are the confounding uh, uh, factors for your power grading okay 
which grade of power will you really sit first is always asked people still sometimes grade 0 sometimes grade 5 which both are wrong you should be basically starting from grade 3 okay you start from grade 3 basically means asking the patient to do that particular action if you want to check biceps you ask the patient to flex the elbow that's all you need to do against gravity right so that is grade 3 power and from there onwards based on the response of the patient you go up or come down so you go to grade 4 and grade 5 if patient is able to do grade 3 but if patient is not able to grade to grade grade 3 you have to then eliminate the gravity make the limb parallel to the ground right that is a basic principle of eliminating the gravity anywhere and then come to grade 1 and see for flicker or any of these things so remember always when you start your power grading it has to be starting from grade 3 right and always try to palpate the muscle or see it contracting at least whenever possible so that is the your sure way of telling that this particular muscle is working nicely okay and as i said if grade 3 is present then you go for grade 4 or 5 and your resistance when you start uh, testing this should be distilled to the insertion of the muscle so a lot of times i see students blocking the action of the muscle when they are test right so it should be just distilled to the insertion of the muscle so that the muscle can work nicely okay so don't block the muscle or tendon movement these are the small things but these are the ones which will give you accurate results uh, when you, especially you have grade 3 power or grade 2 you are confused or grade 3 and grade 4 these are the small steps but significant steps which you are supposed to use okay so if grade 3 is absent you eliminate gravity and demonstrate grade 2 or grade 1 right a basic way of doing it i'm just showing the triceps movement here right this is the normal side i've explained to the patient i want the extension of the elbow here right this is one way of doing triceps there are different ways of doing triceps examination i'm just want to show because how i want to see how the muscle is looking so these are the things and then where you need to give the resistance just distal to the insertion and when patient is you are giving resistance then you see the muscle contracting nicely there you can feel the muscle contracting there nicely right so these are the basic steps you are supposed to do general scheme of motor examination in the idea is to find the level of level of the injury and grade of the power to decide on the management correct so correlate with sensory deficit always i'll just quickly give you the scheme for three nerves upper limb nerves the radial median and ulnar nerves how to do it okay so radial nerve patient as i showed you has a wrist finger and thumb drop right so the first thing is you should know what are the muscles directly supplied by the radial nerve and so differentiate it with, between the posterior and tracheus now see all these three nerves have a what is called as high level injury and a low level injury so for radial nerve it's radial nerve injury and pin palsy posterior and tracheus nerve palsy right so for you to differentiate between these two you should know what is supplied by the radial nerve directly and if you check that and if they are working you know it is not radial nerve it is a pin palsy right so most of the time in the clinical scenario triceps is usually spared because triceps muscle branches are given quite high off and also this has multiple heads so multiple nerve branches are there right so the brachioradialis is your first reliable muscle which can be tested that's very very important for you to know okay so that is the first muscle so if brachioradialis is not working it's definitely a radial nerve palsy okay of course you do check triceps for the documentation but brachioradialis is the one because most injuries of radial nerve happen near the uh, spinal groove at least in orthopedic scenarios right so that is why we need to know that brachioradialis is the first reliable so if brachioradialis is uh, working then you know it's not radial nerve palsy so probably it is a posterior and tracheus nerve palsy that's how you need to differentiate between high and low nerve injuries right so this is how the brachioradialis testing is done right so first you ask a patient to do this so flexion of the elbow in the mid prone position is the action of brachioradialis right and then after that you give a resistance just distal to the insertion and then you see the muscle contracting nicely okay explain on the normal side and this is how we need to do the test so this is brachioradialis working nicely here and then you have uh, ecrl which is again supplied directly by the radial nerve okay so you have you need to do radial deviation and you need to dorsiflex the wrist so this is a direct wrist extensor and you can feel for the muscle ecrl and ecrb is difficult to isolate okay so but ecrl can be checked so brachioradialis and ecrl anconius right these are the muscles directly supplied by the radial nerve so remember that and so if out of these the brachioradialis is the most objective way of test so if brachioradialis is working we know that it's probably a pin palsy which means patient will have no wrist drop because ecrl is still working so patient will have only finger and thumb drop 
risk can still extend weekly because as i said ecrl is there but it won't be so strong so then you go ahead and check for the rest of the wrist finger and thumb extensors for the pi and palsy so ecrb if you really want to isolate basically it's keeping it in neutral position like this and asking him to dorsiflex but feel for the muscle contraction here okay but ecrl ecrb both sometimes can cause confusion in terms of the result itself so we don't really comment on this ecu definitely you can test very nicely right these are primary wrist extensors right ecu ulnar deviation and dorsiflexion here and then you feel for the tendon you can make out this tendon standing out very nicely when the muscle can be palpated in the ecu edc please see this how we are testing you should flex your pip joints here okay and then check the edc because you have the lumbrical insertion and other things at the pip joint so to neutralize that you have to flex the pip joints and then do the testing for edc very very important uh, point there okay extensor indices and extensor digiti minimi are two separate uh, tendons and that is why you get this sign sometimes it's called as the horn blower sign so these are independent tendons apart from edc so you can test them separately here of course for the thumb you have the epl right so very nicely it stands out there so that is how you need to test and then you have the apl okay it is the radial abductor of the thumb so you test this apl here nicely okay the palmar abductor is by the median nerve remember apb is by the median nerve apl is by the radial nerve now when for the ulnar nerve palsy the first muscle you check is fc okay if fcu is working it is not high ulnar nerve palsy it's a low ulnar nerve so first muscle you check is fcu the other muscle you check is fdp of the ring and the little finger these are only two supplied by the ulnar nerve in the forearm so you have to check these two and make sure if they are working that means the nerve palsy is low low ulnar nerve palsy okay so ulnar deviate and palmar flex and you would see the tendon standing out nicely here you can also feel for the tendon muscle belly here it's a fleshy muscle belly nicely palpable throughout there this how you check the ftp see don't block the action of the tendon keep it in the side your uh, resistance and ask the patient to flex the dip joint here very very important how you test these so if both of these are working means it's a low ulnar nerve palsy all of you know low ulnar pal palsy you do the one of the important thing is a cart test for intrashe testing this is wrong right you should be not be pulling the card with your whole hand like this you should be using the corresponding fingers as a when you test for the patient and also corresponding dominant hand also okay so this is the correct way of doing card test now if you do this even for a normal person you can pull it out right so you should be using corresponding force also in these patients okay you can test intrashe separately uh, like this okay palmar and dorsal intrashe abduction so say, especially first dorsal intrashe you can check very nicely it's a very big bulky muscle right and these again are the intrashe for the uh, uh, little finger here and finally one of the test the thinner muscle which is supplied by the ulnar nerve is the adductor pollicis so you do the froment sign the test is called as a book test and if patient has paralysis then patient will use the fpl which is supplied by the median nerve there right now so the median nerve palsy the first test you are supposed to do is the oschner's clasp test so once patient is able to do this he can clasp the fingers nicely means it is not a high median nerve palsy if there is a pointing index it is a high median nerve palsy this is how you need to differentiate straight away between high and low median nerve injury okay the anterior intrashe supplies the fpl and the ei uh, the uh, sorry indices right uh, fdp of the uh, uh, index finger right the deep muscles and the pronator quadratus so if it is paralyzed the index fdp is paralyzed then you have this kind of a bend here because patient is now using the fds which is supplied by the uh, median nerve higher up right so this is called as the okay sign for a kilonewen syndrome is where ain is a anterior intrashes palsy is there and this is the pronator teres okay so you have pronator teres and pronator quadratus so pronator teres is done by like this pronator quadratus you can actually difficult to differentiate but you can completely flex the elbow to neutralize the pronator teres and then check the pronation for pronator quadratus not a very reliable sign but you can still do that and finally you come for the fcr so median nerve uh, uh, is still supplying the fcr here and palmar is longus you all know how to test that so you have the fcr standing out you have the 
Palmer is longer standing out. So if all these are working means it is uh, definitely that the median nerve is working nicely, right? If they're not working means it's a high median nerve palsy. Okay, FDS, again, please see how it is tested. Okay, you have to neutralize the other fingers and then ask for the individual fingers, you have to ask them to check this, only this PIP joint here, that is the FTP, uh, FDS, sorry. And this is the radial FTP. Again, uh, this is for the median nerve, same way as I showed for the ulnar nerve here. So that needs to be checked for the ring, and I mean, index and the middle finger here. So if all these are working, means it is a low median nerve palsy. If they are not working, it's a high median nerve palsy. For, how do you check for low median? The thinar muscles. So ATB is the first muscle you check. You basically hold anything here or a pen test, but then the idea is to ask the patient to do palmar abduction like this. And then the muscle has to be felt. So it's not just holding a pen there, but you should be checking for the muscle here, okay? Sensory evaluation is very, very important, okay? So check both sides simultaneously. I see students doing touching on one side, one side, uh, once and the other side once. So always give stimulus, ask the patient to close their eyes, give simultaneous stimulus both sides. Patient can, should understand what you're doing and ask two questions. Don't ask, is it less, more and all? Ask two questions, do you feel? If the patient says no, uh, means there is anesthesia. If the patient says yes, then go to the next question. Is there any difference between these? And let the patients tell the difference. Is it hyposthesia, hyperesthesia, paresthesia, you no, know, or anesthesia? So these are the four responses you are supposed to get. So this is the best or very objective way of doing the sensory testing. Okay, so these are the distribution all of you know, and there are other types of sensory testing for if you, if you want to do it in a better way to point discrimination and other things. So at the end of the history and examination, we expect which nerve is involved for how long. This is what examiners will ask you. Where is it involved? High level, low level? What is the type of involvement? Is it a neurotemesis, axonotemesis, you know, all these things or neuropraxia? What is the disability of the patient? Because this has got the bearing for the management for you. Any associated complications? Are there any ulcers, trophic ulcers, or any kind of burns or anything which is are contractures which has happened to the patient? And what is the management strategy you will apply? based on the above findings. So you have to examine this. It's like mathematics, neurological case. You'll always get your findings very nicely. And if you've done it nicely, right? And then you plan your management here. So examination of the nerve is like a mathematical exercise. Precision is in how you examine gives the best diagnosis. Include all the components of the nerve in your examination, which is motor, sensory, autonomic, and reflexes, right? Look for remote or alternate causes if the examination findings don't sync. So it could be that there could be some other problems. It could be higher injuries, or it could be partially kind of uh, you know recovered nerves. So all these have to be kept in mind if the things are not falling into place. Thank you so much for your attention. So uh, that is my first part of the talk, which is. Uh, uh, I'm not exceeded the time. I thought I would. Uh, Thank you so I much. <laughs> it is very interesting for me. Uh, though it's, uh, it is uh, to some extent away of my interest, but uh, it is a basic sign for me. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I have the honor to present your uh, next talk, uh, uh, Dr. Anil, about uh, the peripheral management of uh, uh, paralyzed hand. Is it right, this? Yes, yes, I'll, okay. I'll go ahead with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Arendam. Is my slide visible? Yes, it very is. Good. Yes. Yeah, this will be a shorter talk. Uh, so I'll just be giving the principles of management. I won't go into much detail here. The, so investigations, basically, once you know there's a nerve injury, is as an orthopedic surgeon, you should be taking an X-ray first. Why? Because underlying bone injury and status of the healing, especially if there is a fracture associated with it, What's happened to is it has gone from malunion, non-union, is a lot of callus there, especially head injury patients can throw a lot of callus and the nerve could be entangled there. And if somebody has put an implant, do you want to know whether that implant is causing the problem? A lot of times, especially humerus fractures, patient develops uh, radial nerve palsy post-surgery. So you should be documenting in your OT notes as to where the implant is, uh, which screw is across the nerve or where the nerve is going. Is it going between third and fourth uh, screws? You know, all these have to, have to be documented even for medical legal purposes. So very, very important. So always take the x-ray as a routine, definitely. 
for you to know the physiology of the nerve, you have to do the nerve conduction study and EMG, right? These are electrodiagnostic studies. So the physiology and subsequently the pathology is shown by this, whether it's axonotomesis, neurotomesis, is it neuropraxia, is it recovering? So it is NCV and EMG are not one-time things, okay? It's a sequential thing which has to be compared every time. And EMG tells you much more earlier than a clinical response whether the nerve, whether the muscle is recovering or not. So I won't go into detail because it becomes very boring for NCV and EMG studies. Please uh, go back and read the theory part of it. Now, if you want to look at the anatomy of the nerve, you have two imaging, especially ultrasound and MRI. Ultrasound is a very, very useful uh, way of looking at nerve injuries. Nowadays, especially, we use it a lot because you can do dynamic examination. You can move the nerve, you can move the limb, and then see what's happening to the nerve. Like a cubital tunnel, you can see the nerve, whether it is you know, subluxating, is it thickened, right? MRI is more static kind of problem, I mean, uh, image. Uh, nowadays, in fact, there are a lot of literature about humerus fracture with radial nerve palsy, where people are using more and more ultrasound to see what's happening to the nerve instead of you know, blindly waiting for the nerve to recover. And a lot of good results have come out when you do early exploration. So basic investigations, blood investigations, of course, if you want to reward some metabolic causes and things like that. And a lot of times there could be a role for biopsy also, especially neuropathies, polyneuropathies and other things. And if there's a nerve uh, damage, biopsy, nerve biopsy can be an option. There. Now, treatment strategy in nerve injuries. If it is neuropraxia, it will recover, right? Neuropraxia, I told you, happened because of compression. So because of compression, the connective she uh, sheath, which is the Schwann cell sheath, is damaged. And once that uh, comes back, uh, uh, you know, uh, the neuropraxia recovers, right? So wait and watch is the policy. Usually between three to six weeks, all your neuropraxias will definitely recover. Axonotemesis, again, the treatment strategy is wait and watch. Right, axonotemesis means axons are damaged. The, the, the sheets of the nerve is intact. The epineurium and the perineurium is intact, which means ideally the nerve has to recover, okay? But sometimes it might not. All axonotemesis is not the same. You know, there are grades of axonotemesis. In Sunderland's classification, you have the grades. I've not gone into classifications, uh, other things, because I thought there's more of examination. Thing. So there could be a role for neurolysis and tendon transfers, even in axonotemesis, if they don't recover. Okay, so it's not always that axonotemesis will recover. Neurotemesis, all of us know you have to repair. The nerve is cut, there's no way it will, it will recover. So you have to repair the nerve mechanically, manually rather. And sometimes you might have to use the nerve graft if there's a lot of gap, or you might have to, if the patient comes late, you might have to go for tendon transfer. Now, if the root avulsions, this is especially in brachial plexus injury, we do what is called as nerve transfers. And the terminology is called neurotization. So like tendon transfers, we do we transfer an intact nerve to a damaged nerve. I'll come to that later, the details of it. And finally, there are salvage procedures, which are sometimes we fuse the joint to reduce the, you know, we don't have donors for tendon transfers and things like that. So arthrodesis. And of course, we have microsurgical techniques like free muscle transfers nowadays. Okay. So the basic nerve repair is what's called as a epineural neurography. Okay, neurography is basically suturing the nerve and we basically do the epineural. This is the same case I showed you with the ulcer in the hand. She had a median nerve glass cut injury, housewife who came to us. And so this is the, uh, so as you expose, you see this neuroma there. Okay, big neuroma there. You can see that, right? So that's where uh, we did, did find a small glass piece there uh, uh, during our exploration, but this entire nerve is, uh, you know, this is the median nerve coming in there, and it looks it looks so thick there. And uh, during our examination, also patient had a lot of tingling only locally here, which was means there was a neuroma. It was not recovering nerve, so you need to separate out that neuroma completely. Okay, but this is a neuroma in continuity, so you don't know where the nerve is, uh, you know, damaged. So the only option for us is to cut the nerve and look at the nerve. But you see that there is a there's the cutaneous branch there a palmacutaneous branch, okay? So you basically cut the nerve, okay? So that is the finely dissected uh, median nerve, but this is part of the neuroma. So you have to cut through this till you get the fresh vesicles, okay? You can see that under loop magnification. So median nerve, a nerve like this, we do under loop magnification, but sometimes if it's a small nerve, we do under microscope, but otherwise, at least a loop magnification is very important. So we cut right through the, uh, the neuroma there, Okay, and you need to 
start cutting millimeter by millimeter for you to see that sprouting fascicles okay so only then you can repair the nerve and then you again take a decision whether you can repair it end to end or you might require a graft right so till you see those fresh fascicles uh, if you want to get a good result in this patient this is the only way to do it so you have to check for that fresh fascicles coming in, in into the view there okay this is the same thing on this side okay uh, so use good instruments see i have wrapped a gauze there over a, a scalpel uh, handle there this is one of the easy way for that the nerve doesn't slip it gives a good surface for you to cut the nerve so these are small technical points there for us to uh, so once that is done we do the uh, nerve repair so we just use 80 or 90 sutures nylon or uh, proline and then we put in four of uh, six uh, sutures you don't have to really stitch it very tightly so this is how it is done okay it's not like a vascular repair it, it just have to be uh, and sometimes we use the nerve glue there just to stick it together after the suturing here so that is the repair of the nerve so this is the basic epineural neuroraft now when do you do a nerve grafting is basically uh, when there is lot of gap so you don't want to do a end to end repair with lot of tension right that is when you do a nerve grafting generally the, the the rule of thumb is about an inch anything more than an inch you should be doing a nerve grafting one of the common sural nerve i mean donor is the sural nerve that is always asked in the exam uh, so where do you take the so there are other uh, nerves also but this gives a good length almost about 40 cm 30 to 40 cm length it gives uh, right and you can put multiple uh, cables it's called a cable graft so medial cutaneous nerve the arm forearm radial sensory branch these are the other nerve graft sources okay so this is just an example so again this is uh, we are trying to repair this but there is a lot of gap and you can flex the elbow here like this and try to suture but it is very tight right you can't extend the elbow later even after 3 weeks there will be a lot of tension so this is not a good way of repairing it see the amount of flexion of elbow you require more than 90 degrees right so this is not the way to be done so this is the harvesting of the uh, sural nerve you can do it with multiple incisions so that you don't need a long incision otherwise you can do something like this uh, so some people also use tunnelers nowadays uh, as a minimally invasive thing uh, but we would not want to damage the nerve especially if it's very critical so we always uh, try to open up like this and this is now the suturing of the nerve so multiple cables are laid so these nerves are quite thick and sural nerve diameter is quite thin so you would have to put multiple uh, cables so that you uh, basically uh, you know fill up the circumference of the nerve like this right so this is the final uh, picture there so these are almost four cables there here and there should be absolutely no tension the nerve if you suture under tension it will never recover nicely there will be a lot of fibrosis so please don't do that always try to give a good uh, nerve bed there so axons grow at the rate of 1 mm per day all of us know so distal injuries or those nearer to target have better prognosis right uh, but otherwise it's very difficult for us to uh, you know go for the other uh, proximal injuries so same prognosis holds good for patient presenting late also proximal injuries so the most important change here is the neuromuscular junction gets damaged by about 18 months to 24 months and that is our problem in nerve injuries so if patient comes too late or if the nerve injury is very proximal the growth of the nerve towards the neuromuscular junction is the problem right so that is the time constraint we have so if you don't have this if you have this constraint the solution is to replace them and the only way you can do is to, to do tendon transfer patient coming late or very proximal injuries we go for tendon transfer this is a radial nerve palsy i showed you in the beginning right patient is not able to extend the wrist so wrist drop finger drop thumb drop remember all the three are dropped in this patient okay so one of the tendon transfer we do is pronator teres right it goes to this ecrb here so that will give the wrist extension and then you have either fcr or fcu we use what goes to the edc uh, so both are described i'm just basically talking about the classical modified jones transfer here okay and then uh, this is the uh, we've taken the fcu here in this case and it's going to the edc here for finger extension and palmar is longest to the rerouted epl when i say rerouted so epl is here it needs to be rerouted towards the proximal i mean palmar side and then the palmar is longest has to be connected 
So we always ask you, what do you mean by rerouting of EPL? Which means that you have to take the EPL down here towards the Palmer side. Now, this will give both uh, action of EPL and APL for the patient. So abductor and extensor action will be given by this particular maneuver and palmaris longus is sutured for this. Okay, so this is the same patient uh, uh, with the, uh, right? So you can see that palmaris, uh, the EPL standing out here. Okay, so that's what is happening now. He gets both uh, extension and abduction in this patient. Salvage procedures, I told you, if you don't have too many tendons, wrist definitely can be arthrodesed. So this is one of those examples. Now, if problems have there in the main switchboard, remember in the first slide, I told you what is the main switchboard. It's, it's it, the, the anti-horn cells and everything, right? From the nerve roots itself. If there is avulsion, especially uh, from, especially in brachial plexus, preganglionic injuries, you have the avulsion. You can't really put these nerves back into the anti-horn cells as of now, at least. Okay, so then uh, the answer is one, nerve transfers. Second is muscle transfer. So you have to replace either the nerve or the muscle itself. Okay, so there's a main switch port. This line one is important, supplies, but it's damaged now. So we take from another line, okay, multiple same function or not so important supply. So we borrow that line to this line and connect them to this. So this is the basic way uh, or principle of neurotization, which is called as nerve transfers. Uh, I'll just give an example. This is spinal accessory going to suprascapular now. This is a brachial plexus injury here, right? Spinal accessory, all of you know, is a cranial nerve, but it also has a com peripheral component. The so spinal accessory supplies a trapezius, okay? Three or four branches. So we take one branch of that and suprascapular is damaged, is upper brachial plexus, and that is connected, right? So nothing will happen to the trapezius because it has multiple branches and spinal accessory is still connected to the spinal cord, correct? So spinal axillary branch to suprascapular will give this patient a shoulder abduction. So this is how the strategy is done. Okay. Another example, patient has upper brachial plexus, his median nerve is damaged, right? C5-6, ulnar nerve is working. So what do you do? You give an ulnar nerve fascicle to the branch of musculocutaneous nerve for the biceps to work, right? If you take one ulnar nerve fascicle, nothing will happen, right? And then that is going to the branch of the biceps of musculocutaneous. Now the patient will start getting the biceps function, right? So this is a classic nerve transfer, okay? We also use intercostals. Intercostals can be spared. We have 12 intercostals. We can take four to five intercostals and that can go to the major function of the median nerve and musculocutaneous nerve, right? Biceps, branch it goes. For sensation, we give it for median nerve. So these are intercostals, two or three intercostals are taken and this will be given to these so this is called as nerve transfer, okay? Finally, if you don't have this, we do what's called as a free muscle transfer. The entire muscle is taken along with its nerve and blood supply and it's transferred somewhere else. And one of the common source is the gracilis transfer, okay? Gracilis, again, you know, is, is one of the adductors. It can be spared. So along with its uh, nerve to obturator, which is nerve supply and blood supply, it, it is taken as a free functioning gracilis transfer. And this is commonly transferred to especially biceps or for finger flexion, FDP, okay? So brachial plexus injuries, this is one of the strategies we use. We take it and replace the biceps or even the FDP also, okay? That's the vascular pedicle, that is the nerve and it's attached locally. So this is the arm here, this is the chest here. So it is, the, the gracilis is put here and the intercostals is given to the nerve to obturator. So that will take care of the nerve supply. Any local artery, enothoracromial branch, any of these arteries is now uh, uh, given as a vascular anastomosis to the uh, artery of the uh, gracilis itself, right? So blood supply, nerve supply is established. So the axons have to grow in and then the, this gracilis now, which is the new biceps will start working. So this is a free functioning muscle transfer. This is one of the patients. This is, this is the actually gracilis here instead of his biceps, okay? And at least he's got a good grade three power working here, right? So there are new advanced things. You might get in short notes, what are the advanced, recent advances? So there are conduits like this, which are being developed so that, you know, you don't need to use nerve grafts. So it's, and they have uh, growth factors put inside this by nanotechnology. So the nerve growth uh, happens faster. So these are especially conduits which are being used uh, and there's this growth matrix lamellae are there. 
so that that will you know increase the rate of growth of the axons so these are the new things which are coming in and uh, otherwise we still you know have the same techniques of nerve grafting and nerve nerve transfers have come and the muscle transfers have come so recovery of the nerve injury depends on the type and level of injury sometimes it's very unpredictable and early surgical interventions if indicated gives the best chance of recovery for the patient and we require the best of the technique patience and hard work very very important we should patients lot of times we know we operate on the nerves they think next day the nerve will start working so patient counseling is very important patient has to be very patient we as a surgical team have to be very patient for the clinical results to come in it will take a lot of time you know for the nerve to recover right but when a man has nothing even if you give a little it's it's a lot for the patient that's very very important thank you so much i think i've saved 15 minutes thank you thank you dr bhat uh, that that was a excellent and illuminating talk i think uh, we all learned a lot if i can just ask you a very um, quick question in your experience uh, what is the longest you had before a, a neuropraxia of the radial nerve has recovered what is the longest interval you have seen wow uh, so by definition a neuropraxia has to recover by 6 weeks so i mean if it is not recovering at 6 weeks there is a problem there it could be there could be an additional injury there could be two level injuries so we need to look at all these things so if it is a neuro 6 weeks because the the reason i am asking this question i have had two cases uh, both which were post operative cases one uh, nerve recovered 100% after 4 months and the other which was a very high lesion in the in the arm that recovered after 9 months but full recovery 100% recovery yeah. so uh, that's why i was wondering that and i because i saw in the literature that it can even cross a year 13 months i think that was the period so i was just wondering what your experience has been like. we we've not had anything like that because by definition for us it's a neuropraxia which is a compression should recover by about 6 uh, weeks maximum and if it's not recovering beyond that we sh- as i said it could be a higher level of injury it could be an axonotemesis or it could be two level injury sometimes missed it could be you know the injury could be at a different level so we have to look at those things carefully and investigate and check but otherwise uh, even the neurologists would tell that 6 weeks is a time maximum time for a neuropraxy okay again i thank you for your excellent talk and uh, you, we sir. come to the next and in the- Anil, one yeah. question, I think. Uh, uh, Anil, I have a. I think we can finish the question of Anil right now because he has to go. Anil, yes, I sir. have got uh, two things to clarify. You use the word neuralization. What is neuralization? Neurotization, sir. Neurotization is nerve transfer. Like tendon transfer, we do a nerve transfer. So okay. we take intact nerve and give it to the paralyzed nerve. right uh, the nerve donor nerve is, is actually not a very important nerve or it can have multiple functions like intercostals can be used for biceps function for it can be used for median nerve sensation this is called neuralization yes sir and another thing which i just want to know because for me it was a new thing the conduit that you are mentioning about is uh, are they commercially available in india and have you used them in any of the cases and what is your experience uh, it's not commercially available at least in india sir. so we have been trying to get them but it's not available as of now but yes it is it is commercially available okay and uh, it contains some growth factor inside which is to blade the growth yes. of the axons and you don't have to do any nerve grafting or anything no? that's the advantage of uh, the basic problem with nerve injuries is the the time for us so we know that so all the research which is happening everywhere is how to increase this time of healing how to increase the growth of the axons so major research is happening all over the world on this so there are electrical stimulation there are new drugs being used uh, to, to stimulate this so a nerve conduit also is filled up now with growth uh, hormones and i mean the growth factors by nanotechnology 
so that the speed of axon recovery can increase so that is the way they are doing it so can i ask you one question yeah so, uh, okay but just before that can i request uh, dr mohammad fadil to please start putting your uh, you know screen sharing on the screen so that you are ready after this <laughs> Uh, so, a patient with a Saturday night uh, palsy with a wrist drop came to me. According to the uh, lecture, what I've heard and read, uh, if the triceps is not working, then only there is a wrist palsy, along with finger drop and thumb drop. But here, the patient had triceps working, but his wrist was down, along with fingers and thumb. Can it happen, sir? See, uh, a Saturday night pulse by definition is a very broad area of compression. So you need to have very exact history from the patient, how the patient was lying down, with a pointed kind of compression or versus I had a patient last week where uh, the patient said at the edge of the pillow, but now the pillow is, is a big thing. It's not a small thing. So triceps can be spared or might not be spared. Either way, you need to change. As I said, when you know it's a high radial nerve palsy, document always the triceps function. Majority of the time, the triceps escapes because it is a very high innervation. But you never know, right? And then come to break your radialis. So don't assume that high radial nerve palsy triceps should always be spared. No, need not. And especially in Saturday night palsy, the area of compression could be quite wide based on what the patient is giving you in terms of history. Uh, Anil, I think... Uh... The, our students should always be ready because sometime would they get a case of a safe law hand. And we say, okay, you'll have to do a tendon transfer. Then which tendon transfer you do, you do funnels, or you do a brand, or typical lots of polycellization, you do a ride on. What are the principles of tendon transfer? Where will you do the, do the FDS? Where will you use the uh, extensive carpi radial is longer than babies within the prolongation of the pump is longer. And I think all these things, our students must know that. And yes. I'm sure you have covered this very, very, very important subject because they always get, well, the students will get the painful nerve injury case. Always they will get it. And I don't know why they get confused with examination because the principal, as you said right at the beginning, that the management of the nerve injury is just like the uh, problem of uh, mathematics where you can really go everything by a two into two because of accident. And thanks, uh, Anil, that you have been able to adjust the time. And I we you. know that you have to go and take your wife can, can I just ask? <coughs> yes. <coughs> Anil, uh, Shantram here. Yes, can sir, I just, you. no, for the radial nerve palsy, you said uh, extensor capella is to be used for the extensor tendon. I mean, the extensor digitorum, right? Extensor capella is. No, nowadays we use the extensor carpi radialis instead of the alaris because the functional element of the yeah. alaris is quite important for a grip. Yeah. Is that the because we have we have moved from extensor carpi alaris to extensor carpi radialis or to the to the extensor of the fingers so that the alna deviation, which is quite important for the grip, is still maintained. Whereas yes. if you take off the extensor of it is likely that it will go into ex the yeah, radial division, where the grip Correct. is much less. I wanted your opinion. Definitely, sir. I mean, both the flexor carpi ulnaris and FCR, both are described uh, by the classical modified Jones and the Boyd's transfers. So FCR can be used, FCU can be used. As you said very rightly, FCU has a much better action in terms of ulnar deviation and a strong grip for the patient. So... Uh, we try to avoid that and FCR is used. Uh, the only problem with FCR sometimes could be that the arc of rotation can be a little difficult, but otherwise FCR gives a straight pull of action. When it comes from the ulnar side towards the EDC, it gives a very nice straight pull of action compared to an FCR, which has to go a little more away from that. Uh, so one of the basic tenant transfer principle is give it a, a straight line of pull as much as possible. So that's the only technical point, but otherwise, even we, we, we have moved away from FCU to FCR nowadays. Yeah, my only this thing was the, even the belly of the muscle, like Sanjaka Palaris, your incision and this thing, you will have to really dissect it a little more compared to the Sanjaka Palaris. Compared to just, uh, yeah. FCR. Yeah. It's a fleshy muscle, fleshy belly. Till the end, it is there. 
and so you need to slowly take it out and multiple incisions might be required that is definitely yes, sir thank you uh, anil sir i have a question can i ask you Okay, so, uh, so, this, this should be the last question so that we can get back to the... Uh, yeah, so, so in case of humerus fracture, for example, that is Holstein-Levis fracture, right? And we know that we usually uh, conserve the humerus fracture. We uh, treat the patient conservatively. But in the same case, we find that the patient is having wrist drop also, right? So what is the indication we should explore? Okay, this can be, you know, nerve injury and we'll have to explore the nerve as well as we'll have to put the plate. So what are the indications of conservative and operative? I think when you have a nerve injury, I think most surgeons, the threshold for them to explore is very low, at least nowadays. I mean, we don't really go for the conservative management, which used to be taught about in terms of hanging cast and, you know, classic transverse or a fracture in the mid shaft. But when you come down towards the lower third, your threshold for exploration should be high or even a fixation should be, high, in fact, for lower third fractures. So in that way, straight away and on top of that, you have a nerve injury there. There's enough literature and debates as to whether you should primarily explore this or, you know, you can go for conservative management. As a surgeon, if you decide on conservative management, uh, then you have to watch these patients. That's why I said the ultrasound is coming in a big way nowadays. So people now, you know, give some sedation and then you they do the ultrasound examination of the nerve to see whether there's any damage to the nerve. Right. And if there's any doubt, you go and explore and don't conserve and you treat that and put a plate. Now, if there is definitely an injury and you know that it happened post, uh, you know, close manipulation or anything, especially classically Holston levers, that is a definitely indication for you to explore, plate the fracture and also explore the nerve, document the status and come out. So that is, that is how it is. Very, I think very nowadays, very few surgeons actually go for conservative management of humerus fractures. But if it is, that is the uh, kind of uh, protocol in yours, in your institute, I think nowadays, uh, the clever way or smart way would be to visualize the nerve and a basic ultrasound examination would give you the answers. So can we differentiate uh, from ultrasound whether the, the injury is uh, uh, neuropraxy or exonotomesis between uh, these two? You you can definitely look at the nerve, especially if it's impinged in the fracture site, if there's a lot of contusion and a lot of swelling and other things, right? I, I get your point mm -hmm. why you're doing that. But uh, uh, if you know that there is a palsy, and if you are a surgeon who is going to conserve it, fine, no problem. Even if the ultrasound shows those changes, you want, you can't differentiate, no, but you document it. And then make sure you watch the patient, uh, you know, and go for an early exploration, at least within three months, if it is not recovering. So don't wait for a longer time. Okay, so three months is the uh, time we should, we can wait. And after that, we'll have to explore that. Yeah, okay. there is, there is literature evidence for that, where patients have done much better with the terms of recovery when they have been explored earlier. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, that was an interesting discussion. And uh, Professor Mohammed Fadel, could you please start sharing your screen? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I will try. I'm trying to share maybe uh, the other uh, the other uh, any other one sharing uh, instead of me. Uh, the host uh, disabled the participant screening sharing. Uh, may he didn't permit for me to share yet. Um, you have to be made co-host, sir. Uh, Nima, can you make Dr. Muhammad a co-host? Dr. Uh, Shantaram, if he's ready, we can take his lecture. Okay. Uh, is uh, Punima, are you able to make the... Uh, Dr. Fadel, is he able to uh, screen share? Mine is after Dr. Mahmoud. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, it, uh, it works now. It works, it works now. Uh, we have... Uh, yes. Are, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay now? Yes. 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 Yeah, it yeah. works now. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my talk uh, that uh, 
I'm honored to present with you is about basic of Elizarif techniques. Uh, I'm Mohammed Fadel uh, from Almenia University Hospital, Egypt, and the program Egypt, director. Uh, better of, uh, better I, I am uh, so happy and pleased to share you uh, for uh, the second time this elegant uh, uh, postgraduate uh, uh, course. Uh, and thanks for the all the committee. Uh, especially uh, Professor uh, uh, Tanija, uh, John, uh, uh, Barnoa, Kumar, and uh, all the scientific committee and the organizer committee. Uh, and uh, I'm honored also to be among all these uh, uh, figures uh, from all over the world and hope to uh, for you a fruitful uh, uh, meeting for our postgraduate. Also, uh, it is a chance to uh, invite you to share us in the 1st and 2nd of September uh, for the World Against Infection and Orthopedic and the Trauma, uh, which will be held in uh, Cairo. Uh, sure, you are all are welcome there. And honored to represent many organizations all over the world, the Egyptian Specific Association, CECOT, uh, WIAT, and also WOC, World with Concerns, that I'm honored to be the director of Africa and honored to be a, a friend and closely working with the, the same principles of world with concern with uh, Dr. Tanija, Arendam, and uh, Ala. Uh, greeting and regard from the Miniverse Hospital on the River Nile, where we are working there. And only thanks for only one thing from the uh, Corona or COVID-19 that we are uh, in meeting every now and then, even virtual. Uh, talking about Elizarov as a basic knowledge give us uh, an idea about the, the word Elizarov. The word Elizarov is not only a word, it uh, transforms it from a word uh, or a name of uh, Gavriel Abramovich Elizarov to an apparatus which called for her, as his name, Elizar of Apretas. And the most important thing is the Elizar of principles of this man. So Elizar of uh, have three columns to be talking about in a light and in a, in a very uh, short, we will talk about that Elizar of began his work 1950s in this area in Siberia, in Kurgan. Uh, most of the year uh, are in uh, ice. Uh, I'm honored to be there uh, since maybe uh, more than 15 years ago. Uh, the invention or his idea uh, accidentally uh, discovered by himself uh, uh, while he uh, found that uh, rather than compression of a case of fracture, he find that the patient make distraction. So this uh, note uh, attach him to look for the distraction histogenesis, which is the marvelous uh, effect on the marvelous principle of his work. Uh, this marvelous effect applied in many uh, occasions and in many problems such as open fractures, osteomyelitis, bone lengthening. And he started working in a small team, not in that area and that building that we saw. As a history, he had unpublished uh, work in 1972 with uh, uh, Brummel. He was a uh, Soviet gold medal uh, high uh, jumper, which had been a fracture, which had been treated many times, but no uh, successful management. And later on, another famous and going abroad to give to have an Italian explorer and mountain uh, climber, uh, Morier, in uh, 1977. And in uh, uh, 1982, uh, uh, an ASAMI, which is the Association for a Study of Application of the Method of Elizaro, organized in Italy. And since that time, propagated to the United States by Aronso, Paley, and Frankel. And the most of his work had been popularized by Green in a very nice book. Returning to the Elizaro apparatus, we find that it is not easy to separate between Elizabeth operators and the Elizabeth principles. Most of the principles depend upon Elizabeth operators. It is not easy to go for separation from this. As a start, we will talk about the Elizabeth uh, 
uh, apparatus and in a hurry we can find that it is so important in management of many cases of fractures especially uh, uh, high energy trauma and intraarticular fractures and also overcome most of the deformity so it is important in many cases of orthopedic and the trauma cases especially in the difficulties and in uh, uh, complicated cases of both uh, sides of orthopedic the trauma and orthopedic conditions so we would like to have a light on the uh, the component and its name in a hurry the frame construct after knowing the component we can do a construct this construct may be modified to have many assemblies many assemblies to suit any condition that we have it is a so versatile apparatus so components first to form a construct this construct to take many figures and the many assembly looking in a hurry for this component we will find that it is uh, divided into two parts either primary components which is parts that attach the bone to the frame wires rings wire fixation balls only other than this so as not to disturb ourselves is a secondary component many are secondary components threaded rods scopic rods connecting a place it is looking for the first part that is so important is the wire the wire have two uh, 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 diameters either 105 or 108 this 105 is for the pediatric and 108 uh, is for 1.8 is for uh, uh, lower extremity and it is uh, uh, suitable for adults uh, the stiffness is proportional for the fourth power of its diameter we have either the bayonet uh, for the cortical and other one with the trocar one, which is suitable for the uh, cancellous port. We try in this uh, administration so as not to be kinked. And also we have some techniques that will appear later on in some slides. The function uh, is to stabilize or to work as a fulcrum. All these are important to know of the olive wires which is so important the rings may be uh, in the form of different types either half rings five eighths rings or omega rings multiple holes and in many sizes also five eighths ring omega rings and its shape which is used in the shoulder region and sometimes we are in need for tensioning uh, if we are not in need for a chance screw tensioning the wires is so important here this is the important uh, uh, arc which is called uh, this is suitable for only uh, uh, not only the femur and but also for those uh, in cases of uh, humerus uh, and the upper end of the for of the uh, of the arc uh, this is different and uh, from the classic uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, group than the other nowadays. This is uh, sometimes different. Here is the important thing as the, the uh, bolt, which have maybe a nylon threaded here, which helps for some function to keep in place with tightness. This is the bolt, which is one also of the essential parts how we hold the, 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 the wires using either a slotted or cannulated one and sometimes a very nice suitable one in this uh, tool this is also a plain washer and also another type with a, a slotted washer and this is a, a paired spherical washers in a case of oblique up to seven uh, degrees uh, also, this is the threaded rods and another type with the slotted threaded rods. This is rods that could be uh, a part of the connection between either the proximal construct or middle construct or the distal one. 
we have also another some uh, connections such as telescopic rods, which is here. This is maybe modified to have also a ratchet here to be used for lengthening to modify and easy application of lengthening technique. Another tool which is the post, the post may be one or two or three and maybe male or female one. Also, we have another one post, but with a, a special type that a symmetrical flattening gives it the chance to have uh, two arms in the same plan as we will see later on in another uh, slide. Uh, this is the old one uh, had been used for uh, attaching or capturing the wires. Later on, it is not uh, uh, found uh, nowadays uh, for many uh, organizations. And this is a straight plate, straight plate with uh, uh, a male end or a threaded rod, and the twisted plates, which is so important in the changing the direction of work. This is what's called the socket, which is available in two lenses. Another, which is important one, which is also called, uh, uh, this is the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the post uh, and the bushing here. We uh, should note that the diameter here of the bushing is wider and bigger than the threaded rod. This is the, this is the tensioners. And also the tension of that one is the pneumatic one, graduated and calibrated. And this one is a conventional one. And it is so important in the operating theater because that one sometimes blocked and off and becomes uh, obstructed. Looking after this, uh, we can look for, after knowing the, uh, uh, the component, we can go for frame construct the construct of any frame of the uh, Elizarov, as we will see here consists of two blocks in many instances the proximal block for blocking for the distal or for the leg as an example proximal construct and distal construct the proximal construct is composed of uh, 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 at least uh, one level of fixation uh, two level of fixation not one level of fixation and this is a construct the same two level of fixation, not one level of fixation. For many instances, we couldn't apply two rings, and in these cases, we will have something to uh, have an uh, additional uh, support uh, to uh, compensate uh, the uh, ring by another uh, level of fixation. So this is the component which is essential for us is to have a proximal component and the distal component for the fracture. This is how it looks in the X-ray, proximal one, distal one. And we clinically, we can find that the proximal construct here, and this is the distal. Here, what we call it, the reference wire, we applied it first. This is aligned with the, and the parallel with the tibial plateau here. And this is the, the measure and this is the standard of application of the Elizaro. This is the proximal construct, distal construct, and this is the working area. This is working area could be applied here, either to resect some bone. This is a fracture area, or maybe a deformity, or maybe some infection to make the brightment. This is the working area for doing the work, and this is the proximal distal one. Application of the Elizaro either be done proximal one, and distal one, and then attach it on table as a la carte uh, uh, design, or maybe uh, prefabricated or pre-constructed and inserted to the link, especially in, uh, 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 in cases of deformity for uh, uh, our uh, uh, start as a, a trainee in this uh, topic of Elizabeth uh, uh, application. So this is the basic Elizarov construct, proximal and distal construct connected to each other by an area which may be short or long according to the condition. We will have here an example for this. Starting by application of one ring, one half ring to another one half ring, or either to attach it for five eighths rings, 
or an omega rings or even an arch or even a complete circle starting by application for the first one this is one level of fixation which is not enough we should add another level of fixation this is enough and another the distal one fixation this is a working area in this case we do a debridement to treat infection so this is the basic instrumental construct proximal distal and working area here so we are in need to connect between those two constructs we are using either threaded rods or ratchet or either telescopic rods that, that had been done here application of the connection between both sides here's the area are ready now to apply either compression either uh, doing a muscular technique by application of uh, bonsimity the transfixation wire is applied from side to side usually we start from the serious area from the lateral side in most instances and in the proximal area and in the in the distal leg we can start from the medial side because it is a serious and so uh, posterior uh, uh, posterior uh, uh, neurovascular structures so this is the basic construct and this is are the tools and this is our the construct after knowing the components we can construct a construct of elizar now we are going to uh, stabilize or establish a new form of uh, uh, constructs suitable for many instances. Looking for this comminuted fracture tibia, the same frame is applied, but we should look for doing pre frame application by preliminary K wires fixation because it is so comminuted, and after that, we can either reassemble or, as we mentioned before, the proximal construct, then the distal construct, and connecting them to each other, so we have the full construct. This is in case of fractures. Another case, we can use Elizarov in uh, reduction of a case like this by application of Elizarov and making this direction between both ends, and so this could be aligned and reduction could be achieved. This is another assembly. So the construct could be used for many assemblies and many uh, uh, types. Looking for another one which is post-traumatic infected, another case with infection, intermedullar renal and the sinuses. All of this has been removed, removal of the intermedullar nerve, and looking for this area of the bad soft tissue and the application of the bridement and the removal of the sequestrated and the cross bone so long area have been debridement until this debridement we have what is called uh, the paprika sign the paprika sign means that oozing of the blood that means that all the necrotic bone had been getting out so we are now ready to apply muscular technique supported by the Elizarov until six weeks part after six weeks, we can remove it and do either bone graft here instead of this bone semen, or to do acute uh, shorting if it is small uh, area to be uh, compensated, or to do bone transport by doing the anchortocotomy in the metaphysical area. So, Lizarov could use, as mentioned, an open fracture and post fracture complications such as infection. Here, how it looks in the X-ray, the bone cement here, paving the way for doing either to do corticotomy here and bone transport, or to remove it after getting the grade of infection and making a few docking and making later on lengthening from the metaphysical area. Uh, this is, had been closed by doing a release incision, and this is later on follow up. He was in need for another interference, as we mentioned before. 
Uh, this is bone lensing, how it was happened in the ancient days. The Codivilla who started this by doing distraction and making acute or sometimes compensated by this. Elizarov also resulted by his technique of uh, distraction histogenesis uh, to have uh, uh, gradual lensing uh, that had been started long time away by 1905 uh, until Di Bastiani and Elizarov who modified and popularized the uh, corticotomy technique that give us the chance to have lensing for, we can say, at least 25% uh, of any long bones. So we have the advantage of this according to gradual distraction technique that had been done either using what is called the physis distraction. In this case, we call it chondrodiastasis. So our postgraduate should know that the chondrodiastasis is meaning distraction of the physis. And also we did another type of lengthening using uh, low energy osteotomy or either osteotomy or what is called corticotomy or callotesis. As we will see, the gradual lengthening depends about, upon chondrodiastasis, as we mentioned. This is depend upon that we should uh, make distraction, which is not easy to be done and have some complications. And it could be done actually, but with have, may have some complications and is the most popularized and safe to some extent is the callotesis. The callotesis is from its name, distraction of the callus. This is more acceptable doing a gradual and low energy corticotomy, as we will mention. And this depends upon most important thing with the preservation of the soft tissue envelope surrounding the bone. So Elizarov started this and Aldegheri and his associates also. And it depends upon that the uh, metaphysical area, which is so good in uh, uh, blood supply, uh, modern technique of lensing depend upon the policy of Elizarov, which is distraction osteogenesis, which is not actually osteogenesis only, but histogenesis. It distract, make uh, new genesis of all the uh, soft tissue and bone uh, construct of this area. So this gradual distraction depend upon uh, the application of the uh, step of Elizarov, appropriate corticotomy should be done within limited incision. And Elizarov uh, uh, pre prepare this either doing by his osteotome only, but some surgeon do uh, perforation by using uh, 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 drilling, then uh, continue this uh, by osteotomy. And the last technique is the, using a giggly saw. Here, how is Elizarov using his five millimeter osteotome to cut the bone and to complete the cut by doing external rotation to complete the cut of the posterior cortex. And the other famous one is doing a drilling and the continuation those points of drills by using uh, the osteotome, which is also perfect and effective. And the third one, as we mentioned, using the giggly saw. After doing this corticotomy, we should stay for three up to 21 day of latent period. This depends up, upon the, uh, uh, the activity of the bone. Three days could be for those of small, small size bone or the infant or children in each of up to six years or less and up to 21 maybe and those older patients. So it is depend upon the activity of the bone. We didn't do any distraction after doing corticotomy. We keep everything as it is and the starting distraction after this, what is called the latent period. We start latent period by distraction period, distraction period to compensate or do lengthening. This distraction period, as we will see here, start in this area of the corticotomy 
This is the area of the, the corticotomy. After this latent period, start by moving all this. This, after keeping this in place for uh, three days, seven days, 12 days, after that time, we will have here what is called the callus, as we know. This is the hematoma. This is the reflex of uh, doing uh, uh, start of regeneration. So we start moving this by doing what is called callutesis. This is what is the technique means by using pre-drilling or either gigliso or using the osteotomy technique to do uh, uh, corticotomy after the corticotomy, latent period, after latent period, we start distraction period. After attaining the lens, we should stay for this regenerate bone. This is how it looks, so weak. We should stay, still stay for uh, uh, some time until the regenerate sort of transform it into solid bone or what's called consolidation or calcification. And this consolidation makes the bone so heavy that we can assess it by AP and lateral view. If we found that we have three cortices, means that this is a, we can dismantle and do what is called dynamization of the apparatus before removal of the apparatus. This distraction rate is so important for ourselves to know. It is with a rate and risk. The rate is one millimeter per day, and the rhythm is this one meter is divided either three times or four times to be uh, uh, 0.25 uh, point, uh, millimeter or uh, one third millimeter every eight hours uh, or uh, oh, uh, 05 and 05. This is how it looks in the histopathology, the direct justification of the fibrous tissue because here the major formation of the new bone and the distraction gap is intramembranous bone formation. It looks like the bone of the infant. It is an intramembranous. This is how, uh, how it looks, the distraction osteogenesis, how it looks in the X-ray. Sometimes this X-ray, this this lengthening uh, could uh, uh, need uh, uh, one centimeter. Sometimes need one month for one, one every, every 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 case thirty and fifty days per centimeter according to the condition. In those polio weak bone, we may need fifty days per centimeter to have consolidation and in the healthy or adult we can have just only one month for each centimeter. Some complications appear such as those tract infection. Also we have many complications could be happened but most of them if they will treat it uh, will bypass without problem. Another assembly is that to go for the deformity one. This is a deformity. This, this deformity could be tackled also with uh, Elizar. Using Elizar for the deformity, need for ourselves to construct another assembly depending upon the site of the cora, the angulation, and the bisector line, and the cora. And the most important thing is the axis of correction of angulation, what's called ACA. According to these uh, uh, requirements, we can have a new assembly of Elizarov, as we will see here. This is the assembly according to the deformity. We should have the hinge. How we uh, now we can see the hinge, which is two post, as we mentioned before. This is the action, and this is the work of the post. And this is the serrated rods. This is one ring, one ring. And as we will see here, the same construct, but instead of putting one uh, threaded rod, as this is the standard one, we put here instead of threaded rod, we will put here the hinge to be instead of this threaded rod. This is the hinge to instead to be replaced to replace the threaded rod. The same construct is 
proximal construct, distal construct, but instead of this threaded rod, we put a hinge to correct and use this hinge to correct against that. So we can do here what is called the distractor. Here can do distraction, and this is distraction will help after the cotomy here to correct this default. How it looks here in the slobone. This is the hinge. Here's the corticotomy and distractor here. And this is the proximal construct, which here looks like no two rings, but ring and uh, drop uh, wire. Or here, a rank who had been used, but in the distal one, we have full uh, construct of two rings. And we have here two hinge and here have the distractor. And this is the area of working for doing the correction. This is another way of using a lazar of principles, which is so important. Looking for the uh, hinges here, it is on the uh, center of the saw bone and the posterior part of the uh, bone and the anterior part of the bone. According to the position of the hinge, we can have either the neutral one or the sectional. Looking for this diagram to have it in the outer cortex here. In that, in that time, it, it will be neutral one because it will open with an open wedge. So it will be open wedge. If we put it in the center, it will be neutral. And if it is here, it will be shortened and not neutral one. Here, how it is important to use Elizara for correction of a case of juxta articular or juxta articular deformity, either in the femur or the tibia. Here it looks in the so bone. If it is here in the outer side of the cortex, we will have lengthening. If we here, if we have here, it is so wide so far away from the center of the bone, so we will find that it is become so longer, so longer every now and then. If we go out or go away from the bone, it will be more longer and more longer and more longer. So to be here, it is neutral. To be here, it is just open, which but to be here, a lizard of application give you the chance to do lengthening and the correction of the bone in the same time as here. This is one of the principles of Elizar. So we couldn't separate between the Elizar of apparatus and its principle. And also for this, we have a, a problem that we have JAXA articular here. We are obliged to help uh, the management with alignment later on. So also Elizar of give us the chance by doing this through this technique by application of this hinge up here and the side of the cora and doing osteotomy, which is not suitable to put it here interarticular, we have the osteotomy there. And so we will have now modification of the alignment and also correction of authority. And this help us to have a very nice aligned at last clinic. So, uh, 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 in short, because we may have many other work, especially in the foot, such as this, using it, and correction of deformity, such as distraction histogenesis in these cases, also. And also in bone and soft tissue defect in such cases by using it as an orthoplastic effect by covering this area by doing what is called skin traction. So as a conclusion, in this first uh, presentation, we can say that Elizarov is not a name, Elizarov is an apparatus. Elizarov is a principle. Elizarov is 
principal and apparatus with each other. We could separate between the principal of Lizarov and the Lizarov apparatus. Lizarov apparatus give us the chance to correct uh, the deformity with the patient uh, 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 ability to walk uh, from the first day by using the uh, tension uh, and the uh, trampoline effect of the Lizarov, we will have a very good uh, healing power. Uh, the Lizarov has the ability to apply skin traction, also to do lengthening safely for at least 25% of the patient, also to do corticotomy safe, to do correction and also in lensing in meanwhile, and also while we are correcting, we can have the patient moving here and there without uh, any assistance in many instances, and also to have juxta articular management in uh, the difficult cases by having alignment at last. And the most important thing is the distraction histogenesis by correcting the soft tissue without real incision at all by uh, uh, correction of the uh, difficulties uh, of the uh, post-surgical scarring by management uh, uh, without uh, blood and what is called bloodless uh, technique. I hope that in all these uh, 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 panorama and this short time, uh, know that the Elizarov component, Elizarov assembly, and assembly is used for open fracture, closed fracture, fracture complications, and in many instances, in the form the correction. Thank you. I am sorry for those five minutes I talk at more. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fadul, and uh, thank you for the bird's eye view of Elizarov. I think it was very illuminative. We won't have any questions now. We have the questions at the end. Now, may I request uh, Professor Shantaram Shetty to start his screen sharing and talk about osteoporosis and issues related to fractures. I uh, also request everyone to please keep yourselves muted apart from the speakers and the chairs. Please keep yourself muted because it causes a disturbance to the speakers. Shall I? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, we are here for the last uh, two hours in this session. And uh, after the Elizaro lecture, we go on to a disease of the bone. <laughs> uh, Very nice. The osteoporosis and osteoporotic related fractures. Sounds excellent. Again, uh, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Taneja, it is a pleasure to be associated and I bring the greetings from my own university and from my own hospital. Mm -hmm. What is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis means bone, porosis, which means porous, which is a progressive systematic skeletal disease characterized by low bone mass and micro-architectural deterioration of bone tissue as a tissue, with a consequent increase in bone fragility and thereby susceptibility to fracture. But the WHO operationally defines osteoporosis as a bone density that falls 2.5 standard deviation below the mean for young healthy individuals of the same sex. It is also referred to as T-score of minus 2.5. And if it is minus 1, it is called osteopenia. What are the types of osteoporosis by origin? By origin, osteoporosis can be primary or secondary. Again, by primary, it can be postmenopausal or type 2, 
which is Chennai. The second big causes of osteoporosis are due to either renal failure, hyperparathyroidism, hydrogenic due to corticosteroids and anticonvulsants. Or it can be lifestyle induced with tobacco and alcohol abuse. And mainly these are the things we will be discussing. Coming to primary osteoporosis, which affects 80% of women and 60% of men with osteoporosis. And type 1 osteoporosis may occur in postmenopausal women between 51 to 8, almost 70 year, 75 years of age, which is characterized by accelerated and disproportionate trabecular bone loss. Again, repeat, accelerated disproportionate trabecular bone loss and associated with vertebral body and distal forearm fractures, which are common in type 1 type of fractures, which is estrogen withdrawal with the estrogen withdrawal effect. Whereas in type 2, which is involutional, where occurs in both men and women above 70 years of age, which is characterized both by both trabecular and cortical bone loss and associated with fractures of the proximal humerus commonly and of the proximal tibia, femoral neck or trochantic fractures and even fractures of the pelvis. Coming to laboratory tests, the most important test which is, which is to be undertaken today in 2021 22 is biochemical profile uh, to, to evaluate the renal and hepatic function. Primary hyperparathyroidism to be ruled out and malnutrition. CBC for nutritional status. TSF to rule out hyperthyroidism. And vitamin D level has to be considered even with the 24-hour collection of urine. But the most important test today is the biochemical markers of bone, which indicates remodeling, may be useful to predict rate of bone loss, or follow therapy response, which are both important. Specific biochemical markers followed by a three-month interval to document normalization as a response to therapy. Number one is a high turnover osteoporosis, high levels of resorption of markers and formation of markers, which results in accelerated bone loss responding best to anti-resorptive therapy. It is high turnover osteoporosis. Whereas if it is a low turnover osteoporosis or normal turnover osteoporosis, normal or low levels of markers of resorption and bone formation, no accelerated bone loss, responds best to drugs that enhances bone formation. So to understand osteoporosis, it is a balance between bone formation and bone resorption. That has to be understood. And when there is an imbalance, it results in osteoporosis. In osteoporosis, there is loss of bone loss, trabecular plates, cortical thickness, and loss of cortical thickness, and thereby contiguity. Thereby, there is a structural weakening of the bone as a whole. Accelerated bone loss occurs in women after menopause because of activity of osteoclast, which is enhanced. Osteoclasts make deeper and more numerous resorption like you know, and the osteoclasts are unable to replace the resorbed bone. And this process results in neck bone loss. By comparison, the bone loss that occurs with normal aging results from a decrease in osteoclast activity, while osteoclasts retain, remain normal or even slightly decreased activity. That has to be understood. Gentlemen, the world population is aging. Imagine what was just a triangle. In just from in 30 years, it is going to be a rectangle. With more than 60 to 70 years people, almost equaling between 30 to 40 or 20 years of age. And this, uh, this is the statistics. In 1950, 88% of the people were osteoporotic. In 2000, it was 10% mostly Euro-Asians. And mind you, in 2050, 21% of the general population will be osteoporotic. And majority of these will be in the African and especially in the Asian countries, especially in India and in China. So thereby, the dimension of the problem is fracture incidence will increase almost two to three-fold 
to aging with the aging population. One fracture leads to the other. And here are three examples. And in six months, in one and a half years, in two and a half years, the patient, if it was not treated with antiresorptives or any therapy, thereby the patient had a fracture of the opposite hip in just within one or two years of time. One fracture leads to almost 2.5 fold of future fractures. 20% have on the opposite side in just five years' time. About 47% up to 26 risk reduction by antiresorptive drugs, mind you. So the rates of treatment of osteoporosis, unfortunately, even today, is low. In India, it is by a rough estimation, almost 6% of our population are osteoporotic. That means about 6.25 to about 6.5 crores of people sustain of, of this one-fifth sustained fractures at least once in their lifetime. Unless these people are treated properly, it can cause an economic stagnation of a developing country like ours. Osteoporosis is treatable, but unfortunately it is underdiagnosed and we wake up only when there is a fracture and even after that, very little is done. Gallag in their classical uh, publication have found only 18% of the osteoporotic fractures treat, were treated, were put on either calcium or vitamin D or anti drugs, and only 10% had, had previous treatment to the next fracture. We did a study in our own study. We found about 35% are put on calcium or vitamin D after a fracture, even after a neck or trochantic fracture. But only less than 1% are put on anti resorptive drugs or even teripartite or any other drug. In a study undertaken by Dr. Bal Sankaran, who was my professor long, back, long ago, osteoporosis, we published this paper, a book. He reported osteoporosis to affect Indian population at an earlier age compared to the Caucasians, almost one decade before. If the Caucasian has osteoporosis, 70 Indians have at 60. What happens in osteoporosis? Is the lower number of osteoblasts? Is the decreased activity of osteoblasts? Impaired secondary osteoangiogenesis? Comorbidity is the rule, and all are controversial publication. Look at this man in 1988. He was Mr. World, who was the governor of uh, California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And in 2016, in just 28 years, look at his body shape, basking in an African coast. All over the world, we have fracture assessment today, it developed by WHO to evaluate fracture risk. It predicts fracture risk by BMD plus clinical risk factors, provides individualized absolute risk over a 10 year period <coughs> about hip fracture or major osteoporotic fractures. Guidelines regarding when to intervene are also emerging. All these are clinical risk factors, the CRF from age to the glucocorticoid steroids to current smoking and parental history of the fracture and secondary osteoporosis due to hypogonadism or hyperthyroidism or various other conditions. Each CRF independently contributes a fracture probability. So the presence of more than one CRF increases the probability of the fracture and it has to be taken into consideration. In most of the developed countries, unfortunately, fracture is not is that too much. In the whole Asian in the Asian region, only China has the fracture frax, frax assessment, and we are in India. We are yet to get into that. Bone mineral density using dual energy X-ray topsiometry, DEXA is the standard method and indicator of fracture risk today. And these are the picture will indicate, and the bone BMD using dual energy is the standard method and indicator of a fracture risk. We must understand that in osteoporosis, in cancerous bone, there is reduction of bone mineral density. The trabeculae are thinned out and reduced in number, as you see in that slide. Thereby, the bone holding capacity of the implant is reduced. You look into the plate, which is a stronger bone in a 20-year-old to 80-year-old, the opposite cortex, just screw th two screw threads holds on to the opposite cortex in an elderly, elderly patient, whereas nearly three to four screw threads hold on to the opposite cortex. This has to be taken into consideration. Before treating a fracture, in a study of National Osteoporosis Foundation, it was found by better care of the elderly, like better environment, hip pads, 
the, the fractures can be prevented. And exercises of various types in different countries. Uh, here are Chinese who are exercising in the in the Tuffle Square. In the various various training has increased the bone density. But in India, in many of the many of the many of the, uh, the Asian countries, we have fish in abundance. We have we have enough of sunlight. We have other nuts, soya beans, groundnut, and sada and fish easily available and affordable to patients. We are working on this module, and early results are indeed encouraging. And as an exercise, yoga is an ideal exercise, which has which Patanjali described nearly nearly three thousand years ago. And these are the different modes of exercises, which and pranayama really increases your your breath, increases your chest expansion, increases your well being. Coming to drug therapy, hormone therapy, antiresorptives, and the important are PTH, denizumab, and remesumab today. And terms of tamoxifen and calcitonin are in the second line. And with, a, of course, a supportive calcium and vitamin D. FDA approved therapeutic, the, the prevention of estrogen. The uh, prevention is by estrogen, where the treatment is calcitonin, PTH, denizumab, and remesumab, and all the bisphosphonates are uh, in between. Elendronate is the most commonly drug used in India, the most commonly drug in India. And various bisphosphonates, weekly, monthly, and yearly doses, and the followed up, and unfortunately, the follow up in our country, and many of the developing countries are this one. And we found only 20% of the patients who were advised were taking anti -resorptors. Complications are few or many, sometimes many, with bisphosphonates, as all of us know, especially the subprochantic fracture bilateral or single. Although all this complicates the gum involvement of the mandible resorption and the vertebral fractures. And the benefit from this drug, however, far surpasses the ill effects. Teripartite is a recombinant uh, human parathyroid hormone and used for postmenopausal women with osteoporosis. It is also used in men with primary or hypogonadal osteoporosis who are at high risk of fracture. It is just a simple 20, 20 micrograms of injection of OD and subcutaneously into the thigh or abdominal wall. And it is it can be used up to 18 months. More than 18 months is not recommended. And many risks that may increase the risk of stroke in elderly women has to be taken into consideration. Delivery device has been well documented and used. The cost factor is little high, almost 18,000 per month. And the cost per year, about two and a half lakhs. Coming to denizumab, which is a newer drug, which is the human monoclonal antibody to rankle, decreases bone resorption by inhibiting the formation of activity of osteoclast. The activity of osteoclast is inhibited. Thereby, bone resorption is less. It is 60 milligrams subcutaneously every six months is given. And uh, that, is, that is a drug which, is, which costs six months about 1.2 lakhs. The latest drug which has come to the market by approved by the FDA is Ramesuzumab, which is by, by, the, by the protocol of Evinity. This is the newest bone building medication to treat osteoporosis. It is given as an injection every month at the doctor's office. It is limited to one year of treatment, followed by other osteoporotic protect medications. It's a steroid inhibitor, which is both bone forming and bone resorbing is, is also controlled. <clears throat> Coming to surgical treatment, the goals are very definitive today. To operate as soon as possible, to avoid complications, to avoid secondary fractures, to correct non-surgical problems, to return the same quality of life which is important in an elderly. Principles and problems are the same wherever you are, but we must understand that osteoporotic fractures, we are not just treating the fractures. We are usually, with the, which are usually community, which are usually subparticular, which are usually osteoporotic, which are osteoporotic. But an elderly patient with many superadded problems like diabetes, CV disorders, osteoarthrosis and rheumatoid arthritis, and overadded, in many of our countries, social and economic problems. So most of the patients, unfortunately, are not treated properly the world over. And the patient compliance also, because of the age, is poor. Look at the problem of osteoporosis. It's a very thin bone where 
almost we are trying to fix it at the excel with this screw so the basic principles to be followed in osteoporotic fractures to be good results to give results is to bring about biological fixation use load sharing implants like interlocking nails tension band devices bring about impaction and compression which enhances stability use wide buttress plates use tension band devices long splintage interlocking nails augment the bone with cement or bone graft whenever necessary finally if you think nothing helps replace the joint itself no doubt today the locking plates of different shapes and sizes different colors and modes and anatomical plates have changed the scenario again especially in metaphyseal fractures upper upper tibial supracondylar fractures proximal humerus distal humerus distal radius fractures for the lower so the, the lower tibial fractures itself supramalleolar fractures it's a pilon fractures there are seven plates which have come into work vertebroplasty <clears throat> and kyphoplasty have brought in remarkable relief of pain and comfort and further collapse and which has to be taken into consideration today we augment aug different augmentation techniques and delivery cement delivery systems have come into work newer implant designs have brought about better fixation devices as you see here the different bone cement delivery systems which have come into place here is a pfn which with, with a, a two but where with a special delivery system of the cement it is it is fixed that way but in india we must mind we are 1.3 billion people today 10% can afford any treatment you offer 60% are middle class families half of them cannot afford lgps and 30% are below the poverty line so what is to be done the charge the, the challenge is uh, that we are to solve this problem chain the implant design is so very costly you, what our advice is use standard implants in a in a rational way load sharing not load bearing by bridging and splinting no peak load or stress concentration has to take place look into hence use the elizaro technique which dr farad rightly mentioned or or use the you tension band devices and uh, use plates which are which are, which buttress the fracture here is a very comminuted fracture in an elderly the osteoporotic very well fixed with a proximal humeral plate but at the same time here is a fracture which is displaced three part fracture just with the impaction secured by a tension band and the sharply fibers guarantee excellent hold and the fracture unites well no doubt in a fracture dislocation of of the shoulder in many types many 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 the fillos is an ideal solution but we have come across even with from fillos to we have to come to, come to the multi lock nail today and look at that fracture dislocation of the shoulder with the multi lock nail it has been reduced properly anatomically and the shape of the head is back into place and the arc of the shoulder is very well maintained here evolution of intermediate nails for the humerus have come come a long way and today we have we have, we have multi lock nails for humerus which gives both ability and stability a screw in screw situation where a multi lock system has been devised for better fixation device especially in elderly people which increases the pull out resistance almost six times as you see here and that is a pre operative status of a fracture dislocation and you see so well reduced with a perfect perfectly done multi lock nail whereas here is an elderly patient and with a tension band device it was reduced back into position but all the fractures i do not say all the fractures will but the cost factor itself fillos will cost 25 to 30000 rupees a cost of a tension band is rupees 500 and that is the functional range of that patient coming to distal distal humerus fracture in elderly with the peripheral neuropathy no doubt the newer newer plates which have come of different shapes are are the ideal to ideal to fix in either 1990 90 or or 180 degrees whereas here is a 78 70 year old almost an intraarticular fracture comminuted where no plate can be fixed and it, this was fixed with just a tension band device both and as you see here distal radius fracture which is very common in elderly women and different plates of different shapes and different multi lock many lock system have have come into vogue as you see here or 
it is fixed with a simple wire like this. But majority, all the publications today, all around the world, emphasize that in elderly, about 70 years of age with osteoporosis, a simple reduction and maintenance of the reduction, as you see here, will give excellent results with all the all the modalities brought in and a stable TRUG, and that is the position. <clears throat> Coming to the proximal femur, which is again a big problem in elderly, uh, cantilus screws, uh, the cannulated screws, the cemented bipolar have come into vogue of different sizes. And in trochantic fractures, the, 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 the DHS and the intermedical devices, gamma nails and PFN, sorry, PFN2 has come into way. But the long nails, which are, which, are, which are quite helpful in these elderly patients, have to be taken into consideration. And if it is a stable fracture, still DHS has a role. But intermedial device always goes over. Here is a subtrochantic fracture, which has been had a, he is 96 year old and she is a perfectly dying PFN. No doubt, the, from unipolar, we have gone to bipolar to total hips, depending on the, uh, the, on the strength of the patient, the occasion of the patient, the, how good he is, it can, it can, you, can, you can select whatever you feel like. Here is a patient is, which was strongly plated, and I like, do no harm if you cannot do any good, but this was impacted, the impaction was brought about with, with, with good bone grafting, with a simple plate, and the fracture unites well. And here is, a, here is a, what do you do in a fracture of this nature? Many times you will have to innovate yourself. This was, at a, this was a DHS done nearly 20 years ago and the patient comes with this and it was almost impossible to remove, remove, that, play, remove that screw and a plate. And we had to devise our own innovation and we innovated and we just removed the screw because it was not possible to remove that the DHS. And, and the intermediary nail was devised from, from the retrograde and two holes were made proximally and to posteriorly and fixed. And finally, the fracture unites very well. So innovate yourself. No doubt distal femur is also, distal femur also is a challenge many times in elderly people. You can either fix it with a plate, but ideal will be to fix it with a retrograde nail and because it's a privilege. Gentlemen, ideal situation in osteoporotic fractures. Pin and plates are just not enough. A call for treatment for osteoporotic fracture by ethylene stoves rightly says pin and plasters are not enough. Efforts have to be concentrated on prevention of osteoporosis and thereby fracture prevention itself in the elderly. So that our elderly all over the world are saved from the agony of osteoporosis and related osteoporotic fractures. Basic mechanical and biological aspects of internal fixation of fractures can never be eclipsed by new fixation devices, whatever anatomical plates you have. Inferior surgical handicrafts is even more unforgiving in osteoporotic bone than in a normal bone. A surgeon should be a gardener and not just a carpenter. To conclude, in osteoporosis worldwide, threat is a reality. It has to be faced with vigor and an interdisciplinary approach. Be innovative and use God-given sunlight, food, supplements like groundnut, fish and milk and yoga to prevent osteoporotic fractures. Anti-resorptives are still the mainstay of medical therapy, but long-term therapy can cause complications, as I've already mentioned. PTH, teripartite, Denisumab, Remesazumab have opened new vistas, vistas for medical treatment of osteoporosis. Gene therapy and stem therapy are proving new horizons and perhaps hope for future treatment of osteoporosis. As surgeons, with the advent of newer plates and nails, fixation of osteoporotic fractures have become much easier world over. And as postgraduates of the future surgeons, of our country and the world. In developing countries like India, with the same basic principles of tension match, buttressing and impaction of fractures up with innovations can bring fairly good results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shetty. That was a very, very good uh, bird's eye view of osteoporosis. And I now call upon Dr. Kushnud of Pakistan to please give his lecture on bearing surfaces in total hip arthroplasty, what an orthopedic surgeon should know. 
Dr. Kushtu, please. Shall we hear this? You want to hear it? I will hear it. Very soon. May I have that? You, if you want to. I have a question about after half an hour. That's it. Uh, uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Your, your audible question, go ahead. Yes. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Dr. David Tanejar, uh, Dr. Aretha Banerji, and Ahlan Osalman. So, my talk is on um, bearing surface in total hip orthoplasty and what an orthopedic surgeon should know. What are the indications of total hip arthroplasty? Everybody knows that. It's arthritis, trauma, tumors, ankylosis, and congenital anomalies. What should be our goals in total hip arthroplasty? We should have a painful hip. It should be functional. It should be stable. And very importantly, it should be lasting. Now, history is that the interpositional arthroplasty was first uh, started by Sir Robert Jones, and he put in gold foils in between the joint surfaces. Then mold orthoplasty came in uh, in 1923 by Smith Peterson. Glass was used, Pyrex, backlight. In 1937, Vitalium was uh, used and uh, by Venable and Stuck, and uh, results were encouraging. Jude brothers revo revolutionized total hip orthoplasty, and they used heat-cured acrylic femoral head uh, prosthesis. But initially, it led to severe tissue reaction, fragmentation of acrylic, and bone destruction. Metal on metal by Urist, Ring, and McKee Farrar, which led to, initially, to friction of metalware, high inc incidence of loosening, and pain, and this uh, friction of metalware led to metallosis. Now, in 1962, Sir John Charnley started the first metal on poly total hip prosthesis. Now, design of total hip replacement is an acetabular cup, a femoral stem, cement, and nowadays more and more use of the cementless processes with hydro uh, hydroxy appetite coating. Articulate, articulating components should minimize the generation of wear particles in order to optimize long-term survival of the prosthesis. A good understanding of the tribological properties helps the orthopedic surgeon to choose the most suitable bearing for each individual patient. Conventional and highly cross-linked polyethylene articulating either with metal or ceramic. Ceramic on ceramic and metal on metal are the most commonly used bearing combinations used nowadays. All combinations of bearing surface have their advantages and disadvantages. Tribology is defined as a branch of science and technology that deals with the study of friction, wear, and lubrication. Now, material and structure properties, uh, to understand that, you have to understand Young's modulus, which is the stress divided by strain, where stress is given by force per unit area and strain by change in length as a function of original length. Bone, as everybody knows, is this anisotropic material, meaning that its mechanical properties are greater in one direction than other, due to the alignment of collagen fibers and osteon. And so they, you come up with different values when the forces are applied in different directions. An ideal, an ideal bearing surface should have a low coefficient of friction. It should be resistant to third body damage and wear. It should generate small amounts of wear debris and it should cause low cellular reactions to such wear debris. Metal on poly bearings in the early 1960s 
with appearance of aseptic loosening of prosthesis was not completely explic explicable at that time. So new, numerous hypotheses were generated and the one which came to be known as the cement disease, which subsequently led to the development of uncemented implant. Particle disease, uh, polyethylene where particles are generated in the absence of the fluid film lubrication between the femoral head and the acetabular cup. Due to abrasive and adhesive wear caused by relative movements between the two surfaces. Wear particles trigger a series of biochemical reactions which change the dynamic balance between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. The enhanced osteoclast activity results in osteolysis in the areas affected by high number of wear particles. This resorption of bone eventually leads to aseptic loosening of implants in the long term. Osteolysis is directly correlated with the amount of debris particles. Highly cross-linked polyethylenes were developed in the 1990s. The cross-linking of the polymer chain by forming bonds between them allows the modification of the molecular structure of the polyethylene, leads to a significantly higher resistance against abrasive and adhesive wear. Cross-linking is achieved by irradiation using either electron beams or gamma rays. The polymer, the polymer is a high molecular weight polyethylene with extremely long chains. Linear, linear wear of metal on poly bearings is typically within the range of 100 to 300 micromillimeters per year. This corresponds to a volumetric wear of around 20 to 150 cubic millimeters per year for 28 millimeter heads. Previous research had suggested that linear wear rates of 22 mm, 28 mm, and 32 mm heads do not vary uh, significantly. The introduction of ceramic, that is alumina, aluminum oxide heads, reduced the polyethylene wear by approximately 50%. For 28% diameter heads, this resulted in a reduction of volumetric wear by approximately 75%, with values between 5 milli cubic millimeters and 50 milli cubic millimeters per year. Reported linear wear rates ranging from between 2 and 20 micromillimeters per year and volumetric wear rates substantially lower than 1 cubic meter per year for 28 millimeter prosthetic femoral heads. Following reports in several publications that the highly crossing polys of the first generation can exi exhibit signs of oxidation, especially those that had undergone thermal treatment. So highly crossed link polys treated with vitamin E were recently introduced. Mechanism of wear in total hip orthoplasty bearings is either abrasive wear, where two surfaces of different hardness rub against each other, adhesive wear and third body wear. Adhesive wear is when adhesions during contact of opposing bearing surface take place, sliding breaks these contacts. Strength of adhesions exceed, exceeds strength of the material, resulting in particles that are pulled from the material. Abrasive wear is hard project, projection on one surface cuts into the opposing surface. Third body wear is when hard particles such as bone or cement if trapped between bearing surfaces, cause abrasive wear, fatigue wear, when repetitive loading of the bearings during articulation, wear debris causes osteolysis, compromises fixation, and complicates revision procedures. Now, the stem shape is also very important in total uh, hip arthroplasties. Cemented components are of a lesser diameter than uncemented components. It's very natural because you have to allow for the cement uh, one to two millimeter of it, which acts as a grout. Circular and elliptical sections of the stem have least potential for bony attachments. Shorter stems are used for primary total hip 
arthroplasties, whereas longer strands are used for revisions. Modular designs used in the stems, uh, they can have a modular head. They can be variable neck lengths. Independent sizes of proximal and distal parts of the stem. Modular stem have some advantages over monoblock stems. Soft tissue balancing is of increasing importance in to total hip arthroplasty, though it is not a bearing surface, but one must remember that in doing total hip arthroplasty, soft tissue balancing is of utmost importance. Metal on metal bearings, the first implantation was done in 1938 by Giles. Primarily due to the poor manufacturing tolerances at that time, this historical bearing yielded largely unsatisfactory clinical results, which were elevated wear and friction. Failure analysis of the first generation metal on metal implants led to a greater understanding of the site design considerations. This, together with further improvements in manufacturing, in 1998, encouraged Weber et al. to develop a second generation of metal on metal articulations with a head diameter of either 28 or 32 millimeters. National Joint Registry data in the developed countries have shown that large diameter of metal on metal hip arthroplasties and resurfacing with metal on metal bearing surface have significantly higher revision rates compared with those with conventional bearings. Ceramic on ceramic articulations after metallic on metal on metal, ceramic on ceramic articulations developed in France in 1970s and was, was the second alternative bearing to the metal on poly bearings. Alumina and zirconia ceramic have historically been used in total hip arthroplasty, with alumina being the most frequently used of the two. Alumina has a very low friction coefficient making it appropriate choice for an orthopedic bearing surface. In addition, alumina is biocompatible and in vivo, its material properties are not affected by aging. Ceramic on metal articulations, the use of low wear ceramic on metal articulation within total hip arthroplasty was first reported by Firkins in 2001. The differential hardness of the bearing partners was thought to reduce the squeaking issues found with ceramic on ceramic bearings. Here I would like to tell you we had a patient who underwent uh, ceramic on ceramic and you could hear her walk um, into your office, outside your office, even outside your office. So to reduce that, uh, ceramic or metal articulations came up, were brought up as well as the wear-related adverse events found in the metal on metal articulations. To overcome these adverse events of metal on metal, ceramic on metal articulations were designed. In vivo studies seem to indicate that post-operative iron level on this bearing type are still significantly elevated. Polymethyl meta meta acrylate is the material commonly used for within bone and prosthetic stabilization. Cement interdigitates within the bone and it is stronger in compression than tension. It acts as a grout and hence there is no true adhesive bond between the prosthesis and the bone. Third generation cementation has come in. Vacuum preparation to reduce porosity and increase cement strength. Distal plugging is done, pulsatile lavage and cement gun and cement restrictions are used. Ideally, a uniform cement mental is from two to four millimeters. In cemented implants, smooth polished stems are used to allow physiological subsidence due to viscoelastic properties. The stems have to, the implants have to have smooth surfaces. Rough surfaces on cemented stems have not been successful due to the increase in shear and tensile stresses at the interface, leading to debonding and interface micromotion. It is a must that you have a strong adjacent bone cortex. Cemented femoral stems, uh, they are modular 
and non-modular. They are with the collar or without the collar. The surface uh, finish is smooth, uh, polished or coated, and the shape of the stem is uh, with a flange, straight or tapered. Bearing surface with standard polyethylene are still considered good options and perform very, very well in the elderly, low demand patients who have a life expectancy of less than 15 years, while alternatives have emerged for younger, higher demand patients. While metal on metal articulation with small head presented good long term clinical results, clinical issues with larger diameter heads shed bad light. According to MIGO, the only exception for active patients might be resurfacing orthoplasty, for which there are currently no credible alternatives to metal or metal implants. Ceramic, or ceramic bearing combinations yield good clinical results and therefore remain a viable option in younger and more active patient population. Due to its rare characteristics, Ceramic on ceramic is particularly suitable for patients require large femoral head diameters, 40 millimeters, 44 and 48 millimeters. These are the different types, metal on metal, metal on poly, ceramic on poly and ceramic on ceramic. So the future is to extend the durability and survivorship of these components in a younger patient age group. Probability of developing a pharmacological inhibitors of osteolytic response. Development of noble materials and surfaces. Remelting, heating above the melting range of polyethylene and alene, heating below the melting range. Vitamin E antioxidant containing polyethylene. In metal and metal, there is an increase in femoral head size, grading cycle velocity, and increased probability of uh, fluid film uh, lubrication would lead to a decrease in wear. And this is a reduced risk of impingement and dislocation of 32 millimeter heads and bigger. Ceramic on metal, the alumina head, cobalt chromium alloy cup, reduced wear rate, wear, wear rate of 100 fold and clinical studies are underway. Ceramics, uh, Alumina, alumina zirconia combination for increasing the toughness of alumina. 75% alumina, 24% zirconia, 1% chromium oxide. There's greater bending strength, lower wear rate, added manufacturing complexity, but the downside is the increased costs and rates of fracture. Take home message is there is no 100% ideal bearing surface. Hard on hard and hard or soft are the surfaces available. One should be aware of tribology, which is friction, lubrication, and wear. Wear causes osteolysis. Modern bearings all have low wear. Young and active patients should have hard and hard bearings, which will produce less wear debris, but at times noise remains a problem. For hard on hard bearings, Cup, replacement, cup placement is important to reduce risk of impingement. Now, as important as the implants or the material may be, there is no substitute for surgical technique. So therefore, cup placement is important to reduce risk of impingement, excessive wear and fracture. Metal on metal bearing release metal ions and corrosion products and probably should not be used for patients with impaired kidney function or women of childbearing age. Soft tissue balancing and proper placement of components plays a wider role in the longevity of total repository policy. Here I would like to add, and I would like to request everybody that all X plants should be included in the total hip arthroplasty registry so that one can see what is causing the causing the loss of those implants or, or where etc so that they can be they can also be studied thank you very much thank you dr kushnud that was a very uh, interesting talk and i think you made a lot of uh, points clear to us um, from total hip replacement we are going to go for a now quite a basic lecture, but very important lecture, no doubt. Can you um, 
Yes, okay. So I'm going to be talking about uh, open. I, I, I am waiting your lecture, uh, Arindam. Okay. Right. <laughs> I'm sure it will be interested. Okay, let me just make sure that it's running properly. Thank you, can Dr. You, can, you see? can you see? Yes, yes, but please make it uh, full screen, please. Yeah, it is full screen in my talk here. Over here, is it full screen? And, and, and mine, it is not. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, but, okay. uh, but not full screen. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, let's see. Let's see what happens. Now? Not, not okay. yet. Okay, but can you see? Can you see what I've put up? Yes, but uh, but I I think it is very nice and. Uh... Arindam, can yeah. you open it on your full screen? I have put it is on full screen here. You put it on full screen. Yes. Okay. Uh, you you can go out and return by pushing the full screen, not the editing. Not sure. Anyway, let's see. I, I'm sure you will be able to see it because yesterday it went on full screen. Let's is this? Can you see it now? Yeah. 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 yeah excellent. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Good. Okay. So I'm going to talk about open fractures, and we need to understand why these fractures are important. What is the frequency of these fractures? Basically, epidemiology and classification and how these fractures are treated. But before that, we need to understand what are open fractures. Open fractures are when the fracture is in communication with the exterior. In other words, if you have a fracture in a limb and there is a soft tissue injury, if the two are not communicating, it is not an open fracture. Okay, only when the two are communicating will you be able to call it an open fracture. But the reason why open fractures are important is because basically of infection and because it is a war on two fronts. A, we have to do medical treatment against the infection and we have to do surgical treatment to try and promote fracture union and prevent a delayed union, which is very common in open fractures, a malunion, a non-union, and God forbid, I infected non-union. <clears throat> now, a lot of the papers which we are going to discuss in this talk are based on the uh, work, the uh, serial work of Cord Brown and his team. And they studied a lot of injuries in the Edinburgh Orthopedic Trauma Unit. And they found that 11.5 uh, out of one lakh cases, 11.5 are open fractures. Now I think in India, the rate would be much higher because we have a very high degree of scooter and motorcycle accidents. And that is why we see a lot more than perhaps what they saw in Edinburgh. These fractures are more common in males and have a bimodal age distribution. The 60% um, of the injuries are gustilo three types. So we need to discuss the gustilo classification, which we will do in a minute. And the factor, factors which influence treatment are the grade of the open fractures, the fracture geometry, the type of trauma, and want, what type of contamination we have of these fractures, and also the comorbidities. Now the gustilo classification, though not perfect, has stood the test of time because, and we, we'll discuss why this is important, but just to give an understanding, if you have a Gustilo one open fracture, basically it means that the uh, wound is, um, it's basically a, a puncture wound from inside out. If you have a grade two, what it means is basically you have a slightly larger wound uh, many people say one to 10 centimeters, but I wouldn't put figures on it. So what basically it means is, it, is that it's a, big, it's a bigger wound, but doesn't have a lot of soft tissue stripping. Everything above that is a grade three fracture, 
but grade three has three important uh, subclassifications. So 3A is when you are able to uh, cover the uh, bone after debridement. 3B is when it is not possible to achieve soft tissue coverage. And 3C is a serious arter arterial injury which requires repair. So 3C is a very serious injury and uh, grade one is perhaps not that serious an injury. And Gustav Anderson published this in 1976, which they later modified in 1984. But they found that the inter-observer agreement was only 60%. So this is a sort of a bird's eye view of all the different fractures you have, the type one, the type two, and then different types of type three. And then they're often associated with other kinds of injuries, you get severe blistering. And if you have a type three C, then you would, of course, you could have a cold and blue foot. But what is the importance of this classification? Why has it survived in spite of so many other classifications coming? The reason is that it correlates with the infection rate and fracture healing. So a grade one fracture would may have an infection rate less than 2% and the fracture healing is approximately within 28 weeks. And if this goes up uh, along the spectrum until you have uh, 3B where the infection rate can be as high as 50% and the fracture healing can be very long and occasionally you will have lots of problems such as non-union. Now 3C is a different kettle of fish altogether. The amputation rate there is an amputation rate, which is not common in the other kind of injuries, and it can be as high as 50%. Now, this is the basic algorithm of treatment of open fractures. When a patient comes with one, a trauma, they might have other injuries as well. So we need to look at the ABCs. We have to work on the ATLS. We have to do emergency room management. And then of course, if we have a wound, we should do a dressing and cover the fractures, splint the fractures. And then we proceed to primary operations. When we are looking at open fractures, we might have to do a debridement. We might have to repeat the debridement, do a stage debridement. And we might have to do some kind of a fracture stabilization. Sometimes we can proceed to direct stabilization or occasionally we might have to do it in several stages. So this stabilization is important, whether one stage, two stage or whatever. And then there are the secondary operations when we need skin and soft tissue uh, reconstruction, and then bone bony reconstruction in the cases where we have uh, gaps. And finally, as we know, physiotherapy and rehabilitation occupational therapy. So let's start with medical treatment. So the first thing I would tell you, tell the juniors, don't forget to start the antibiotics. And before you start the antibiotics, take a culture, from the open part of the wound because it has been found that the bacteria you isolate over there is often the bacteria which is found in the final infection. So don't forget your antibiotics. And nowadays, don't forget to take out your camera and take some photographs. This will allow you to discuss it with the patient, the patient party, and to have some kind of a medical legal proof should this, uh, because nowadays you have to be a little bit careful. Now, the bacteria which you encounter are very common in the types of, based on the type of injuries you have. So if you have a blunt trauma, low grade infection, ch ch chances of finding Staphylococcus, Streptococcus are high. In farm wounds, don't forget Clostridia because these are dangerous uh, uh, bacteria which can kill your patient from tetanus and other types of Clostridia infections. Fresh water, think of Pseudomonas, Aeromonas, seawater, there are more exotic bacteria. And if you have war wounds, high energy wounds, think of gram negative. But also remember gram negative is very common nowadays in other low grade um, uh, cases. So gram, gram negative also is very high, very important. Now, if you're giving, uh, you, you have to start a systemic antibiotic straight away and the, for grade one, I mean, you should always start a gram positive. If you're, if you're worried about the lesion, you should add a gram negative. And if it is a contaminated, if it's a far wound, if it's a war wound, then please do not forget to add an uh, anaerobic cover. Now, 
it's not just the injury. The host, the person who sustains the injury, the, the health status of that person is also very, very important. So um, in this work, uh, in 2005 by Bowen and Widmeyer, they identified 14 risk factors, but we won't name them all, just the basic ones, high age above 80, smoking, diabetes mellitus, malignancy, uh, chest problems, or systemic immunodeficiency. And if you have these problems, then the chances of having um, problems after an open fracture are higher. So if you look at this chart, if you have three out of these uh, features, then the chances of infection can go as high as 31%. But if you have none, then your infection rate is could be quite much lower. So it's not just the type of injury you have, but also the uh, medical status of the host. Now, there's also from India an excellent uh, score, which is the Ganga Hospital Open Fracture Score, which all of you should look up, and it's important from the exam and point of view as well. And here again, they have looked at divided into three groups, the covering tissues, the functional tissues, and the skeletal tissues. And it's, I think, important at least for all postgraduates to know about this. Now, let's come to surgical treatment. Surgical treatment, we can divide into two parts, the orthopedic surgery part and the plastic surgery part. And of course, after that, you have rehab, rehabilitation, which most of us surgeons also guide our patients through. So initially, their first aid is required. You need a good splint. Uh, you need to keep the wound clean, cover it. And then you have to decide on what kind of a inter stabilization you want to uh, put in. Now, normally, when we talk about stabilization in open fractures, we have historically always talked about uh, external fixation. But over here, I have turned it around a little bit. So what I have tried to emphasize here is what the situation is in 2022. Um, so external fixator, once you, and we'll discuss all this in subsequent uh, slides, but right now remember that the co most common operation which is done for open fractures is in fact ream nailing. The next perhaps would be external fixation. And the third would be external fixation with secondary nailing. Occasionally, you might use a ring fixator in a difficult case. Unream nailing is virtually not used nowadays, uh, very rarely. Conservative is hardly an option. And if you're dealing with a 3C fracture, then primary amputation might have to be considered. So this is an IM nail, which, is, which, has, been, which has proved its merit. It was first used, and I will show you the papers, in grade one fractures and gradually the um, extension of the principle came to all the way up to 3B. So you can see here that Code Brown has done a lot of work. This is the original paper was early on, but in these papers, they were able to take it all the way right up to 3B. Then the unream nail, which I mentioned, which is more of historical interest. I don't know if people are still using it. We have used it in early parts of our career and it did work. But nowadays, because the ream nail actually throws up a lot of bone graft, which is helpful for union, I think people have moved on. External fixation, again, very important because um, there are certain cases, which I will show you the pictures later, where you cannot do without an external fixation. You can use unilateral frames, which are rarely used now. We have used it historically, but they're not very stable. So it's usually you use either bilateral frames or delta frames, so you achieve some kind of a stability. Uh, external fixation is used in all kinds of fractures. If you have a fracture around a joint, you can use it. You can use it for the diaphysis, or you can use the Elizarov, which is also basically an extension of the external fixation principle. So these are the common treatments used. So for a grade two, we would use a, a nailing. You can see over here with excellent results. And sometimes you might have to use other additional techniques. And this is the patient for after a two month follow-up, 3A. Now the difference between a 3A and 3B, you can see here that the 3A basically you still have bony coverage, whereas in the 3B, you can see the bone is exposed. Now in 3A, again, nailing can be used. 
and you can get good results. Sometimes you might you might require additional skin coverage over here. These are the follow-ups. And in 3B, again, it is possible to do similar treatment. So you can have nailings and then you have plastic surgery coverage and you often usually get good results. Now, historically, this is one of our cases which we treated, I think, uh, around the millennium. And this is one where you used a unreamed nail. You can see the nail is slightly shorter than what we would put in today because those were the early days of nailing. And then we'd got a skin coverage. We had a very good result, but we don't use this procedure anymore. We do ream nailing whenever we can. Now, there are cases where you really cannot use uh, nails. This is perhaps one such case. You should not try to nail these fractures because there's so many injuries, so much contamination. So you might have to put an external fixation, but remember it's possible that you might end up with kind of some kind of a malunion, which I won't be surprised in this case. And then there is the VAC. VAC is very useful in a, in a case where you have a bad wound when the wound is not amenable to primary coverage or where you've done multiple debridement, but you're not really winning. So VAC is a way out. Now there are indications for VAC and there are cases where you should not use VAC, but it is a, a very useful tool in our kit today and we use it a lot. And this is a picture for instance, where VAC has been used. Now let's discuss some important papers. So I referred to Code Brown and his team. So the bigger names, Code Brown and uh, Margaret McQueen. This is a case where they started, if you see the year, it was 1990, where they found excellent results in type one open fractures. And then this further on, uh, you know, they developed the technique and they showed that it was even good in the treatment of three grade three tibial fractures. And then there, there were several comparisons. This is a Chinese paper and this showed a comparison with between the external fixator and the intramedullary nail. And they found in, in conclusion that the uh, nail is more effective than the external fixator and may be considered a first line approach for all open tibial fractures. Another case where Intramedullary nail was uh, looked at vis-a-vis -vis external fixation. And again, in these cases, it showed that the IM uh, intramedullary nail was superior to external fixation. Now, ream versus unream. So initially, as you know, as I explained earlier on, that we were using unream nail, nails because there was a concept that if you did a ream nail, you led to, it led to thermal injury and that could add to the infection. But in fact, when it was tested out in uh, actual clinical studies. It was found, this is a paper from Bhandari uh, from 2008, and it shows that the uh, ream nail was in fact uh, superior and at least equal to an unream nail. And that is why the unream nail, which is a much more unstable nail, which is a much more fragile nail, which can easily break inside, was gradually replaced. So further papers. Now, XFIX, there are situations where you absolutely have to exfix and it is absolutely dangerous to use intramedullary nailing. One, so that these are cases where you want to do an easy and quick operation. Maybe your patient has polytrauma and uh, you want to go in and out without spending too much time or maybe your resident is on call and an external fixator is technically much less demanding. <coughs> External fixators are cause less damage and in a simpler setup, the hardware is much less, but the disadvantages are there. The pin track infections are there, malalignment, delayed union. Patients are often not happy with external fixators. So historically, it was the more important treatment, the definite treatment. And I'm, I'm coming to this point again and again that, you know, this is a message which I'm trying to give to the um, postgraduates, I'm sure that it is very important that external fixators have their role, but uh, the nailing cases are more important. And then if you have done an external fixator as an emergency, then you should um, at a later stage, try and convert that external fixator to an IM nail. There have been cases where an external fixation can lead to definitive treatment, but nowadays 
It is usual to convert it after a few weeks, but remember there is a infection rate and the union, union rate is only about 90%. This is from another pay, uh, paper from Dr. Bhandari. So here are some pictures over here. You can see external fixator use, graphs done over here. And this is a nailing case. You can see over here that perhaps there is a bone gap here. So this will perhaps need a secondary operation where you would have to do a, a bone grafting. Complications. Complications of these, these cases are non-union, malunion, can have infection, which could be deep or it could be a superficial infection. Earlier on, you might miss a uh, compartment syndrome. You might have a fatigue fracture or a hardware failure. Hardware failure is very common if you're using unreamed nails. And of course, osteomyelitis. So you can get cases of infection over here or like this. This is a full-blown osteomyelitis, something you don't want, want to see. But again, this could be a possible case for proper debridement, trying to do a VAC procedure, trying to get rid of the infection. And then this is where you want to end up with a nice coverage like this. So plastic surgery. So we've discussed orthopedics. Now let's talk a few things about plastic surgery. Now, <clears throat> when should we do the initial debridement? But this is a point I would like to again make to the residents. We have been taught historically that we should do the debridement within six hours. And that is something we should really try to achieve if we have the setup. But I mean, let's, we all belong to the real world and you might have another list, you might have uh, other cases lined up, or you might be in private practice, you might not be available. So it's not po always possible that you can do every debridement within six hours. So it has been shown that this six hour rule is actually has not been borne out by clinical studies. This is a study from the published in the in Indian Journal of Orthopedics by uh, Drs. Cross and Swankowski. And they show that the six hour rule may not be, it's not made in, you know, it's not in gold. So you can, you have to debride urgently. You, you don't have to debride urgently, but you have to debride quickly. In other words, six hours is not sacrosanct. See if a patient who's come in eight o'clock at night, leave it for the next day, next thing in the morning when you're fresh. You, if you have, if if you are on call, you have the facilities. Go ahead and do it at night. But if it is not possible, do it next morning with proper tools. So within six hours, uh, very good. But if you do it within twenty four hours, the the infection rates, the morbidity rates do not go up significantly. That's important. So remember this. And skin cover again, you should do early, but. It doesn't have to be the next day or the very next day. So it's more important to get your debridements done properly. Um, get your Try to get your coverage quickly. If you can do it uh, within a few days, it's wonderful. And because the infection rate does go up if it go, go, goes beyond seven days, but sometimes it doesn't always work out. You might have to do two or three debridements. Occasionally a back has to be used. So try to do your coverage within seven days if you can. In, when we were sort of junior consultants and we spent a lot of the time in the hospital, we used to try and do the coverage within the week. So I would ad advise you, especially students and um, sort of uh, surgeons in the earlier or middle part of the career that try to get coverage with your plastic surgical colleague. And here is the sort of list of things you have to do. I've just made a note here. So you have to do a proper scrub, wash it with six liters of saline and then take out all the dirty bits of the wound, all the contaminated tissue, and you know, just remove everything which you think is suspect, keep washing it and washing it. And use, uh, you know, if you, and you might have to extend the uh, margins and take out the unviable tissue, resect the muscle, which you don't think is very healthy. Then make sure your bone ends, if they're exposed, are bleeding, they're debrided, irritate them. And if you're not happy, do a relook after uh, 48 hours, do it again. And before you actually proceed to doing um, any kind of nailing, I'm sure you must make sure that your wound is clean. Otherwise, if you nail a contaminated wound, you will end with a disaster because you know that is really, you are in deep trouble and uh, you will find a lot of problems. Now, should you close the wound or shouldn't you close the wound? Well, there are lots of papers on this. Remember the higher, the lower the grade of wound, 
the higher the chance of primary closure. So if you have a, these are some papers that they show you that if you have a grade one uh, open wound, the chances of a pri achieving a primary closure is nearly 90%. Whereas if you have a 3B, only one third of those wounds can be closed. But if you have a 3C arterial injury, then of course you should not close it in that respect. So you have to be very careful. Um, contraindications to primary closure, remember, in inadequate debridement, cross contamination, farm injuries. Be very, very careful of farm injuries. When the roads in India were being built, built, you know, I mean, the national highways, then we had a lot of roads running right beside our hospital. And a lot of people who were working on those roads fell into ponds when they were repairing the roads of bridges, you know, they were being built and people fell from the bridges into the ponds and we face a lot of these contaminated wounds. So be very careful of those wounds because those are the wounds where the, your patient could die from contamination, from infections which you can't control. You have to you know, be very careful about gas gangrene and uh, anaerobic infections, et cetera, et cetera. And 3C, remember it's a very bad injury. And I would caution you in India, again, or countries like India, it's not a bad idea perhaps to do a primary amputation because you know if your patients are paying for the surgery sometimes or they don't have the resources they will lose their you know working days so you might end up i have seen situations where people have had 15 operations you know were been out of work for 18 months lost their jobs sold their houses so it's it's often not worth it for one limb so Think about a primary amputation because it will, it will save your patient and yourself a lot of trouble. So if you have a wound like this, um, you know, the contamination, really don't, don't, I mean, don't think about trying to keep this, these limbs, you know, just take them off if you have to. So if, but if you wanted to decide how, whether to salvage your amputee, then you have to go by the classical technique, the five Ps and, you know, the, the general condition of the patient, whether he or she is in shock, whether the foot is hot or cold, what is the age of the patient, what is the cut to crush ratio, et cetera. Now, a lot of people are using the newer techniques in open fractures, like BMP, antibiotic, laden bone graft, et cetera, for secondary operations. These, of course, do have a role and we have used them in one or two cases, but they're not used in every case. So the surgical option that you choose will depend on your surgical setup. It will depend on your own skills, on the skills of people available to you, the technicians, the middle grade, what is the level of your OT, the CR, what, how is your fracture table, whether you have a theater time slot, that has become a problem nowadays, getting a slot, empty slot, what are, who are the surgeons who are available to you, do you have an implant of your choice, is your patient medically stable, do you have blood available, and then you have to make a decision to nail primarily and get it over with, or do an X fix and then go for a secondary nailing. And you know, if you have a fresh fracture without contamination, just if the patient is fit and well, go ahead, nail it next day, nail it. If you have a 3A, again, debridement's done, happy, nail it. 3B, careful, think about it, look at it properly, and you know, then take a decision. But there are situations, as I said, where you should not nail the agricultural wounds and other such neglected injuries, often you might get a case which has come after two or three days of lying open uh, or your patient might be very sick, multiple comorbidities, be very careful. Timing of the surgery, there's, if you have a possibility, immediate nailing within 12 hours or early nailing, 48 hours, or multiple nailings, and then proceed to nailing five, five to seven days. Um, delayed nailing, first X fix, or only X fix, we have done that in a couple of cases also where we did not have to because it was cancellous bone, the fracture was in a part of the body, you know, the upper, uh, I think it was the proximal tibia, we were where we were able to just get away with an X fix. Again, plastic surgery, you have several options. If you can do an immediate closure, delayed closure, sometimes a split skin grafting is all you require, or sometimes a full thickness grafting. Local flaps are often useful and of course, there are the free flaps which are done in very severe cases where you have the latissimus dorsi or the rectus abdominis is used. And in this situation, we have a terminology which is called fix and flap. 
Uh, we used to have wonderful plastic surgeons and we used to fix it, they used to flap it. And the, the term which is regularly used is fix and flap. So when you are doing surgery, especially nailing few things to remember, I would suggest just try to remember these things. One is to minimize the surgical trauma. The second thing is when you're passing the uh, rima through, be very careful because there might be a region where there's no bone. So there might be a neurovascular structure there. So if you just, you know, ream through that area, you'll pick up an artery or you'll pick up a nerve and it'll go, you'll be in a very bad situation. So just come to the end of the fracture and then gently try to slide your rima through. Okay. And, but be, be, again, be careful. Don't let your rima jam. So if such a situation happens, I suggest take out the reamer, maybe just use some kind of a hand reamer to negotiate that area. Just be very safe. Check under your C-arm and, you know, don't ream through blindly through an open area where the soft tissue uh, may be exposed. Don't hammer your nail if you can avoid it. Don't over ream because, you know, you'll be causing thermal injuries. So whatever the narrowest acceptable size nail is, which which gives stability, go ahead and do it. And try to, if, if the marrow is clean, try to save some of the ream marrow and put it near the fracture site, but make sure it's clean. If it's dirty, of course, you should wash it out and clean it out and not use it. So these are my recommendations that, again, I'm saying the same issue I'm trying to hammer again and again. Um, I know juniors attempted to put in a lot of ex fixators, but if you can nail it, safely please go ahead nail it and up to 3a you should be able to do it 3b you have to be careful 3c consider amputation and re remember all fractures should be you know they should be um, sterilized against clostridium titani you need to give antibiotics you need to uh, think about gas gangrene if it's possible go for early closer but if you're not sure then go for skin coverage and to summarize, so the open fractures depend upon the degree of openness, the fracture geometry, nailing is superior to external fixation and should be done whenever possible, whenever it is safe. External fixator, however, is still an important uh, thing which we have to use, especially if you have contamination. Don't forget wound management. And nowadays you should always make sure that your plastic surgical colleague is involved because there are a lot of medical legal issues. And for those who are interested, here are some landmark papers which you can look up. And also I would suggest that you go through the work of Court Brown and his team who have done a lot of good work. Thank you very much. Very nice. I think uh, Dr. Anil Patel already have two questions. One of the panel and one of the panel. I have a very nice comment. I think your sound is not clear again, I think. Yes. Clear now. Yeah. No, uh, no, no, no. But anyway, we will take questions. So uh, we have another uh, 20 minutes, 22 minutes available yeah. to us. So uh, please ask your questions to all the speakers. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Fadel, he's discussed um, Ilizarov, then Dr. Shantanam Shetty has talked about uh, osteoporosis and avian of the femoral head. I've talked about open fractures. And uh, Dr. Kushnud has spoken about bearing surfaces in THR. So postgraduate students, you can send your questions, um, I think through the screen, or you can just uh, unmute yourself. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. Okay, Arindam sir, uh, here's a question uh, for you. Uh, what is the role of tranexamic acid and the dosage recommended nowadays in RTA patients? Um, you're saying that as a, to stop bleeding? Yeah, this was the question actually asked in last session in the NBA. Okay, what is the role and uh, dosage recommended for the RTA patients or uh, tranexamic acid? So this was the only question actually. Okay, well, we don't. I don't think uh, RTA. Uh, I have never used it to be very honest. Uh, 
mm-hmm. I I don't know if there is a theoretical advantage uh, using it. Uh, John, you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. So there was this crash trials, the crash one and crash two trials, where they showed that you could significantly reduce the bleeding in polytrauma patients. This was the crash two was a multicentric trial. Uh, based in the UK, but had various countries, including some centers in India, in India involved in it. So, uh, so trinexamic acid has a role. You have to be careful in which patients you use it, but certainly in the polytrauma patient who has risk of massive bleeding, so the patients who have massive bleeding, it's not purely for open fractures of tibia, etc. Okay, so, so do you use it? So, for, I mean, for your case. Yeah, so we do use it uh, for in our polytrauma patients. We use it in our some of our routine surgery, like uh, knee replacements, I think there's enough uh, literature for that, for the use of trinexamic acid to reduce bleeding and knee replacement and hip replacements, and also uh, massive big surgery where you expect a lot of bleeding. We have, we and have be careful in elderly patients where you yeah. uh, think there may be a risk of DVT, but the literature hasn't shown an increased risk of DVT with the use of trinexamic acid. We have used it in uh, TKR once. We used to use it once upon a time, and but we don't use it anymore. But uh, uh, polytrauma, like you know, the, the, the cases which we get, because we are actually next to all these roads where the bikers are hit by trucks all the time, and when they come in, of course, they have their uh, you know they have their bleeders, etc. But what if you have a bleeder? I think you need to really find the most in most of the cases find the source and stop it with pressure bandages and occasionally you need artery clips, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure if there's an internal bleeding or something like that, I think Tranex, if, it, if it has been shown, I'm sure they will work. But you should also think at the mechanical aspect of the bleeding. I mean, where is the bleeding come from, coming from and try to, you know, catch hold of that bleeder and do something. Yeah, else. so I mean, so yeah, you're right that any... Uh definite uh, large vessel that is bleeding is not going to help. This is for yeah. like you have multiple fractures. Okay, you're not going to catch a bleeder in them. So it reduces the overall amount of bleeding from them. That's it. Okay. So I, dose, uh, dosage are the same as THR or TKR we give uh, or is it different in uh, RT patients as I mentioned? So Dr. Shetty, you were going to say something? No, the, the, in joint replacement it is yes, we do use it. But in polytrauma, usually the patients are such the BP is low. The bleeding is bleeding is not much. What is important is the is the debridement and bring up the BP. And usually the larger larger vessels, unless you catch the vessel, whatever tenemic acid, nothing nothing will help. So it is only the debridement and uh, proper treatment. No, but I think so. Uh, this is now actually used in a lot of places. Uh, it's not uh, uh, something that is uh, not used uh, even in trauma patients. So uh, where so because you you if you have multiple fractures you're not going to catch a bleeder there. I mean if you have a pelvic vessel that's bleeding that's yeah different. that's impossible. Multiple fractures with multiple bones involved and and the yeah. dosage is I think if you give one valve while stat and then every I think you can repeat it every two hours or three hours I'm not sure exactly the dose to be honest. Yes, sir, Doctor Fadel. Yes, uh, I I uh, I uh, hear and read m- many about uh, transexamic as in polytrauma patient. Yes, actually, uh, yeah. but uh, uh, really we relied upon what had been mentioned by the Professor Shiti and the uh, uh, friend Arendam, and you also. Uh, so we relied upon the clinical and uh, 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 laboratory assessment of the patient more than uh, going for the uh, transexamic acid. Though it is uh, well uh, published uh, a series about uh, polytrauma patient and uh, use of uh, transexamic acid. Yeah, and that part of the management is usually yes. done by the critical care team rather yes. than... Yes, yeah, yeah. you are right. They do yeah. use it. Yeah. And the uh, other issue, of course, uh, is that with polytrauma, I mean, this is all good and this is all, I mean, as you said, critical care. But from our point of view, surgical point of view, we must remember the, you know, treating shock and giving the fluids and getting the blood in very quickly in, in our scenario, because, you know, you won't have blood in your hand. You'll take a lot of time. So yes. you need to do the ATLS protocol immediately yes. and while your mm-hmm. other, other things take over. That's right. So, so I think it's different when you're talking about isolated open fractures and a polytrauma patient, because 
in in these patients with massive bleeding you have different protocols so you yes. have massive yeah. transfusion protocols where you use blood along with uh, blood products in uh, in a particular sort of uh, uh, ratio that you have to use when you're doing massive transfusion ah, internal uh, internal away the from regimen. open fractures per se internal uh, damage and internal hemorrhage and uh, yeah. all over uh, the it is a polytrauma not musculoskeletal only yes you are yeah. Uh, may I have a, 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 a just a comment for our postgraduate uh, uh, may be mentioned in the uh, open fracture, uh, dear Arena. Pardon me, sorry. I would like to mention a note, maybe. Yes, please uh, go ahead. Please go ahead, yes. sir. Uh, 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 an open fracture uh, uh, for our postgraduate, uh, we should rely upon what is had been not mentioned uh, because it is uh, uh, well known uh, by uh, the by common sense for ourselves as an orthopedic surgeon. Is the polytrauma patient, open fracture is a polytrauma patient. Open fracture is considered to be one of the most important thing to deal with as orthopedic uh, 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 decision making and not an urgent only, but uh, uh, an orthopedic, uh, we can say, uh, 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 orthopedic- Damage control. Yes, yes, not a surgery uh, as mentioned. Usually they cause it, uh, damage control surgery, yeah. but for ourselves, we should consider it damage control orthopedic surgery. We should add this for ourselves because as we uh, were junior, we are timidly and uh, searching for those patients to do in a hurry multiple surgery at the same time. We used to do to work the uh, general surgery with the maybe the gynecology and the orthopedic in the same time looking for this as it is safe uh, for uh, saving life for the patient. This is, has been changing. This is for our postgraduate. This is changed a lot nowadays. It is not uh, uh, permitted uh, to injure and insult the patient for many uh, systems in the same uh, time. This is, I would like to uh, put it a note for our... Uh, sure. Yes. That's why the early appropriate care uh, term has crept in. So it hasn't caught up, but early appropriate care is the correct term to be used. So what is appropriate? Neither the damage control nor the early total care. So the, the early appropriate care is ideal. Yes. Uh, early? You're right. Professor Shakti, I have a question uh, for you. A uh, very practical question. I mean, we have, if you have, because a lot of patients ask us when they have a fracture, any fracture, neck femur fracture or uh, whatever, and they ask us, should they be, after the fixation, after the prosthesis, should they be going on osteoporotic treatment? So, I mean, actual, what is, what is your actual view? I mean, there are a lot of papers, a lot of theoretical discussions. Yes, it should be done. Do you put your patients on treatment for osteoporosis if you have done a PFN or something like that routinely? Yes, uh, we, we have started uh, fractures, yeah. We have started uh, putting all the patients on, uh, if it is proved osteoporosis, either with DEXA or any other method, uh, that uh, we all put them on either antiresorptives or even teripartite. Teripartite is much better because the denosumab and ramisumab is, uh, is much more costlier, though it is much more safer. So any hip but fracture, routine, routinely we have we put them on an elderly patient. On I think on this. any elderly, sorry, sorry, sir. Elder, elderly, elderly, but it needs to be proved. The preferably with the DEXA, as to be scientific, you will have to prove it with the DEXA scan, whether it is uh, minus two point five. But majority of the X-rays will itself will show you whether whether they are osteoporotic or not. And if they are osteoporotic, and it, it is always better to and if it is a badly un if it is a shattered fracture, if it is an unstable fracture, trochantic fracture, it is better to perhaps put them on, on either teripartite or, or on anti -resorptives. Though the anti -resorptives, the problems of complications are much more compared to teripartite. And again, it depends on whether it is, uh, whether it is osteoclastic resorption or osteoblastic formation, which has to be taken into consideration, whether it is primary, whether it is senile, senile, whether it is type 1 or type 2, also has to be taken into consideration. Yes, I think I think basically any elderly hip fracture 
which happens with trivial trauma, the patient should be considered osteoporosis. So it, it's, you don't need to wait for a DEXA scan to put them that's, on osteoporotic. That's patient. true. That's true. So that's you start them on, uh, and uh, if you're using bisphosphonates, it doesn't delay healing because the bisphosphonates, if you're giving oral bisphosphonates, it takes more than three or four months before it actually gets concentrated in the bone. There's only a problem with uh, uh, sort of the zolindronate, okay? So zolindronate has a slightly different me mechanism of action. And if you're giving intravenous zolindronate, it's recommended that you wait six weeks after a fracture, if you're expecting fracture healing. In a hip fracture where you're replacing it, it doesn't matter, you can start it straight away. Yeah. Okay, just a practical question, John, on this note. Suppose, let's mm -hmm. have a scenario, 65 year old lady fell down in her bathroom um, sustained uh, extra capsular fracture. You did a PFN, okay. And the lady has comorbidities like diabetes, blood pressure, you know, the usual. Uh, so this lady, what would you, I mean, how would you approach the osteoporotic part of the treatment? You've done your fixation. First of all, 55 is a very- 65. So she 65. said 65. 65. We have, we, have, we have done our study that it is proved in India that uh, the age onset is ten years less than the and then the uh, than the Western world. If it is yeah, so there, it is 70, it is 60, 60 years of age. Number one. Number two, if it is a comorbid condi comorbid condition and she was she was not very mobile and very very active lady, perhaps in in her also it is worthwhile putting putting them on either antidesorbent or teripartite depending on the situation. Yeah, so Adam, to answer your question, basically, uh, if there are multiple comorbidities, we would check with the physicians as to whether they are okay to have. So sometimes with renal problems, you don't want to give them teriparatide or even bisphosphonate. So you need to check with your physicians if it's safe to give it. If they are not mobile, then I would put them on teriparatide rather, rather than an oral bisphosphonate. Okay, because in, in bisphosphonates, you need to be able to be mobile because you, you don't want them to lie down for at least half an hour to 45 minutes after you give the dose. Okay, so those are the things you need to look at. I love that uh, I like to make it You talked about the uh, So your sound is very- Something wrong sound, with the sound. Sound is, sound is not very audible. I think it's breaking. Uh, sound, sound is breaking. I audible now. It's audible, yeah, but it's not clear. Better. Not clear. Am I audible? Yes. yes. Much better. Much yeah. better now. Now we can't hear. No. Now it is You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. You're You're muted. muted. You're muted. You're muted. Muted. Remove the yeah. I, yeah. Is that yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to remind you, Arinda, one thing which you may not be knowing, all the young orthopedic surgeons, they for the first time in the country, the intramedullary nailing in compound factor was tried by Dr. B. Bukopate. Now that was the time that to talk of putting a metal in a compound fracture was a very serious offense. And Professor B. Mukhopadhyaya read his paper in British Orthopedic Association. And when he read his paper in British Orthopedic Association, he was badly criticized by the, all the stalwarts sitting in that time. In that very meeting, Dr. P.K. Sethi was also sitting there. And this is what I heard from the mouth of Dr. P.K. Sethi. Then one or two, when there a lot of commotion went on in the British Orthopedic Association, then one or two very senior orthopedic surgeons of British they stood up and they said, there is a point what Dr. Mukhopadhyay is saying, that by stabilizing the bone, you're stabilizing the soft tissue also, and the healing is enhanced. And today, it is accepted top. These were the level of the orthopedic surgeon our country had it. So which and, year? Uh, which year? Uh, which year? Which year? I think it was uh, late 1950s or early 1960s. Really? Yeah, so even yeah. before the British... Yeah. Yeah. The British Orthopedic Association meeting. Yeah. Way this before. Is, I think this was in uh, probably late 60s, uh, maybe. Nah, I think so. It was something weird. Uh, so we end this uh, session and uh, because the time is up now, 
and uh, we are going to start now the our next session and i think we have a uh, our uh, chairperson dr jerry sharma had his part of the phone yesterday so he's on his way back home he'll be coming very soon dr shabir khan is also traveling somewhere in peshawar and uh, i will request dr bangani to kindly Share this session and start the session. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny Johnson. Thank you, Federal. Thank you, Ali. Thank, 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 Thank you. I'll I'll try to join the next session. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. We go to the next session. Uh, the next session is neglected fracture neck femur by Dr. John Mukhopadhyay. Sir, are you ready? Yes, sir. I'll just turn on the thing. Is that uh, visible and am I audible? Okay. Is that uh, the presentation there? Exactly. Yes. Okay. So I'll get started. So I think uh, this talk is on neglected femoral neck fractures in young adults. And this, uh, the fracture neck femur in itself continues to be a challenging problem. Uh, the incidence, uh, if you look at the literature in people under 50 years, is uh, just 3%. But this is much more common in India, as was reported by Sandhu et al. And we actually looked at our own series, and nearly 30% of our patients are less than 50 years. And this is in a large number of patients, close to 1,000 patients. Uh, unfortunately, late presentations are still a reality. And when they present late, they are even more challenging. Uh, the literature is still sparse on it, and they're really very uh, uh, little in the way of controlled trials of different methods of treatment. So each person talks about his method of treatment, but very little in the way of controlled trials, and that is understandable. Now, uh, the one uh, sort of good classification for these uh, uh, neglected femoral neck fractures is that by Professor Sandhu from Amritsar, who... Uh, based his classification on the size of the head fragment, the gap uh, between the head and the residual portion of the neck, and if there were any signs of AVN. And he classified them into stage A, stage B, stage C, and stage D, uh, types A, B, C, D, but basically into three stages. So the third stage, if there were signs of AVN, became group D. Okay, so now what do you do for treating them? Okay, so I think your uh, methods would uh, try the most important and probably the more difficult method is to try and preserve the head and various methods uh, have been used for it including just internal fixation I think valgus osteotomy with internal fixation has become the uh, mainstay of managing uh, these uh, non-unions in young patients uh, free fibular graft with or without internal fixation again this is uh, a method that has been used uh, uh, by uh, uh, various authors. Uh, most would use it with internal fixation, but people have even used double fibular grafts without internal fixation. Vascularized fibular graft has again been reported to show slightly better results, but still there, this is a difficult method and uh, has not become very popular. Uh, the muscle pedicle bone graft again has been popularized by Professor Bakshi, first written up by Myers, but again, uh, is still used in some centers, but not widely used all over the country or the world. Um, McMurray's osteotomy used to be the mainstay of treatment many, many years ago, but now rarely used. And you could use McMurray's osteotomy along with internal fixation. So uh, I think the valgus osteotomy or Powell's osteotomy uh, was uh, really uh, uh, based on Powell's concept, which was... Uh, that the steeper the angle of the fracture, the more the shear uh, sort of stresses on the fracture line. So the idea was to try and convert these shear stresses into compression stresses. Uh, the resultant angle, if you look at the uh, forces uh, applied to the head uh, is uh, at about 16 degrees to the vertical. And then if you add the uh, neck shaft or the angle between the sort of uh, mechanical axis and the uh, anatomical axis, you add another nine degrees for that. So 25 degrees is what you aim for. 
because at that angle, most of the shear stresses get converted to uh, compression forces at the neck of femur. So uh, basically, when you plan your osteotomy, you plan to put your chisel blade, if you're using a, a, a sort of a plate or, or angled blade plate for this, you would choose to put your chisel blade at an angle which would be uh, in such a way that your wedge angle would be in, uh, would uh, be equal to the angle between the oh, with the uh, lateral aspect of the femur. So ideally, you would first uh, create your uh, path for your chisel, uh, do your osteotomy, uh, but don't complete it. Then put in your uh, angle blade plate because this takes a reasonable amount of force to put in and is a very stable fixation and then complete your osteotomy uh, after you've put in your plate by just uh, cutting the last bit of bone at that stage. The other important thing is when you're doing your fixation of the plate is to start with your distal screw, very often a monocortical screw, and then you put your more proximal screw. And as you pull this shaft uh, towards the plate, you're also getting what is known as offset compression. So as you're pulling this, it's going to get compressed against the proximal fragment and give you a very good stable fixation. Okay, so this is the basic concept of how you do your uh, sort of uh, valgus osteotomy using an angled blade plate bar. However, you can use other uh, devices for it. Now, uh, basically, again, this is work of Powell, which shows that pure compression encourages callus, while tensile stresses retard the processes, and the shearing stresses are harmful, and uh, they cause uh, the uh, scaffolding, which is forming in the fracture to be stretched and therefore delayed healing and uh, non-unions. Uh, non so this method with the valgus osteotomy has been reported to get good results by Marty et al. way back in 1989, and again from India by Magu et al. in 2009. So just go through some examples using both uh, blade plates as well as you can use the DHS. He has a 44-year-old, the six-month-old fracture neck femur treated with three cancellous screws, and you can see the screws are not in the right direction. So here we use the DHS with an osteotomy. Uh, again, that was the fixation. You can see how we've converted the vertical line into a horizontal line, and that has gone on to heal. This is a follow-up after 10 months. Here's another patient. This is done with a DHS earlier, failed, uh, gone into virus and an onion. This is more like a trochanteric fracture actually, but again, here's a valgus osteotomy using uh, the angle blade plate. Again, you can see how you can lateralize this fragment by keeping the blade out a little bit, which then makes sure your mechanical axis is correct. And this goes uh, on to heal, as you can see here, uh, with a good result. And this is a nine month follow up. Again, you can see how nicely this has healed up. Uh, another patient who had a neck femur fracture and then had a McMurray's osteotomy done. Uh, and uh, this uh, also failed to heal. And here again, you can use this method to do your osteotomy through the previous McMurray osteotomy level. Make sure you get your planning right in terms of the angle. You put your chisel blade in and then do your osteotomy. Uh, you can see how now the uh, sort of uh, vertical shear uh, is converted. Like you can see, it's a very vertical angle here. And once you've done your osteotomy, it's converted to a horizontal angle. And now you can see how the fractures healed nicely. And this is a five-year follow-up after this osteotomy. Uh, there's another patient. This is a young patient who presented to us eight months. Uh, this was uh, managed conservatively for some reason. And he came with this uh, position. You can see the clear non-union there with sclerotic edges. And again, you don't need to freshen the bone ends, et cetera, with this osteotomy because it works basically on purely biomechanical principles. You're converting the shear stresses into uh, uh, compression stresses. And again, you can see how nicely this has gone on to heal. And this patient uh, came for the six month follow-up and then disappeared until he came recently. Uh, this is now a 13 year follow-up. You can see how well he can function. He's able to squat sit cross-legged and now he's come for 
the removal of the implant, which at this stage I'm trying to discourage him from getting done. Uh, you can combine the valgus osteotomy with bone graft where you think there's a lot, lot of uh, sort of bone loss in between. So here's a patient who had a, a sort of this kind of fixation for a neck femur fracture and came to us four months late. And here what we did was we did the sort of uh, fixation and osteotomy, but through the track of the DHS, uh, we pushed in a lot of cancellous bone graft. And again, you can see how nicely this has gone on to heal uh, with time. Another patient, this patient came to us more than a year after the injury. He was a 37-year-old gentleman. And here again, because there was a large gap, we kind of filled in bone graft into that uh, it, the sort of uh, area where we had dreamed for the DHS into that. Uh, and then put in the DHS, did our osteotomy to convert the fracture line into a more horizontal fracture line. And this then went on to heal. And again, I... This is a one-year follow-up. You can see how this has gone on to heal. And he came back again recently. Luckily, this is now, uh, this is at 10 years. You can see he's still functioning quite well. There are some changes of AVN, but he's still quite functional and doesn't have much pain. He came recently. This is a 13-year follow-up. You can see that there is some uh, sort of progress in the AVN, but he's still quite functional and doesn't have significant pain. He's beginning to have some pain in his hip, but this has now lasted him 13 or 14 years. He's now 50, 51. So if his problem gets worse, we can then convert it into an arthroplasty. There's some complications of this osteotomy. So there's one thing that you have to be uh, sort of, you need to check for sure is that uh, there is no fixed abduction deformity in that hip. And this is a patient who came to us five months after a neck femur fracture. We did this valgus osteotomy, probably did too much valgus, but this patient also was unable to adduct his hip and he ended up with this troublesome lengthening. Uh, so this is something that you need to be careful of. Of course, AVN is something which you cannot always predict or prevent, but if you can get the fracture to heal, they will have at least some years of uh, functional, uh, satisfactory functional activity. Uh, interestingly, if you go into Paul's work, he also described another type of osteotomy, which was the reorienting why osteotomy? So if you have a patient where you have a decent bone and you do an, uh, the standard wedge osteotomy, you'll get this compression and you'll get support. But if there is absolutely no bone and then you do an osteotomy, you will not get any support for your head. So here what he suggested is to do a Y osteotomy, medialize this fragment so that it supports the head and then fix it. So we have tried this at the time this was a patient who came to us late after a year. Uh, so you can see the neck is completely resolved. So we use this method by doing this osteotomy and medializing this part, doing a Y osteotomy and medializing this fragment. He did quite well for almost two years, but then the AVN progressed and then he had uh, uh, trouble and we ended up having to uh, suggest a replacement. I don't think he's had it yet, but. Uh, this was this was him at about one and a half years. He was functioning quite well at this stage. And at this stage, it looked like things were going well. But later on, he started having problems. Uh, there are some modifications of this osteotomy where you try to do the osteotomy at a more uh, proximal level, almost at the base of the neck. And this has been reported by Sen et al. in IGO. Uh, the other common method which is used in India is the fibular graft. This is a non-vascularized fibular graft. As I mentioned, you can use a single or a double fibula uh, with or without fixation. So uh, this has been reported by Nagi et al. in 52 cases where he had uh, 40 available for follow-up and 38 of which united. Uh, only five had severe collapse, although 14 cases had avian and they had reasonable function. So here's a patient who presented 10 months after a neck femur fracture. So you can see how we have uh, used a fibular graft as well as two cancellous screws to fix it. This is him at two years, eight months post-op. It's gone on to heal well, and he's got a good function. This is about three and a half years after removal of the implant. Now, this case is one of our most challenging cases. I'm not going to go through all the previous uh, x-rays because it's a long, long story. Uh, he came to us. 
uh, uh, six months after a neck shaft fracture, which the neck had been fixed with two screws and the shaft had been fixed with a plate and that had got infected very badly. So we first needed to take out all the implants, uh, uh, debride thoroughly, used antibiotic beads. Uh, then once the infection had settled, we went back in and plated the femur and we did a valgus osteotomy and DHS fixation of the neck femur fracture. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the femur healed, but uh, the neck, uh, the, the implant wore through and he got a uh, re late recurrence of the infection and then we had it to take out everything again. So now the femur had healed reasonably well and that was clean. So we had to ended up taking out all the implants, debriding, and then waiting till all the infection had healed. And then this was the situation he was in. So now you can see the head is pretty much uh, scalloped out and but it was a young patient, so we thought we should try to save it. So what we did was a combination of a fibula graft with a DHS and then did an osteotomy. So this was the immediate post-op X-ray. Uh, you can see how we've been able to lateralize the shaft to try and maintain the uh, anatomic, uh, the mechanical axis. And this is his uh, seven and a half month follow-up. You can see how nicely he's gone on to heal and he's got a good function. He's not able to squat at this stage, because his knee is also quite was stiff from the previous infection of the femoral shaft fracture, but he's made good recovery and he's gone on to heal his neck femur fracture. Uh, so I think uh, you must also be aware of some of the complications of the fibula. Uh, here you can get AVN, you can get a stress fracture, and this is something you need to be careful of. And uh, this is one case where the uh, fibula, uh, fibula shaft fractured. And this is where I think you probably need to do an osteotomy as well, because this fracture line is still very vertical. And therefore, the stresses in spite of the two screws and the fibula graft were too much for the fibula to hold and it went on to fracture. Uh, just a few words about the uh, muscle pedicle bone graft. Again, you can use various either the quadratus femoris or the gluteus medius bone graft. Uh, personal, very limited in, uh, experience. I have used it in pure avian, but not for non-unions. And uh, there's this paper on the vascularized fibular graft, as I mentioned, shows you a good healing, but a very complicated procedure. And in spite of this, 13 showed radiological signs of avian, but only two had severe symptomatic collapse. So it doesn't totally uh, obviate the risk of AVN. Uh, McMurray's osteotomy, again, as I mentioned, something that is not used very commonly uh, today. We, I don't think we've used one for the last 10 years. This was a patient way back, uh, well, one of the latest patients we did it in about 2000, it's about 22 years ago. This was a young girl and that was the fracture which had not healed. And you can see the osteoporotic nature of the head. So what we did here, was uh, we pulled it out to length on the fracture table. We put one screw to kind of just hold the neck and uh, shaft in that position. And then we did a McMurray's osteotomy. And interestingly, this actually went on to heal quite well. I mean, it is not a method which I'm uh, promoting by any chance because keeping elder, older patients in a spica is not something which is very uh, easy to do. Uh, but it in effect functioned just like the Y osteotomy, which was suggested by Powell's, where you got a valgus sization as well as support for the head with the shaft uh, of the femur. So this went on to heal well. Uh, now, if you go on to different methods, uh, we'll see that all of them may work in certain situations, but all have a reasonably significant failure rate. So that is the uh, issue that you have to deal with. And uh, you then end up with salvage situations where you cannot save the head. And there you have uh, one side where you can do excision arthroplasty, maybe combined with a pelvic support osteotomy. Uh, if you have infection like this patient presented to us with frank infection where we just removed it, converted it to a girdle stone. And uh, at a one year follow-up, he was quite happy. He did not want any further surgery. So, but this is unusual. Most of them have a very uh, difficult uh, problem walking with the lurch and cannot walk, walk without support. This was 
one of the exceptional cases where he was able to walk quite comfortably using a stick and he was happy with that. <coughs> Another method is to use, uh, this is a patient who had a McMurray's um, osteotomy before that got infected, was removed and she came to us with this severe instability and here we did a pelvic support osteotomy and having done this, it was it actually more or less uh, uh, helped her with uh, uh, it being able to walk reasonably comfortably and uh, she was able to cycle and things like that. I was quite happy with it and did not want any further surgery. Uh, you can combine this osteotomy with lengthening and varicization uh, more distally using the Elizarov technique. You can see here's a neck femur fracture in a 17 year old where we did this valgus osteotomy severe where you do quite a severe valgus and then you need to lengthen and varicize lower down so that your axis is reasonably well maintained. Uh, finally, we come to prosthetic replacement where which we want to avoid in the young patient, but there are situations where you really have no options. There's a 45 year old lady who had a neck femur fracture. Uh, this was how she was treated. It was 17 months or 16 months before the implant was removed. And then she came to us even later with this situation where the head is gone, the bones are osteoporotic, there's a high riding a femur. And to do the uh, THR, we had to really do uh, osteotomy to be able to do it safely because of the osteoporotic nature of the bone. Otherwise, there's a high risk of fracture taking place during the arthroplasty. And we were able to get it back. And she's actually, um, uh, this was done in 2004 and she came for a follow-up about three years ago and was doing quite well with it. Uh, other situations where you have avian following fibular graft, again, you have little choice but to do a arthroplasty, a failed hemiarthroplasty. Sometimes you've had young patients who've had a hemiarthroplasty for some reason and that doesn't, if that doesn't function and they have pain or, or loosening, you end up having to do a total hip replacement to salvage the situation. Or McMurray's osteotomy, which hasn't worked. There's very little head there to try and salvage the head and there we have to do an osteotomy again. You have to recreate the osteotomy and wire it down successful, uh, satisfactorily to get successful results. So I think in conclusion, I think these uh, neck femur fractures, you need to assess them very carefully. I think the first thing in the young patient is to try to salvage the head. So you need to look at whether the head is salvageable. And I think Dr. Sandhu's classification is quite helpful in trying to decide that. So younger patient, larger the head size, lesser the gap, uh, more towards uh, sal uh, to try and get it uh, reconstructed. Uh, if there's a severe gap and there's AVN and the patient is uh, uh, an older age group in the 40s or early 50s, then probably may go for a hip replacement. And there are some patients like some of the rural population where you don't want to do a replacement, you may go in for something like an excision with a uh, sort of pelvic support osteotomy, which will give them a reasonably good function. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Yeah. Very, it's an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, we'll answer the question at the end of the session. Yeah, sure. The next, Dr. Jan Sharma is not going to be here for a time being. He will be joining us a little bit late. Uh, is Abhijit, Abhijit present there? Okay. Abhijit, are you ready for your presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One minute time, sir. Just one minute. I'm loading my presentation. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, Abhijit is going to talk to an approach to the bone tumors. Yes, sir. Radiology to bone tumors and approach to bone tumors. So just mm -hmm. one minute. Presentation is loaded.
सर गुड इवनिंग माय सर स्क्रीन इज विजिबल सर हेलो इट्स विजिबल इट्स विजिबल सर शुड आई स्टार्ट सर शुड आई स्टार्ट सर हेलो यस सर प्लीज यस सर गुड इवनिंग सर Uh, so my topic is uh, radiology for bone tumors and i titled it as a to z of bone tumor so we'll discuss what is meaning of this a to z for bone tumors so if we see clinically a patient in our opd uh, this is a patient 40 years male with pain in swelling over left wrist since 4 month duration and we have done his clinical examination which showed there is tenderness there is a swelling probably around the distal aspect of radius on clinical examination and it is painful so as a orthopedic surgeon our investigation of choice is radiograph so this was the radiograph performed for this patient and here we can appreciate there is a lesion involving the distal end of the radius it is expansile osteolytic multiple septa are present and what is our differential diagnosis based on this x ray so whether it's benign x ray or malignant x ray because the treatment plan totally depends on whether it's benign or malignant an approach to benign tumors is totally different if it's giant cell tumor or aneurysmal bone cyst and if it's malignant bone tumor the treatment plan will be totally different so if we read this x ray it's of a skeletally mature individual lesion is involving a male or female we don't know because it's not labeled it's a single lesion it's involving the metaphysis it's very well defined if we can appreciate here the lesion is very well defined we can see where the tumor is starting where it's ending it's osteolytic with multiple septas and for examination purpose we can say uh, for that that this looks to be a radiograph of a benign bone tumor and if the examiner insists what is your differential diagnosis we can say 1 2 3 it can be a simple bone cyst less likely it can be aneurysmal bone cyst less likely more chances it can be a giant cell tumor as it's a skeletally mature individual So if you diagnose the X-ray very properly, the treatment plan can be performed very well. But there are few instances where the radiograph is not read properly, and inadherent surgeries are performed. So this is example: a lesion involving a femur bone, and the surgeon thought it is a benign bone tumor, and a nail was put inside. And we can appreciate here it's very big lesion, and lung metastasis is there. So there was no option to salvage this patient. second example a 55 years female with a lesion involving femur there is a pathological fracture and we can see here the lesion is not well defined the pathological fracture and edges are quite ill defined and the surgeon thought it's a metastatic bone tumor and a nail was placed inside it and it turned out to be osteosarcoma which is more common in the second age group so after 50 years the second surge of osteosarcoma is there most commonly it's in benign a uh, malignant bone tumor in pediatric patient but second peak is in age after 50 years so again the diagnosis was malignant here in this case and it's rodded sarcoma what we call it if some nail or plate is placed inside a benign uh, assumed a bone tumor and what surgery should be performed for these cases it's most commonly amputation so for this case external hemipelectomy was performed and the limb could not be salvaged so for getting better diagnosis we proposed a method that we titled as a to z ram that is radiograph assessment method for better triage of patient and we published our data in radiography journal in 2021 and what is this method we will see in subsequent slides so if you want to read any x ray we can classify it into a simple formula that is a to z a is age of the patient whether it's skeletally mature or immature b is bone which bone is involved b is bone which part of the bone is involved whether epiphysis metaphysis or diaphysis c is for characteristic whether it's osteolytic sclerotic or mixed lesion c is for content what is osteoblastic chondroblastic and ground glass content d is for distinctiveness whether it's well defined or ill defined again d for distribution narrow zone of transition or wide zone of transition e is for exterior of the bone and f is for fracture so z again we can say for distribution narrow zone of transition or wide zone of transition 
So this was an easy algorithm we prepared that any patient comes to a clinic, uh, get a radiograph done, basic blood tests are done, like CBC, ESR, calcium alkaline phosphate to rule out Brown's tumor, ESR to rule out infection. And read the X-ray in this pattern of A to Z, we can differentiate it into a benign bone tumor or malignant bone tumor in majority of cases. So for our example, this is a case of lesion involving the femur. Here the growth plate is open. So it's a skeletally immature individual. Lesion is involving femur. And which part of femur? It's metaphysis and diaphysis. It's an osteosclerotic lesion having osteoid matrix. Cortical destruction is absent. It's ill-defined. There is periosteal reaction seen. So it's sunburst type of periosteal reaction with codman strangle with a pathological fracture line. So it radiograph looks to be of a malignant bone tumor. Next, you can say most probably... Abhijit, it, Abhijit yes, just a moment. Sorry, to, you've got a bit this uh, uh, thing high, uh, coming on your the stop sharing thing, which is coming on your slide for everybody. Yes, sir. So can you just hide that? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We just need to... Is it okay, sir? Yeah, it's fine now. Yeah, great. Perfect. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So uh, if we read this X-ray and we want to say an exam, it looks to be a radiograph of a malignant bone tumor and most probably a osteosarcoma of distal part of femur in a skeletally mature individual. You can't say this whole A, B, C, D, E, F, Z in exam, but you can summarize this. So how we summarize that also we'll see in subsequent slides. So radiograph of a skeletally immature individual showing a lesion in metaphysis and diaphysis of distal femur, which is indistinct borders with wide zone of transition, which is osteoblastic with periosteal type of reaction of sunburst pattern. And most probably it looks to be a malignant bone tumor. And we are confident here, most probably it's a osteosarcoma. So we can say it's a osteosarcoma of distal part of femur. Second example, this is a skeletally mature individual, lesion involving the femur, upper part of femur. So we have to say it's epiphysis, metaphysis or diaphysis. So here it's metaphysis and diaphysis. Lesion is osteolytic with no content. And here it looks to be very well-defined lesion. Our differential diagnosis will be, first will be giant cell tumor. Second, it can be a simple bone cyst. So next, this method A to Z was a subjective method. So the surgeon or physician has to read it as A, B, C, D, E, F, Z. So we thought that we will uh, go more in an objective method. So we decided to publish our score and we titled it as radiograph evaluation score for bone tumors. So rest, we titled it as a short form. And this was published in Musculoskeletal Surgery Journal. So what are points A, B, C, D, E, F, Z? We categorize it in points. And if it looked to be benign, the score will be zero. If it is malignant type, then the score will be one. And total score, if it's less than three, most probably the lesion is benign. If the score is more than three, most probably it's a malignant bone tumor. So we evaluated this uh, with the four surgeons and total 100 patients. And nearly 95 to 98% patient, we are able to diagnose it's a benign bone tumor or malignant bone tumor. So we'll see two examples of this. So this is a radiograph of a skeletal immature individual showing a lesion, which is osteoblastic which is having osteoid matrix, which is ill-defined with wide zone of transition with periosteal reaction and a soft tissue mass. So if we calculate the score, it will be six out of eight. The score is more than three. Most probably it's a malignant bone tumor. Second example of tibia, skeletally mature individual lesion involving the proximal part of tibia, which is well-defined with some cortical erosion. So score was one out of eight. So it's less than three. And most probably it's a benign bone tumor. And this was a giant cell tumor proven on biopsy. So if you want to read all these points, uh, this all points are important. What is the significance of age, gender, periosteal relation? So we'll get one by one to all these points. So what is significance of age and gender? Few tumors are common in pediatric age group like osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma. These are malignant tumors. Benign tumors, chondroblastoma, osteoid osteoma, these are common in benign bone tumors in pediatric age group. Females, giant cell tumor is a bit more common. If age is more than 50, most probably it's a metastatic bone lesion, but it can be osteosarcoma. So we should be very vigilant while treating these cases.
second is number of lesion it's a single lesion or a multiple lesion single lesion most probably it can be benign or malignant lesion if it's multiple lesions most probably it's a metastatic lesion or it can be multiple myeloma primary bone tumors less likely it will be go to into multiple lesions and if it that is the case then it is a metastatic lesion and the survival will be poor so the x ray on the left side we can see the lesion involving both femurs the superior pubic ramus there is a fracture and it's ill defined lesion so most of it's a multiple myeloma or a metastatic bone lesion and on the right side we can see a lesion involving femur diaphysis it was a osteosarcoma multiple lesions so this is again asked in exam what is mapuche syndrome so multiple enchondromas are there and small soft tissue bluish nevus can be there so this is example of mapuche syndrome next is location on the skeleton so few tumors more common in flat bones few more common in long bones this is just a dictum that few tumors are more common in long bones but we can see all tumors at any location so this is not a hard and fast rule so long bones giant cell tumor more common in distal part of femur proximal tibia proximal humerus or distal end of the radius in flat bones chondrosarcoma is more common like in pelvis or in scapula next is location on the skeleton so whether it's epiphysis metaphysis or diaphysis so end of the bone is called epiphysis the shaft of the part of the bone long bone is called diaphysis and few tumors are more common in metaphysis so few examples so if we appreciate this is a radiograph of tibia the lesion is osteolytic involving the proximal part of tibia very well defined epiphyseal location so this is chondroblastoma involving the proximal part of tibia so this is the example skeletally mature individual showing a lesion in proximal tibia which is very well defined in the epiphyseal location metaphyses of the femur paraosteal osteosarcoma are more common these are very slow growing tumors so the patient presents with a history of 2 years or 3 years lesion involving the distal part of the femur posterior aspect so in this location paraosteal osteosarcoma is more common next whether the lesion is centric or eccentric so giant cell tumor more commonly are eccentric lesions simple bone cyst or aneurysmal bone cyst are morely centric lesions next important point is borders and zone of transition so currently there is a war going on between ukraine and russia so similar example the borders are well defined or ill defined so the countries would have not fought their war so if we draw border of india with a pen or pencil it's very well defined over the land so border between india and pakistan is very well defined on land border between india and sri lanka is ill defined because it is in the sea so we are able unable to differentiate where india is and where sri lanka is in the sea border so similar example india and pakistan border on land so one is vaga border second is atari border and we can appreciate a white line is there so it's very well defined so the tumors which are having well defined borders means we are able to differentiate where the tumor is starting and where it's ending most probably it's a benign bone tumor on the right side is the border between india and pakistan in gujarat where i stay so in kutch uh, the borders are very ill defined so our fisher must go there and their fisher must come here so they are caught in between so we can appreciate here the tumor is very ill defined the red and green color is mixed and matched so that is example of a malignant bone tumor so sharp outline sclerotic border is most probably a slow growing tumor so most probably well defined narrow zone of transition sharply outlined sclerotic border slow growing tumor most probably a benign bone tumor on the right side it's ill defined with wide zone of transition that is example of poorly defined borders it's a aggressive lesion or a malignant lesion and it's a fast growing tumor so because because of its speed it is growing very fast the tumor will not have a sclerotic borders so the example here radiograph of a skeletal immature individual showing a lesion in metaphysis and diaphysis very well defined with a pen or a pencil we can say here the tumor is starting and here the tumor is ending so this is example of a well defined sharply defined tumor with a sclerotic border and most probably it's a benign bone tumor here it was a aneurysmal bone cyst second example again humerus lesion in which is ill defined we are unable to draw where the tumor is starting and where it's ending so it's a fast growing tumor 
poorly defined borders it's a aggressive bone tumor and this was a osteosarcoma involving humerus in a skeletally mature immature individual a small kid so case example a lesion involving the humerus with a pathological fracture it's ill defined multiple areas of the bone are involved and what's the differential diagnosis here it was a metastatic bone tumor or a multiple myeloma with a pathological fracture again example of osteosarcoma involving the humerus with soft tissue mass ill defined sclerotic borders osteoid matrix most probably it's a malignant bone tumor that is osteosarcoma of humerus so what is meaning of osteolytic and what is meaning of sclerotic so it's lytic it's radio lucent lesion so skeletally immature individual on the left side and right side also distal end of the radius is involved a ill defined lesion on the right side which is sclerotic with a pathological fracture so on the right side the sclerotic lesion is most probably osteosarcoma of the distal end of the radius with a pathological fracture on the left side it was a lytic lesion involving the distal end of the radius and the differentials can be aneurysmal bone cyst or simple bone cyst so what is meaning of this geographic means very well defined you can draw the border between two countries so that is very well defined lesion or geographic lesion what is meaning of moth eaten multiple punched out lesions are there multiple holes are there which are not connected with each other so multiple holes that is called moth eaten jaise lakdi mein udhi lag jata hai uh, termites in a bone uh, in a wood that is example of moth eaten type so most probably seen in multiple myeloma and on the right side it's permeative lesion that is seen in ewing sarcoma more commonly so what is the content of the tumor if the content is white it's fluffy cotton like cloud like density ruy jaisa dikhta hai so that is example of osteoblastic matrix fluffy cotton like cloud like densities most commonly seen in osteosarcoma so here it's example of osteosarcoma humor ring in the humerus bone next is chondroblastic matrix so one type of matrix is osteoblastic matrix second is a chondroblastic matrix so here we can appreciate it's like popcorn punctate annular or coma shaped calcification and more commonly seen in chondrosarcomas it can be seen in chondroblastic osteosarcomas also next is periosteal reaction so again very commonly asked in exam what is meaning of periosteal reaction so it's a response of the bone most probably the cortical bone to the underlying insult so it can be seen in infection it can be seen in tumors so it's solid periosteal reaction more commonly seen in benign tumors like osteoid osteoma which lamellated type like onion multiple layers are there that is seen in ewing sarcoma most commonly and next we will be seeing what is cordman strangle and what is sunray type of periosteal reaction so here it's a solid type of periosteal reaction and here we can appreciate a nidus is there so our differential diagnosis will be osteoid osteoma so for these cases we get a ct scan done with fine cuts of 1 mm get a mri done a differential diagnosis here of osteoid osteoma may be brodie's abscess so get esr and crp uh, and procalcitonin for these patients next is speculated or divergent type or sunray type of periosteal reaction so on the images what we see this is mammogram done for ca breast so sun, like sun multiple lay, rays are there which are in multiple directions so divergent type multiple rays are there so commonly seen in osteosarcoma and ewing sarcoma so why this occurs the bone growth is very high the matrix deposits along the scarpes fibers and it is stretched and the tumor goes out of these areas so that is one theory second theory is bone inducing factors are there which leads to induction of osteoblastic activity and periosteal formation so this is example of sunburst type or sunray type of periosteal reaction tumor involving the femur that is distal femur in a skeletally mature individual which is ill defined and the type of periosteal reaction is this sunray type next is lamellated or onion peel like pyaaz ke chilke jaisa if you cut the onion there are multiple concentric layers so why this type of periosteal reaction occurs there are slow growing and fast growing layers so because of that multiple layers are formed so example is this commonly seen in ewing sarcoma again skeletally immature individual showing a lesion in 
femur diaphysis which is ill defined which is having multiple layers like onion so lamellated type of periosteal lesion so this is important what is meaning of codman's triangle so ideally a triangle should have three borders so this was described by ernest codman and uh, on his name and it was first described by ribbet in 1914 so basically it's not a triangle it's a angle so it's a misnomer so if the bone is there and the periosteum is elevated that will give some angle so that angle is looking like a triangle a triangle should have three borders but in case of the tumors there will be no third border or the lower border so we'll see that why this occurs it's a triangular area or angle form due to new subperiosteal bone that is created because the lesion raises the periosteum away from the bone so it can be seen in tumors it can be seen in infection so it's not exclusively related to tumors so what is the principle why this occurs so here we can appreciate there is a aggressive lesion it may can be infection or it can be tumor it elevates the periosteum and there is no time for the bone to deposit in the lower part why because the tumor or infection is growing that fast it is preventing ossification in the lower part of the triangle so it's a pseudo triangle and if exam you are asked you can draw the affected bone and the angle created by it and that is codman's triangle next is pathological fracture so previously pathological fractures were considered contraindications for limb salvage so we published few of our papers in jbgs british and ejso so it's a relative type of contraindication and if the fracture heals well you can attempt limb salvage with poor survival rates next is soft tissue mass lesion involving the femur with soft tissue swelling it's ill defined with codman's triangle so the differential diagnosis here is osteosarcoma involving the shaft of femur so this was the example what we saw in previous x ray lesion involving the tibia which is ill defined or well defined it's a well defined lesion epiphyseal location it's chondroblastoma so here are two examples this is commonly asked in exam on x ray on the right side lesion involving the skeletally immature individual which is very well defined we can draw the border of the tumor involving the metaphysis and diaphysis with a pen or pencil there is a pathological fracture and small leaf like fragment is floating in the bone so here the differential diagnosis will be simple bone cyst with a pathological fracture and this is called for uh, fallen leaf sign on the left side again humerus expansile lytic well defined lesion and this was aneurysmal bone cyst involving the humerus example of multiple lesions involved skull femur humerus with multiple fractures so differential diagnosis will be multiple myeloma or metastatic bone lesions so in multiple myeloma you have to get serum proteins done electrophoresis done and albumin globulin ratio will be reversed so can radiographs diagnose all the tumors no it has its own limitation so this is an example of limitation we what we published in our two papers that there is limitation radiograph can give diagnosis in nearly 95% of cases but in few cases it's not able to differentiate between a benign and malignant bone tumor so skeletally immature individual showing a lesion in femur which looked well defined no periosteal reaction no soft tissue swelling so differential diagnosis can be simple bone cyst or aneurysmal bone cyst the mri showed multiple fluid fluid level so biopsy was performed and it showed it is a telangiectic osteosarcoma so we have to resect the bone give chemotherapy first do surgery resect the bone and put mega prosthesis so after x ray next investigation of choice is mri so what is meaning of this this is again asked in exam what is t1 and t2 so t1 is the relaxation time in longitudinal and t2 is in transverse so what is significance of t1 it gives good anatomic details and what is significance of t2 it gives good contrast so how to remember it's t1 or t2 so formula of water is h2o so anything that is white so t2 water looks white formula of water is h2o easy to remember this is mri of spine so disc contains water spinal canal contains water so water looks white so that is t1 fat looks white in t1 and water looks white in t2 so every part displays different intensities so it is significant that after x ray you get a mri done which is followed by biopsy 
so if you order a x ray so are these two mris good quality no you require a full length mri to screen whole of the bone if it's skip lesions that will be diagnosed on mri you should know uh, mri should be with a contrast it should have a scale so that your final surgical planning is dependent on mri how much bone should be resected it will tell how much the neurovascular bundles are involved so mri is very important investigation it should be of full length with contrast with a scale so you have to tell the radiologist that you want a mri and you are suspecting bone tumor in that case next investigation is ct scan so it is used for staging workup on the lower side left side we can see lesion involving the bone which is having osteoid osteoma and the modern treatment of osteoid osteoma is rfa that is radio frequency ablation ct guided just poke a needle inside the bone under anesthesia burn the nidus at higher temperature more than 300 400 degrees and the nidus disappears and the patient is pain free so the take home messages of radiology is what is meaning of a to z that we should remember age bone which part of bone characteristic content distribution exterior fracture and zone of transition so if we read the, any x ray with this methods we will be able to reach a diagnosis and differentiate whether it's a benign or malignant in majority of cases so example clinical case with the pain over the ulnar aspect of wrist get a x ray done followed by mri followed by biopsy so this was the x ray involving the distal or ulna which is very well defined skeletally mature individual so skeletally mature ulna epiphysis metaphysis osteolytic ground glass matrix very well defined so this is summarize it's a radiograph of skeletally mature individual showing lesion in epiphysis metaphysis distal ulna which is having well defined borders narrow zone of transition ground glass matrix no periosteal reaction no soft tissue mass so most probably it's a benign bone tumor and most probably it's a giant cell tumor of distal end of ulna so if we use this a b c d e f z skeletally immature humerus osteo light sclerotic with periosteal reaction ill defined soft tissue swelling so most probably it's a malignant bone tumor so this is example on the right side we can see a x ray which is bit poor quality because this was a presentation x ray and whether it's benign or malignant the surgeon thought it is benign he put a nail and it was a malignant bone tumor it's a ewing sarcoma so you have to differentiate whether amrish puri is benign or malignant and your plan bit depends totally on that so we can differentiate the tumors into benign and malignant get a mri done if you are suspecting benign get biopsy as per the location for the principles of biopsy if it's a malignant bone tumor better get a mri done and refer to a tertiary cancer care center where the for the line of treatment can be done so thank you very much so so uh, this was the sir uh, presentation on radiographs and next will be approach to bone tumors go ahead yes sir so approach to bone tumors so in past what was there in present and future we'll see so example is kid reading the book and the elderly gentleman again reading the book so why we should know what is past present and future if, because if we forget our past and we don't remember what are the treatment options available we can't know what is in future so this is the place where i work it's uh, gujarat cancer research institute it's a 750 bedded government cancer hospital and all the radiographs and surgical procedures have been performed here so what is importance of bone biopsy so we have seen x ray we have seen mri ct scan next important step is bone biopsy and why it should be performed and what is the significance of this so this is a small video showing how biopsy is performed so this is how the line of incision is drawn it should be done by the surgeon so there are few principles you should get a x ray done mri done all imaging before the biopsy your final line of incision means if you are doing limb salvage surgery or amputation that the surgeon should know so you should draw the line of incision so here it's a distal part of the femur so either you can get incision medially or laterally and this is how the biopsy scar will be isolated and you have to resect this biopsy scar during the while doing the final surgery so draw the line of incision 
mark the biopsy scar. So generally it is done under local anesthesia. If it's kid, then you can do under general anesthesia. This is the needle which is used, that is Jamchedi needle. So first we are given local anesthesia. Small stab incision is taken. Use Jamshedi needle, poke it inside the bone. And the junctional area will yield better type of bone and get three to four good cores. So this is how the needle is here to do rotatory movement of your hand. And if the lesion is deep inside, you can use either IITV, CM or a CT scan guided. And this is how the tissue is obtained. Send it to the pathologist. And this is how the incision is closed. So there is a dictum that if you are suspecting any bone tumor, send a specimen to in pathologist and microbiologist if you are suspecting infection also. Don't split the specimen into two or three parts. Just send the whole of the specimen to one pathologist. Close the incision with small suture. And if we are doing open biopsy, the drain should be placed in the same line of incision. So these are the principles of biopsy. And after this, you get the diagnosis, whether it's benign or malignant tumor. So previously, the treatment options were amputation, which was performed most commonly. And in modern days, we are using customized implants, 3D printed implants, expandable or growing joint. We are using liquid nitrogen. So these are the multiple options which have been available nowadays. So malignant bone tumor, upper part, we can see a lesion which was resected and it's mega prosthesis that is used. And lower part, we can see it's a rotation plasty that was done. So we'll see what is rotation plasty also. So the tumor involving, we'll go by a few locations. So if the tumor is involving the upper limb, humerus and the radius or ulna, that part, so four quarter amputation was done. So four quarter amputation means you're resecting the clavicle, part of clavicle, scapula and humerus. That is called four quarter amputation. It's a major type of amputation. And uh, still we are performing four quarter amputations, but the treatments available where the limb salvage surgery is feasible, that is feasible in nearly 90% to 95% of cases. And we can replace the proximal part of humerus with either a prosthesis, that is a non-biological method. So this is a prosthesis that is mega prosthesis. So why is this called mega prosthesis? because we are replacing the part of epiphysis, metaphysis, and diaphysis. So that's why the term is mega prosthesis. And which types of mega are available nowadays? It's a modular type of mega prosthesis, means we can assemble all the parts on table. In pediatric patient or specialized areas, we can get a customized joint. But nowadays, nearly all locations, you have a modular type of mega prosthesis. Again, this is very common question asked in exam. What is mega prosthesis? So it's a joint where you replace epiphysis, metaphysis, and diaphysis. And which of type of processes are used nowadays, mega processes? It's a modular type where you have multiple parts available which can be assembled on table. Second option is you can use a nail cement spacer. So that is an implant cement spacer or a prosthesis. So advantage of prosthesis is you will have mobile joint. Second option is any tumor around the joint, you can fix the bone. That is arthrodesis. So the humerus is here fixed with the clavicle and part of scapula. So any tumor involving the joint, you have two treatment options, at least three treatment options. One is fixed joint, that is arthrodesis. You can have a mobile joint, that is a mega prosthesis or a use of a bone. Or third is unstable joint or a pseudoarthrosis. We have option of nowadays modern prosthesis, that is reverse shoulder type of prosthesis or we can use patient's own bone, that is the humerus bone, treat it with liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is available at minus 180 degrees for 30 minutes. So put the bone back again, it will kill all the tumor cells. Or ECRT, again commonly asked in exam, what is ECRT? ECRT is extracorporeal radiotherapy. So the tumor is treated for 50 grays, 30 minutes, and the bone is brought back again and fixed to the host area with the help of a plate or nail again an example of wrist joint so this is very common tumor involving the distal end of the radius 
So we published our data in 2017, and the tumors involving distal end of the radius. So a common exam case. So here the radiograph is very well defined, osteolytic, expansile. On palpation, there is ping pong ball sign means you can push the tumor, and it will rebound back. The skin will be a bit tense, shiny, and dilated veins. And X-ray followed by MRI followed by biopsy is performed for these patients. Nowadays, modern drugs like zolendronic acid or denoximab can be used for treatment of giant cell tumor, which is followed by surgery. So, what are the treatment options available for the tumors involving the distal end of the radius? Again, any tumor involving the joint, we can have a mobile joint. So, we can use fibula, so ipsilateral or contralateral fibula. So, it is commonly said that we can use opposite fibula, which mimics the radius. So, we can use patient's own fibula. That is contralateral side. If it's right side, then you can use patient's left side fibula. Fix it with the help of plate. It can be either vascularized or non-vascularized. Second option is arthrodesis. So for arthrodesis, we have an option of fixing the ulna, shift the ulna towards the radius and fix it with the help of a plate. That is called ulna translocation. Or we can directly fix the ulna with the third metacarpal or second metacarpal. That is called ulna centralization. So we have option of ulna translocation, ulna centralization. We have option of using mobile joint, means fibula of the patient. Next is amputation. So are amputations justified in 2021 or 2022? Yes, they are justified. And these are performed in the cases where there are recurrences and where the tumor is not salvageable. Your artery vein now are totally encased by the tumor and there is no soft tissue available for coverage. So in that cases, amputation should be performed for the patients. So the tumors involving the pelvis. So the tumor is involving the iliac bone. So there is a classification for hemipelvectomy again. Type 1 hemipelvectomy means resecting the iliac bone. Type 2 hemipelvectomy means resecting the periacetabular area. And type 3 means resecting the pubic bone. Type 4 means resecting the sacrum. So here the lesion are involving the iliac bone. We resected that bone and the part of the superior part of the roof of acetabulum was just hitched with the remaining part of the ileum. And these patients will have shortening of the limb, but the gait is quite well and they are able to walk on their own limbs. So do we have complications? Yes, complications are part and part of the parcel of the surgery. So in these cases, hemipelectomy or megaprosthesis infection do occur. So these patients should be treated very well and never give up. So what is modern thing or what is future? So this is our case where we 3D printed the pelvic bone and on the red area that is depicting the tumor area which will be resected. So we are using customized implants for these types of patients and these 3D printed models gives exact idea where the cut should be taken. There is customized jig can be also prepared for these cases. Next is after seeing radi shoulder, radius, pelvis, we will see distal end of the femur. So two treatment options, one can be arthrodesis and a second can be a mobile joint. So for arthrodesis, you can use patient's fibula or arthrodesis implants are available. So in this case, lesion involving distal end of the femur, ill-defined, osteolytic, soft tissue was involved. So the plan was to resect the distal end of the femur. And this is how the incision is marked. So we can appreciate here, the biopsy scar is taken into the final line of incision. This is how the fibula is harvested. Either you can use vascularized or non-vascularized fibula. And we used long arthrodesis nail. So it is spanning hip to ankle. Or second option can be K-nail or Kunches nail. That is very commonly used for these types of procedures like arthrodesis. Second option for these tumors around the knee joint is using megaprosthesis. So here we can appreciate the skin incision is marked. It's medial skin incision. So the surgeon should know how the skin incision should be taken so that the biopsy is planned accordingly. And we can see here the tumor was resected with good margins. Good margins mean we should not see the tumor. It should be very well covered by the soft tissue, either fascia and the soft tissue and the biopsy scar should be gone with the tumor. What is meaning of modular uh, megaprosthesis? So this is the prosthesis. We are replacing the epiphysis, metaphysis, and diaphysis. So what are the parts of this? It is having a femoral component. 
a tibial component so femoral component will go into the femur it will have a articulating area so in these types of joint it's a hinge type of joint it can be a fixed joint like the hinge which is in the door so it can be fixed hinge joint or it can be a rotating hinge joint and the lower part of the implant goes into tibia so these are commonly cemented type of implant and here we can see there is a small hole inside the tibial part and there is a rod like area where the patellar tendon will be reattached so this is very common exam question what is mega prosthesis and what are types of mega prosthesis so this is a modular type of mega prosthesis in few slides we will see what is meaning of customized implant so this is how the tumor is resected the patellar tendon is attached to the rod like area bone graft is placed and we take medial gastrocnemius flap so that the implant is covered and the extensor apparatus of this patient is prepared and these are the functions after mega prosthesis patient is having knee range of movement from 10 to 90 degrees 10 degrees extensor lag is there and able to walk back on his legs next common treatment is curettage so as a orthopedic surgeon we should know what is curettage and what is extended curettage so again lesion involving the distal femur which is ill defined mri was done biopsy was performed patient was treated with zolendronic acid so that a wall is obtained so as a student we should know what is zolendronic acid what is dinoximab and what are its dosage so zolendronic acid we give 4 mg iv in diluted in 100 ml ns for 20 minutes and before giving zolendronic acid we should check patient's creatinine level and common blood cbc should be performed and dental examination should be performed and dinoximab generally 4 to 6 injections are given every weekly so what are the steps of curettage first make a big window so it should, is not a window it's like a door so we can see the tumor by 360 degree remove the tumor with help of curettes and wash is given with pulse lavage use a burr and we can add bone cement here or sandwich method is again there so what is meaning of sandwich method again common question asked in exam so sandwich method means we use a layer of bone graft followed by gel foam followed by bone cement so this is theoretically thought to decrease the risk of damage to the articular cartilage because we are putting bone graft followed by gel foam followed by cement so this will decrease the risk of damage to the articular cartilage directly by the cement so small video showing lesion in the distal end of the radius skeletally mature and this was a biopsy prone giant cell tumor so this is the lesion involving the distal end of the radius so mri was performed and biopsy was performed bone scan was performed and this is the skin incisions so this is the final line of incision volar approach as we wanted to cure it touch this is the final line of incision which was planned so make a window soft tissue is elevated make a window so this is how the window is prepared go inside do curettage so all the soft tissue tumor area is removed and protect the adjacent area with the help of hydrogen peroxide mops so this again decreases the risk of recurrence and use hydrogen peroxide so this is how hydrogen peroxide is used and this is how the cavity is achieved and we had put used phenol as a chemical adjuvant and alcohol was put and bone graft substitutes were added for this case so this is how the tumor was resected so this is how these are the surgical steps small video of this so the incision is marked so under tunicate this surgery was performed so flaps are raised mark the window this is how the window is marked so with the help of the osteotom before make small holes del holes and with the help of osteotom make the window so that we go inside the tumor so curettage is performed only for benign bone tumors it's not performed for malignant bone tumors malignant bone tumors wide resection should be performed so this is how the window is prepared remove the tumor use hydrogen peroxide use pulse lavage this is how the burr is used so that all the ridges are 
gone and the tumor clearance is achieved. So this is how curatage is done and this is the cavity which was achieved. So after that we used phenol as chemical adjuvant and we used pottery also and bone graft substitute were added and this was the closure done for this patient. Next example is uh, for benign bone tumors, we can use sclerotherapy. Commonly asked in exam, what is sclerotherapy and what is treatment of aneurysmal bone cysts? So we published our data in a uh, few journals. And here we can see that the lesion is involving the superior pubic ramus. And it was treated with only a small incision and sclerosant was added. So what are the steps of sclerosant? Just to... So how sclerosant is given. So aneurysmal bones is an expansive lytic lesion. So this is how biopsy is performed through it. Curopsy is done. So what is mean of curopsy? Biopsy done with the intention of curatage. So for this case, first biopsy was done. It was proven as aneurysmal bones is. Small incision is taken. Use a jump shading needle, go inside. It's done again IITV guided. So this is how the jump shading needle is introduced. The lesion was involving the talus. Curopsy means break all the septas. So bit vigorous movement, break all the septas. Aspirate all the blood. So this tumor will become uh, having around 200, 300 ml of blood. So with the syringe, aspirate all the content in the cavity. And this, so here you can see, this is how the vigorous curopsy is done. Example of humerus, IITV guided images. Then use sclerosant. So this is how sclerosant is used. Sclerosant is ascarol, polydoconal is used. So it is ideally used in varicose vein. So this is the extended use that is performed for aneurysmal bone cyst. We can make foam of this. So use a three way and make a foam of this material so that the volume increases. And this material is injected inside the cavity. So this is example of 14 years boy. Lesion is involving the whole of scapula. So curopsy was done, sclerosant was given and we can appreciate here, whole of the scapula lesion has healed very well. Second example, lesion involving the fibula. Again, curopsy was done, lesion healed very well after curopsy. And last is example of metacarsal, which was again treated with curopsy. So next example is of rotation plasty. Commonly asked in exams, what is rotation plasty? So rotation plasty is a modified amputation in which you are converting a above knee amputation or a hip disarticulation into a below knee amputation. So the ankle joint of the patient will be working as knee joint. So this is small animation, the tumor involving the distal end of the femur. You remove the tumor completely, only neurovascular bundle is preserved. Turn the limb by 180 degrees, coiling of the vessel is done. Lexan is given to decrease chances of thrombosis and fix it with the help of a plate and screws. So this is small animation, how this is performed. So this is how the distal femur tumor is removed. You remove the tumor, neurovascular bundle. And this is the, and fixing. So this is how the limb is turned by 180 degrees and where we can appreciate it, only neurovascular bundle is saved. So you'll be coiling the neurovascular bundle. So very useful procedure for the patient because patients above knee amputation is converted into below knee amputation and patient will have excellent function. So this is the function how we achieve after rotation plastic, patient has to use prosthesis and his ankle joint will be working as a knee joint. So this is how the child is working and this is the prosthesis which is used. And the ankle is working as knee joint, the limb is rotated by 180 degrees. So cosmetically, it's not that great, but functionally, it's very excellent procedure. We can modify it, uh, we can remove the toes, so it will be become a bit cosmetic. So the example, what we saw in the uh, first case, a lesion involving the femur, which was thought to be benign. So the surgeon put nail and it was evening sarcoma which was treated with chemotherapy and Kajol had missed the train, but still attempt of limb salvage was done. So the plan for this case was to remove whole of the femur. So it's skeletally immature individual, eight or nine years girl. So we have to get a hip joint, knee joint and whole of the femur. 
So customized joint with the help of 3D printing was planned. So this is how the example, the biopsy scar is removed, whole of the femur is resected. And this is example of expandable customized type of joint. So there are two types of expandable joint. One is invasive type and second is non-invasive type. So here we are using a invasive type or minimally invasive. Small incision is given every time and one millimeter is one turn. So every six months to one year, we have to increase the limb of the length by one centimeter. So this was a scanogram done. So initially the limb length was 28.78 centimeters. It increased to 31.58 centimeters. So expansion of three centimeters was performed for this kid. And this is a small video how this is performed. So this is a growing or expandable joint. And it is an example of a customized joint. A customized expandable type of joint which was made up of titanium and it's an indigenous joint made in India. And how we do expansion of this? So the example is, so this is how the expansion is done. Fix the screwdriver here. Every time you have to give small incision because this all is closed now. So the screwdriver is added, placed into the slot and we are turning one turn is equal to one millimeter. So this part is growing for the patient. So every six months to one year, the expansion be, should be performed for these cases based on the scanogram. So do complications occur? Yes. So one example, what we saw in pelvis here, the example is the patient presented with this, the joint was out of the skin. It was infected. And we thought that what options are available. One is do directly four quarter amputation. Second is do limb salvage. He was a long-term follow-up patient. So three years gone from primary surgery. There was no recurrence here. So we thought that we'll do salvage for this case. We removed the whole implant, do good wash, use antibiotic nail cement spacer. And this is the final outcome. So what is the future? Future can be use of AI, that is artificial intelligence, 3D printing. We can print bone. Now, in future, we may print muscle and nose. We don't know. It's always amazing. So example of 3D printing. So two cases are there. These are last few slides. So we use 3D model of femur and thigh. So this is the tumor which will be resected. And the example is, we dip the bone into liquid nitrogen. So this is liquid nitrogen, which is available at minus 180 degrees. And the bone is put back again at its original site. So this is the example, tumor involving the femur in skeletal immature individual, treated with new urgent chemotherapy. MRI was performed. And this is how what we want to show here. Only the this part is saved. So we have to get that close to the humor. So a customized 3D model and a jig will be helpful in these cases. Alternative is computer navigation. It's not available at multiple centers. So we thought that we'll use 3D printed bone. So this is how the 3D printed bone is used. And a jig is used. And we can plan our exact cut, which will be just 1 to 1.5 centimeters from the knee joint. So the purpose is to save the patient's knee joint hip joint and use this customized jig so that we can get precise cut. So all steps can be performed before surgery. So your plate can be modified according to this. You can print special type of plate, customized plate can be used. And this is intraoperatively how this jig is applied to the saw bone and this will be applied to the tumor bone. This is sterilized bone jig and this is how take the distal cut. So the distal part of the knee joint is preserved and that this is the tumor area, which is isolated away from the tumor. This is example how liquid nitrogen is there. It is at minus 180 degrees. Use a sterile container and dip this patient's own bone into liquid nitrogen for 20 minutes. Then do thawing, bring it to lower temperature in air and water. So this looks like ice cream. So thawing is done. Bring it up to normal temperature and put it back again at its original site. So here we used two plates. One is an upper part, lower part, or either we can use a customized single plate, which will be spanning whole of the femur. And the, this is the last example, how these 3D models help. So tumor involving the shaft of the tibia, here we can appreciate this is the tumor. So we want to take a cut here and a jig. So a specialized jig is used. So this is the jig which will be used. So make holes into the normal bone, fix it with the help of jig. 
and this is a saw how saw will be used saw will be used to cut it so lower part is cut upper part is cut do ecrt that is extra corporal radiotherapy or put it in liquid nitrogen and this is the customized plate which is printed with 3d printing method so it will have a few solid parts so normal plates will have multiple holes here so this is having solid areas so decreases chances of breakage here and it is fixed to this bone so the learning message or take home messages for any tumors first get the radiograph done followed by mri followed by biopsy differentiate whether it's benign or malignant for benign tumors the treatment options for aneurysmal bones is can be used of sclerosis sclerotherapy for osteoosteoma you can use rfa radio frequency ablation for giant cell tumor multiple drugs can be used like dinoxumab or zolindronic acid for malignant bone tumors if it's osteosarcoma or ewing sarcoma chemotherapy is given so what is chemotherapy chemotherapy are the drugs which are given to kill the tumor cells the chemotherapy given before surgery is called neoadjuvant chemotherapy chemotherapy given after surgery is called adjuvant chemotherapy so any malignant tumor the two treatment options one is limb salvage second is amputation in limb salvage if it's involving the joint area we can give mobile joint with the help of mega prosthesis commonly used mega prosthesis are modular type of mega prosthesis mega prosthesis means a joint which replaces epiphysis metaphysis and diaphysis or second option in pediatric patients you can use customized joint we can have second option of arthrodesis means fixing the joint or in pelvis we can have pseudo arthrosis a unstable joint in benign tumors like giant cell tumor curettage should be performed and a newer term is extended curettage means use of multiple agents physical and chemical and there are complications which can happen in any tumor surgeries so we can treat them very well and last resort is amputation so either it can be four quarter amputation hip disarticulation above knee or below knee amputation so as a surgeon we should know all these incisions and rotation plasty means converting a above knee amputation or hip disarticulation into a below knee amputation and what is the future we can have 3d printing we can have use of liquid nitrogen we can have special algorithms which can tell what is the treatment plan for this case that may happen in future and we can print bone or nerve in future thank you very much sir so if you have any yeah thank you sir very nice presentation in thank detail and well planned thank you so much i have one question to you yes sir yes sir. it when you do these mega prosthesis yes sir what is their normal life as far as the uh, wear, uh, wear and tear is concerned so our indian joints uh, are okay for 5 to 10 years indian joints uh, the plastic gets wear poly plastic part so we have to change it generally by 5 years Uh, because these all are fixed type of joint, fixed hinge. The foreign joints are available, uh, rotating hinge of uh, foreign companies that last for more ten to fifteen years, sir. But still, they will have uh, revision. So that is the thing. Indian joints five to ten years they last. Foreign joints around ten to fifteen years. But the cost difference is very high. Indian joints are costing around one to one point five lakh rupees. Foreign joints are costing sir up to six lakh rupees. So that is bit a concern. And thank uh, you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Doctor Jain Sharma. Yes, sir. Okay, okay then. then. How are you? How do you feel? Perfect, sir. Walking okay. around. <laughs> Pain good, free good, now. Good, good, good. Doctor Jain Sharma just said a THR. Okay, then. Go yes, ahead. sir. It's not a very. Uh, In, I mean, a dry type of topic that I'll be speaking on. This is on orthosis and prosthesis. Although, after such a lucrative description of bone tumors, this will be a very dry talk. No, sir. We require these prosthesis, sir. Orthotics and prosthetics. <laughs> It's not possible without these for our life. Yeah. It's very important. Hello. So, shall I start, sir? Hello. Shall I start? Yes, Jain. Please go ahead. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, so, by definition, an orthosis is defined as an externally applied device 
used to modify structural and functional characteristic of the neuromuscular system it is taken from a greek word meaning making straight the common orthoses the, that are kept in exams start with ambulatory aids the function of these aids is to relieve weight bearing i mean the partial weight relieving device these are the device which help in functional independence of a patient they provide propulsion increase the support area thus maintain the center of gravity they improve balance and reduce lower limb pain so there are three types of uh, ambulatory aids walker we have discussed in detail yesterday cane and crutches we will be talking today cane transmits up to 25% of weight unilaterally it is used in hip and knee pathology in hemiplegics and old age they can be a c type or a j type uh, cane modification is a quadruped that increases the support area walker i think so we have discussed all this uh, yesterday itself coming on to crutches <coughs> and axillary crutch it transmits 80% of the body weight the crutch length is measured from the anterior axillary fold to a point 0.6 inches in front and lateral to the fifth toe it is measured with elbow flexed to 30 degrees and wrist in maximum extension fingers are made into a fist and patient is made to stand erect with relaxed shoulders for measuring the length they can be a axillary crutch or a loft strand or a elbow extension that is canadian crutch a platform crutch in this the elbow remains in 90 degree of flexion it is measured by distance from ground to the forearm it is indicated in wrist and hand pathologies with weak hand grip the canadian uh, it is a tricep weakness crutch when it is made of wood it is known as canadian when it is made of metal it is known as abric the axillary type crutches with a strap at the mid arm level for preventing buckling of the elbow this is a very important question both in theory as well as viva what is a crutch gait we have some four five points to be uh, remembered first is the two point gait in this the sequence is left crutch right foot followed by right crutch and left foot it is indicated in ataxia and decreased weight bearing over the limbs it provides better stability faster than the four point gait and provides weight relief to both the lower limbs a three point gait the sequence is both the crutches forward then weak lower limb followed by normal lower limb this is also known as a non weight bearing gait it is indicated in amputees and fractures of the lower limb next is a four point gait in this the sequence is left crutch followed by right foot then right crutch followed by left foot this is indicated in polio and paraparesis these are a few viva questions what is a swing to swing through and drag to gait in swing to both the crutches used followed by both the limbs coming at the level of crutch swing through both the crutches forward followed by limb going beyond the crutches and in drag to there is alternate left crutch right crutch drag the limb to the crutch and simultaneously both crutches forward followed by dragging of the limb now what are the principles of applying orthoses they are used for protection stabilization and assistance classification this is uh, more of a theoretical part it could be a static type of orthosis or a dynamic orthosis a static orthosis could be a serial static although ctv cast is not a orthosis but this is one of the example of serial static that is fixed in a fixed periodic changing angle so first deformity correction second third fourth that way different casts are applied so just to keep uh, underst uh, understanding of what is a serial static you can use that example then there is a static motion that is permitting motion in the in one direction then it could be a static progressive joint is placed in a position of stretch and once motion is increased the tension is increased progressively and there is dynamic either it could be a motion blocking or a traction or tenodesis this uses the principle of parallelogram example is use of active extension of wrist to produce flexion of fingers 
third type is a continuous passive motion that is electrically operated device for range of movement and the fourth one is a carpet tunnel and oh these are the adaptive devices like wheelchairs tricycles car seats uh, etc now coming on to the upper limb orthosis one is a airplane splint this is usually kept in the table viva here the arm is kept in 90 degree of abduction it is a static splint so whenever you are asked in exam describe this orthosis you have to start with this is a static or a dynamic splint then you have to say what is the position it has to be applied third would be what is the indication where it has to be used so here it is it is uh, a static splint prevents movement of glenohumeral joint used in herbs palsy other static uh, is figure of eight splint basically the original name for this is a meek clavicular brace it supports shoulder elbow and forearm helps in prevention of subluxation of shoulder and hemiplegics and tetraplegics the balanced forearm orthosis is a dynamic splint it is usually not kept in exams but you should know about it with a pivot and a linkage system which adjusts to the patient to produce movement of the elbow and shoulder using the forearm and the trunk now there is static and dynamic elbow orthosis or range of motion type of devices which can be either kept as uh, in a static mode or a dynamic mode to hold a damaged or unstable joint in alignment and functional position the flexion and extension is assisted in a single unit there is a proximal and distal strap to secure fit the uh, device helps in restricting arthritic changes and deformity product uh, progression now for hand orthosis also orthosis for ulnar nerve the deformity of ulnar nerve is clawing of little and ring finger hyperextension at mcpn flex pip and dip joint so in this we use a knuckle bender splint it is uh, if mcp joints are kept in neutral or in 15 degree of dorsiflexion the long extensors can extend the ip joint due to action of radial nerve it is an example of a dynamic splint so for modification for total claw hand is to use a lumbrical bar which keeps the meta all the metacarpals in flexion for median nerve the deformity is ape thumb deformity for injury at the wrist with loss of abduction and position for injury above elbow the deformations are wrist radial flexion thumb flexion and abduction and a position of all except ring and little finger so here we give this type of uh, orthosis this is also a type of knuckle bender but with a thumb support hand orthosis with thumb post or thumb spiker splint is one of the examples which is used for uh, decurvians disease or for ligamentous injuries around the uh, mcp joint of the thumb if the lesion is above the elbow then there is loss of radial flexion at the wrist the thumb flexion here we use this type of orthosis this is for radial nerve we usually use uh, for radial nerve if it is pure radial nerve injury there is a wrist drop if it is a pin injury there would be a finger drop so we use a static cock up splint which keeps the wrist in dorsiflexion it extends the mcp joint in neutral position and prevents active motion the modification is a dynamic splint dorsal wrist hand orthosis with metacarpal extension assist this keeps the wrist in neutral position or dorsiflexion with mp extension where it is placed above the proximal phalanx it has rubber bands attached to the fingers for active assisted extension the modification for this is use of spring instead of rubber band for posterior interosseous nerve injury or recovering palsy a dynamic mcp extensor hand orthosis is used now for botanier splint uh, deformity a botanier splint finger orthosis is used it has two rings farther from the joint for better leverage and comfortable angle then the lateral support splint uh, is also used for botanier deformity like this these are 
for swan neck we use reversal of the ring support uh, that was used in bottom air here the uh, there is widening at the extensor level instead of flexor level the anti swan neck orthosis this was kept in one of the exams and this picture is taken from that exam center itself the position of pip joint in slight flexion while limiting full pip joint extension but allowing for full pip flexion and full dip range of movement it consists of a thin strip of thermoplastic material placed dorsally over the proximal and middle phalanx of the affected finger a stack splint or a mallet finger splint it is used for immobilization of finger following distal phalanges collateral ligament injury and mallet finger deformity so these are the examples of stack uh, splint and mallet finger splints aluminum foam splint works on the principle of three point fixation coming on to spinal orthosis the cervical spine orthosis are either a cervical collar halo device post appliances and uh, cervical thoracic orthosis commonly available are flexion extension control device other one is flexion extension lateral flexion and rotation control device the example of flexion extension control device are soft and semi rigid collars philadelphia collars or a somi brace we'll come uh, in uh, we'll discuss them in detail in the few slides the flexion extension lateral flexion rotation control device examples are minerva jacket and a hyalopelvic paste a soft cervical collar is made of foam or rubber covered with stock in it advantage is low cost easy fabrication well tolerated psychological comfort and warmth indication in cervical facet syndrome sprain strains discogenic pains and degenerative disc disease usually ask question in why why is how do you measure the uh, cervical collars depth from the tip of mastoid process to the trapezius muscle is the length of the i mean uh, the width of the cervical collar and the only disadvantage is prolonged use causes muscle atrophy and there is no restriction of movement with this device a semi rigid collar made of polypropylene height can be changed or adjusted because it has two parts easy to apply and remove some restriction of flexion and extension is available chin and occipital extension can be added it does not let uh, restrict the lateral bending <clears throat> the philadelphia collar usually ask question is why is there there a hole over here this is for performing tracheostomy made of plastizot reinforced with anterior and posterior studs it has a molded mandibular and occipital support it restricts flexion extension due to chin and occipital support it is ineffective ineffect in controlling the rotation and lateral bending then next one is a modification of philadelphia collar known as a yale cervical thoracic orthosis it is modified philadelphia uh, reinforced with studs it extends down up to the mid thorax and there is a occipital support over there which extends the area of stability and support the poster appliances this is four post collar it has a anterior section made of sternal support two uprights and two chin and chin support the posterior has thoracic plate one or two uprights and occipital support this limits flexion extension rotation and lateral flexion all there are two variants four post and two post next one is a somi brace somi full name is sterno occipital occipito mandibular immobilizer it is a modified poster appliance consists of sternal plate one anterior strip holder for the chin two rigid metal rods for the anterior and posterior occipital support advantage no posterior support hence patient can lie down comfortably there is easy donning and doffing as it is of light weight this is a halo pelvic device it is used for treating cervical flex fracture dislocations it consists of a rigid metal or graphite ring attached to the skull four post attached to the ring proximally two anterior and two posterior distally attached to polypropylene waist the polypropylene waist which uh, may be either a half or a fully extended waist goes up to the 12th rib and full waist level up to the iliac crest 
then there's a minerva jacket this is also kept in exams orthos is made up of plaster of paris or thermoplastic when we were postgraduate tanaya sir used to uh, apply this made of plaster of paris nowadays thermoplastic has made life easy for uh, postgraduates also <laughs> forehead adaptation is there with occipital support then there is a chin support there is a body jacket that extends up to the 12th rib it is lightweight non invasive pins like halo pelvic device it limits flexion extension rotation and it was basically used for unstable cervical spine and uh, healing tuberculosis of the cervical thoracic region now coming on to thoraco lumbar spinal orthosis like t uh, the short form is tlso this description over here will uh, if you remember this one you can uh, put it in any of the devices that would be kept the purpose is effectiveness of abdominal musculature in raising intra abdominal pressure range of movement is reduced alignment is modified as per the need of pathology the advantage is decreasing the pain by restricting movement increased intra abdominal pressure reduces strain on the disc modification of skeletal alignment can be done disadvantages weakness due to reduced functional demand muscular atrophy contracture following immobilization principle is based on three point pressure one pressure point and two counter pressure points so taylor's brace is <clears throat> one of the example then there is a jewet hyper extension orthosis or a molded plastic or a chair banks sternal pad so taylor's brace which is commonly kept in exam you should know everything about it it consists of two thoraco lumbar posterior uprights a pelvic band a interscapular band attached to the axillary strap and stabilize the upright there is a axillary strap and an abdominal corset which decreases the forces applied to spine by converting abdominal cavity into a rigid cylinder jewet hyper extension the modification now that is commonly available is a ash brace ash full form is anterior spinal hyper extension brace the three point pressure that prevent flexion are sternal support pad supra pubic pad and thoraco lumbar pad posterior <clears throat> comparing taylor's brace with ash brace suppose both the imply i mean orthosis are kept in the table the examiner is definitely going to ask you which one is better so these are the points that you have to remember taylor's brace provides three point pressure system to limit flexion it is there are posteriorly directed forces from the pelvic strap anteriorly directed forces from the upright and posteriorly directed forces from the chest and axillary strap whereas ash brace the point pressure system is in hyper extension the posteriorly directed force from corset or abdominal support anteriorly from pelvic band and anteriorly directed force from the posterior upright so when we was discussing the basic of tlso we spoke about the three point pressure system so everywhere you will find there are two uh, two posterior and one anterior over here and two anterior and one posterior in ash brace so if you don't remember which one is what you can say sir in the taylor's brace there are two posterior uh, the posteriorly directed counter forces and one anterior whereas in ash brace it is the reverse coming on to the knight's brace it is it restricts extension and flexion but allows lateral flexion it consists of a pelvic band and a thoracic band both are connected by two uprights in the paraspinal region and laterally by two lateral uprights so this is a very important thing what is a corset and how it is different from a belt so corset is something which has lace tied up if you have seen those uh, uh, colonial type of movies or uh, queen elizabeth's dress up you'll find she wears something like this over the gown this is a corset which does not have any metal insert but laces to tie uh, this belt over the body so in uh, lumbosacral belt the disadvantage is it increases the trunk stiffness results in greater number of uh, agonist muscles shutting off in response to quick force there is subtle neuromuscular adaptation occurring during the initial use of lumbar support 
which predisposes to wearers to injury after they discontinue the use. Now coming on to corrective type of spinal orthosis, either of them would be kept in exam. These are used in scoliosis management. One is a Milwaukee brace and the other one is a Boston frame. So the first question asked is at what the degree of scoliotic curve you are wanting to operate in before uh, where you will use these braces. So it is always a cutoff of 40 degrees uh, scoliotic primary curve. If it is more than 40, you operate. Less than that, you can give a trial for either of these braces. The Milwaukee brace has an occipital pad, a kyphos pad, and a pelvic girdle support and a waist groove in this uh, polypropylene. Then there is a post, there are two posterior uprights over here. So it was described by Blount and Schmidt in Milwaukee in 1940. Yeah, one of the tricky uh, question is Milwaukee was a person? No, it was a place where this was designed, Milwaukee University. Initially, it was used as maintenance for post scoliotic surgery. Nowadays, it is used for correction also. Then the further details you can read it from uh, Stewart Hallett. There's a lot of uh, information given about it. Now, coming on to Boston's frame, it is a TLSO to hold 20 to 45 degree of curve. It lacks the metal superstructure, hence, it can be worn inside the clothes over a band, uh, vest. Daily use of the brace ranges from 16 to 23 hours. It keeps the lumbar area of body in flex position by pushing the abdomen in and flattening the posterior lumbar contour. Pads are placed at apex of the curves to provide pressure and area of relief. We want to lower limb orthosis. This is always kept. That is a ankle foot orthosis AFO. Whenever it is given in exam, if this splint is given to you, you are not to say a foot drop splint. The exact name for this is a ankle foot orthosis. It could be made of metal or plastic. Can be used to correct varus and valgus deformity. And it consists of a calf belt, metal upright, ankle joint and a stirrup. Foot drop splint like this would also be kept and it is a shoe insert designed with a dorsal shell made of polypropylene with a leaf spring action. It supports and stabilizes the ankle and foot in all foot drop condition. There is an effective foot lift, uh, lift and leaf spring action. Can be worn with any shoes. It is customizable and thin walled and lightweight. Now coming on to knee ankle foot orthosis. It is made up of medial and lateral uprights, has upper and lower thigh bands, a calf band, and ankle joint stirrup. It provides knee stability by the three point principle, where stabilizing force is applied by anterior knee support. The thigh band and calf band or shoe provide the counter forces. Medial lateral stability of the ankle joint is provided. When it is given to paraplegics with neurological level L1 and above, which is a modified CAFO, it has a modified posterior thigh band over here. There is a band over here also, a calcaneal band and a tibial band. The type of orthotic <coughs> knee joints can be a free motion, a drop joint or a Swiss lock. A offset joint or a dual axis. Most commonly used one is the drop lock. This is a hip knee ankle foot orthosis HKAFO. It is same as CAFO but with a external hip joint support and additional pelvic band to stabilize the hip. Modification is a reciprocating gait orthosis. If your viva is going very uh, good, an examiner wants to know whether you know something more, he can ask you what is a modified HKFO. Then you can answer that it there is a reciprocating gate orthosis available.
then there's a swedish knee cage it is used for genu recurvatum used in mild to moderate recurvatum deformity it may be a non articulated or artic articulated variety modification is a madras knee cage which was which has a supra patellar bursal pressure point other below the neck of fibula and mechanical knee joint fro flow reaction orthosis it was described in 1969 by saltiel for the use of weak quadriceps basically fro is used for weak quadriceps and weak plantar flexors it holds the ankle in equinus to prevent the heel from touching the ground as the body weight brings the heel downward the supra patellar band presses the knee backward preventing knee from buckling this is how it works it allows the knee to flex during the swing phase when the foot is off the ground so this is the reacting force on the knee the weight of body over here thereby it prevents buckling of the knee joint it can be used in lower limb paralysis with weak quadriceps like polio cerebral palsy and other neuromuscular condition it went into disrepute initially among the polio patients because the flexion of knee during swing phase led to tearing off of the pants and this is a ctv corrective shoe either it could be a dennis brown bar it is device attached to the bottom of child shoe and worn at night the splint consists of a spreader bar two metal plates or brackets to which the shoe is attached or it could be a skin bag uh, brace this is the bar attached to a straight last open to sh toe shoe the degree of foot abduction is required to maintain the abduction of the calcaneus and forefoot the medial soft tissue remains stretched only out now only if the brace is used after casting in the brace the knees are left free so that the child can kick them straight the abduction of the feet in the brace combined with the slight band the convexity away from the child causes the feet to dorsiflex so why the skin back frame has a curved bar because the abduction of feet in the brace combined with bend causes the feet to remain dorsiflexed for unilateral case the brace is set at 60 to 70 degrees in external rotation and 30 to 40 on the normal side in bilateral it is set to 70 degrees this was discussed yesterday also the brace should be worn for 23 hours for first 3 months after that child should wear the brace for 12 hours at night and 2 to 4 hours in the middle of the day a pavlik harness is a dynamic flexion abduction orthosis used in treatment of ddh in children up to 6 infants up to 6 months harness usually leads to stability of reduced hip within 4 weeks if there is teratological dislocation present pelvic harness is not used the other use of pelvic harness is in uh, infants having fracture of the shaft of femur now coming on to what is a prosthesis and how is a prosthesis defined last few slides now prosthesis is defined as a artificial replacement of a part or whole of a lost limb the few first the first hip disarticulation was done by william care tarso metatarsal disarticulation was done by lis frank he was a french surgeon ankle disarticulation by james sim from edinburgh myoplasty was first described by burgess in 1956 immediate post operative uh, prosthesis that is a pylon was described by michael belmont in 1958 and such foot was uh, devised by the university of california in 1955 the terminology for amputation has now changed from below elbow to transradial above elbow to transhumeral below knee to transtibial above knee to transfemoral symes is uh, ankle disarticulation hemipelvectomy is known as a transpelvic Sang's prosthesis. This was a theory question. Uh, this is this is a common theory question, which is asked in exams. What is a Sang's prosthesis and modified Sang's prosthesis? It has been. It uh, Sang's prosthesis have an end bearing for shock absorption, full end bearing, more distal end bearing, more proximal patellar tendon. Now coming on to lower limb orthosis, there is. Uh, these are the parts of the uh, prosthesis. One is a socket. the other one is knee third one is shank and a foot ankle the socket could be a silesian bandage or a pelvic belt 
the knee can be a single axis constant friction knee shank would be a crustacean knee or a modular shank pylon knee the foot could be a jaipur foot or a sach foot so the sockets that are used uh, for below knee are either a conventional sockets or patellar tendon bearing sockets and, uh, these are this is a lot more detail which is not required this we have discussed now coming on to another important part what is a satch foot how is a satch foot different from a jaipur foot satch full form is solid ankle cushion heel it consists of a solid heel made of wood or metal which is known as a keel directly attached to the metal block cushion heel is made of rubber heel wedge or alternative layers of soft and hard rubber modification nowadays which is available is a solid ankle flexible keel energy storing foot are also known as dynamic response foot you should know about professor p k sethi padma bhushan mexese award winner who devised this type of foot modification for barefoot walking known as a jaipur foot what was the need and what were the changes the foot piece should provide barefoot walking appear as normal as uh, uh, appear as much as normal as the other foot outer surface should be water resistant for working in fields should provide dorsiflexion to permit squatting scope on in, of inversion and eversion should be there to permit walking on uneven surfaces and transverse rotation between the shank and foot piece should allow dampening of the shear stresses material used is a vulcanized rubber because it has el elasticity and strength and it is waterproof vulcanized rubber is obtained from worn out tires the inner filling is of microcellular rubber which is used in hawaii chapels wood is used in around to provide anchorage and bolt fixation initially the forefoot was also of wood but it has been found that it provides rigidity on heel raise hence it was replaced by mcr rubber now this is one of things which is asked in exam what is a turning table type of hip disarticulation prosthesis tilting table prosthesis is made up of leather or plastic socket that encloses the stump and suspended by pelvic belt attached with external hip and knee joint and there is a saucer type shallow saucer like socket over the ischium and in the canadian it is made up of plastic or metal close to the ischial tuberosity these are the different types of uh, prosthesis now uh, coming on to the last slide up i think last few upper limb prosthesis the components are suspension sockets elbow units and externally powered myoelectric or switch control hand support so the suspension is a figure of 8 which is uh, this is tied around the opposite side of uh, pectoral girdle there is a chest strap and suction device the socket is a standard above elbow socket is used the elbow unit has a body powered external without spring internal with or without spring or internal with rotating table so there are two types of hinges that are used the forearm shell equal to the forearm of opposite side then there's a wrist unit which may be mechanical or electrical and the terminal device or body powered hand body powered hand means there's a spring attached to one of the pectoralis muscle pectoralis major which contracts by which you can use the uh, this these the claws to work as a hand for functioning devices thank you for your patient listening uh, jain thank you so much and you did a very exhaustive lecture you have covered everything uh, which is possible and i'm sure our students must have benefited great and uh, you see the just to remind the uh, double awaaz aa rahi hai ek off kar do just to remind the students the common thing which are asked in the examination is 
science processes, PTB processes, then they are asked about the lumbar sacral corset, the braces, and then they can be asked about the Jaipur food, Madras food, and these are some very common uh, orthotic and prosthetic caliper, mm -hmm. etc., are asked, and they should the students should know. And you, know, you can uh, fetch quite a bit of marks from these things. So if anywhere you have gone wrong in your long cases and short cases, this is the places where you can really uh, mm -hmm. fetch marks and try to compensate about these things. The lecture, of course, by uh, Salunke was superb as ever. He's, uh, he, he gives his lecture with great passion and with great energy. Uh, Abhishek, I have, Abhishek, you are there? Abhishek? Yeah, yeah. Sir. Are, Hello, sir. Are, oh, sure. Abhishek, I have a, uh, just one uh, question. Yeah, can you just stop sharing? Uh, when you have been doing the keratage in these uh, benign yeah, tumors, right. and then you have been putting the bone cement, you said you have been using routinely gel foam. We have been also doing, but we don't use gel foam. Is it essential to use a gel foam every time? Uh, no, sir. Not compulsory, sir. Yadi aapko sandwich, okay. We are doing sandwich technique. Sandwich ah. technique. Then only okay. gel foam is useful. Otherwise, okay. we can directly apply cement over the articular cartilage. Right. The and we are also doing augmentation by using one or two screws, which gives more strength to the cavity. So uh, sir, a plate will be more better idea uh, as compared to screws. Plate okay. will be more better idea, sir. Uh, okay. Sir. Uh, 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 it's called a bead effect, sir. It prevents uh, coming out of all of the cement out. So okay. uh, yeah. plate will be more better. Okay. And uh, are you using the liquid uh, nitrogen very frequently? Uh, sir, we are using in malignant tumor, sir. Benign, we are not using. In malignant tumor, we are using. Malignant right. tumor. So I think the sandwich technique was described by, in ta by, uh, by the Tata Memorial people. Yes, and sir. It was basically, when you had a very distal, so you had very little, uh, almost nothing left between the cartilage, particular cartilage and the bone. And the idea was to try and prevent the heat from the cement damaging the cartilage. So that's why the sandwich technique was described. So mm -hmm. you mark bone and you put in, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, so abs 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 between the uh, cement and the articular cartilage of the joint. Yes, so we have a publication of modifying the, the sandwich technique because yes, the sir. bone graft have a tendency of penetrating into the joint again. So we yes, first put a gel foam. Yeah, you can do bone it either graft, way, yeah. Then again a gel foam layer, then the bone cement. Yes. So uh, in a very thin subchondral area of uh, a sliver of cartilage and subchondral area, it gives better result for what was. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Abhijit, you have been uh, recommending that uh, any patient of the tumor which comes to you, yes, one sir. should take an X-ray. Yes, sir. Then take an MRI. MRI, yes, sir. Then, if need be, CT scan and yes, then do an biopsy. Okay? Yes, uh, even, even which is a clear cut case, benign tumors, you will still. Oh, sir, uh, we are following, sir, this in all cases, sir. Because we have experienced that radiologically 99% it's benign, but it has turned to be sarcoma, the example which I showed. Uh, it was radiologically looking classical aneurysmal bonesis. MRI showed it's a, a fluid fluid level, classical of aneurysmal bonesis. But it turned out to be sarcoma, sir. So, uh, except, sir, uh, osteoid, osteo, exostosis. So, in few cases, like exostosis, we are not doing biopsy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exostosis. Uh, in uh, osteoid, osteoma, we are not doing biopsy. But mm -hmm. in simple bone cysts, we are doing biopsy. For aneurysmal okay. bone cysts, sir, we are doing biopsy, sir. So, so only the two cases, we can say we are message is that even if the benign tumor it's yes, good sir. to do a biopsy. Yes, it's, always biopsy. Safe, sir. it's always safe for the patient and surgeon. It's always On the safe it. side. It's always okay. better so, for the patient. I, I think in children who come to you with a fracture through a simple bone cyst, yes, sir. that's a different situation. I mean, you, some of them you just treat conservatively and they heal. Yes, sir. So, so you wouldn't very, uh, at that stage, uh, would you? Uh, so biopsy still we are doing, sir. Even at we that stage doing. in a child where you say all this, you've got the classical signs and they have a fracture and they heal up in no time at all? Uh, so it's always better, sir, because... If you're planning surgery, yes, but I think... No, sir, we, uh, for simple bones, sir, we are just giving steroid inside, uh, intralegional yeah. steroid. 
so uh, first we do biopsy wait for 5 days for the biopsy report and second stage we are giving either sclerosant or aneurysmal bone cyst or simple bone cyst just steroid uh, we are sir avoiding surgery sir no curative no, no, but i'm saying if so we have patients who come with a fracture where we wait for it to heal yes sir so in so that very, stage do you do, do a biopsy or would you wait for it to heal very classical of simple bone cyst on mri we are confident then only sir biopsy should be avoided I know. I, I mean, sir, so depends on the sir. Means at your experience, you have seen sir thousands of simple bone cysts. No, no, no. The experience, simple... experience can go wrong very easily. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. It happens. I mean, I, I yes, think uh, especially between something like Ewing's and osteomyelitis, etc. Yes, sir. Ewing's sir. It's very, very common. Difficult to tell we see it uh, because multiple surgeons uh, have thought it's osteomyelitis. So it's they always better to age. biopsy those. Yes, sir. It's always safer side, sir. For the benefit of, but I think simple bone cyst in a child where everything is classical, I, I'm still oh, so that situation we can avoid, sir. Then we can avoid. Sir. But I, I, okay. I think as a rule, it's good to say biopsy everything because that yes, sir, it's always better, sir. Better because sir, we have seen uh, at least one rotted sarcoma every week, sir. That common rotted sarcoma. We are publishing yeah. a paper on that, sir. Yes, it's under review. It's that common. we have a 1k uh, which was a lesion in the i think tibia in a young child and uh, uh, looked like to be a tumor uh, also a infection we did a biopsy we remember what you said we did a biopsy biopsy was sent at two places report came as osteomyelitis so we treated the patient as osteomyelitis later on it turned out to be osteolytic sarcoma so yes, it has happened with us also sir at such a high volume center it has happened uh, with us also uh, yeah. we thought it's we do so in these cases twice biopsy repeat biopsy sir if we uh, are suspecting it's malignant it's not correlating radiologically and clinically we do uh, at least two biopsies sir and uh, so the other other uh, uh, fallacy is where you have a pathological fracture Yes, sir. And biopsy it, and sometimes yes, the callus yes, gets. Yes, sir. Callus, it is callus. Sir. Yes, sir. That is another thing that you have to be wary of. Okay, and uh, is there any question by the students? Any question by the student, Doctor Manova? You want to have any question? So. So, Dr. Nasir here from Delhi. Actually, I wanted to ask a question from uh, that open trauma. I mean, uh, there's you know some confusion in case where we should do a primary closure or secondary closure. So, what is that landmark when we should decide? Okay, in this case, the the trauma is fresh. The patient has come to the emergency, but that is uh, you know extensive kind of trauma. In that case, we should uh, do the primary closure or wait for the secondary closure. So, what is that uh, thing? Okay, so let's. Uh, do you want me to answer that, sir? Yeah. Is, uh, I don't think uh, Arindam is still here. If he is, I think he has gone, Arindam. Okay. So I think uh, you have to be careful uh, if you want to close a wound primarily today. The, there are certain things that you have to. You, it has to be a clean wound. You have to be satisfied with your debridement, and you should be able to close the. So get the wound ends opposed without tension. Okay, so these, if you follow these three uh, sort of uh, tenets very carefully, then you may do a primary closure. Otherwise, it's safer to delay your closure. Now, today with VAC, etc., you can delay closure by a few days without risking uh, secondary infection. But if you are absolutely sure, so say it's a type one fracture. The wound ends, uh, you're, you've divided adequately and you can get the wound closed without any tension, go ahead and close it. So, so if I, we talk about a uh, Gastillo and Anderson classification level, so in that case, can you tell me up to... So forget Gastillo and Anderson classification when you do this. You see the wound, see the contamination and see that you can get the skin edges close together without a problem, okay? So Gastillo uh, classification type 1 the size of the wound is not the important thing. Okay, unfortunately, if you look at Gastillo classification <clears throat> more carefully, there's more to it than just the size of the wound. And everyone just pays emphasis to the size of the wound rather than the rest of the details in the classification. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If there is uh, no other question, I think we'll stop the our academic sessions here, and we will start with a brief valedictory function. Uh, well, uh, my dear friends, uh, all the thing comes to an end, and I'm sure the many of the students has been uh, with us right from the last three days, and uh, it is very important for us to get the feedback from our uh, students. Um, Nasir, I have been finding you, you have been very actively with us all three days. What is your impression about our course? Uh, sir, uh, fortunately, I attended uh, last session 2019 when I was in first year. That was offline okay. session okay. in Indore. Okay. And so I found uh, this almost the same kind of thing. Only one thing was missing that was live case presentation. Yes. So if we can uh, make it a hybrid session, like all the three days uh, online and last one day for a few hours, if we can arrange, you know, few cases at the center and there the uh, students can uh, do the clinical examination and uh, do case presentation and that can be telecasted, that would have been more beneficial. And, uh, so, well, hopefully, uh, next day we don't uh, need the online sessions, okay? So we can have live sessions again. Let's see. Uh -huh. uh, now, say this... Uh, we also realized that this thing was missing, the real uh, demonstration on the live patient. I Hopefully, there will be no corona next time. And what we are planning that we will have our 27th course, hybrid course. It will be physical come uh, virtual so that the, we have got a feedback from many of the students abroad. They want us to continue this course. And in that, we will try to do a live demonstration, which can be seen abroad also and by the other students who are not attending this course. Okay. Yes. Dr. And Gokul, uh, you wanted to say something? Dr. Gokul? Uh, sir, the... good evening, sir. sir. I'm, I'm a final year DNP resident here in Delhi, sir. Okay. So I, uh, we tried uh, to attend most of the sessions, sir, uh, with my fellow PGs here, sir. In the first day, what I felt was that uh, the, was, the discussion part was a bit lesser. Uh, most of the queries went unanswered, sir. But uh, from the second day onward, uh, there was a conscious attempt that all the queries were answered, and those discussion sessions were very stimulating and uh, informative, sir. Uh, so, uh, and otherwise, sir, uh, the contents of the presentation and the quantum of knowledge on offer was immense, and uh, especially the, the classes on tuberculosis and Elizaro fixator that was mostly eye opener for us, all of us. So uh, other than that, sir, the discussion session should, matlab, it was informative, sir. That was really helpful. Uh, yeah, good. So maybe we can reduce the duration of the talks and have more time for discussions. But yes, sir, yes, sir. the sessions, there haven't been so many questions. So that's the other thing that you guys have to ask questions. Sir, sir. Uh, and what was happening? Uh, maybe uh, maybe lack of experience on our part. What we were finding is that uh, we couldn't find the question and nobody was asking the question and somebody might have put it on the chat. The, the, neither the chairperson nor the speaker was knowing what questions were. I think this thing can be better organized and hopefully uh, I agree with the, uh, with the uh, Dr. John that uh, we can have a more time for the discussion of these cases. Okay, Gokul, thanks for your participation. And you see, we all are very worried about, and you know that the president of the national board was in the inauguration, and we have already conveyed to him the, our concern of the faculty that the result this time has been extremely poor. And we are very, very concerned about this thing, and we want actually our students to have a very good past result. We'll try our level best for that. Thank you, Gokul, for joining us. And uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Patel, are you there? Ravi? Yes, sir, yes, yes. Sir, yes sir. you have to say something, yes, Ravi? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The course was very helpful, sir. And uh, I am DNB here, final year student, sir. And uh, it was very, course was very helpful in our exam. And it, it was very helpful to clear our defaults. And uh, it was the leading and finest course as our, our and it was very most praised by um, orthopods and uh, i was like to say that there is only surest way to miss success is 
to miss an opportunity and i am fortunate enough to have been trained by these stalwarts and this conglomeration of probably the finest mind in our, our orthopedic fraternity has made me wiser than ever before and i can't thank enough dr sir sir dr diketanaya sir and our all faculty teachers sir and for this uh, enlightening opportunity and uh, this course has been beacon of hope for the knowledge seekers in the field of orthopedic as uh, since past 626 year and uh, we are very helpful and thanks uh, sir very thank, thank, thankful to everyone who has burnt my midnight oil selflessly to enlighten us with their un- hard earned knowledge and thank you so much sir thank you so much thank you ravi teachers. thank you ravi so much for your feedback and uh, i think we wanted dr fedel and dr krishnu but both of them are busy somewhere uh, salunke is with us yes, at sir. the moment salunke you have been attending our course for quite few years yes, sir, i would like to have I'm your as a friend student, i started in 2006 <laughs> as a student so i am fortunate want... enough that sir i have uh, gone such a long journey from 2006 as a student Yeah, 2015-16 as a faculty. So as a faculty yeah. also, I'm here with for five six years now. Yes. Uh, so I'll be happy that we arrange a midterm, sir. Uh, this year again a course which will be physical, sir. I'll be happy okay. to. Okay. Uh, right. Because, right. Sir. Because I'm missing the indoor and your teaching, sir. Now. So nice so, of you. I'm also missing so, it. Right. So I'm and, doing uh, only one too much, sir. I'm missing all the whole lot of orthopedics. <laughs> right very nice uh, salunke for your sweet words we value that and uh, may i uh, just remind my all faculty members and my all delegate that this whole zoom facility has been being provided to us from last few years by the alembic pharma and we have uh, i think with us mr sachin mr jayendra and uh, rahul and uh, if they are here i would like uh, them to say a few words about this course and how they can keep cooperating with us in future also and how we can join the sachin sir alambic other programs also sachin yes yes sir thank you tanej sir and mukobad sir for giving us a, this opportunity continuously throughout the years and in future also we would like to have to participate in thank you. such a program so uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, such a nice program uh, you have given us uh, for to arrange thanks from my end thank you thank you janen you want to say something <coughs> sir uh, first of all uh, there is a nice program sir who actually in the pg student over the learning program over there now who actually the past the last year and this is the with your guidelines and your name in the frame uh, they have to learn the lot of things sir uh, we are just a mediator over there and thank you very much sir to give the opportunity to olympic in every year and the featuring also sir we have to plan the so many activities which is your the planning sir again sir thank you and we have the olympic sir thank you janay for your words and rahul are you there rahul yes sir uh, hello dr tanija how are you Uh, I'm fine, Rahul. Yeah. Yes, respected doctor. So it's been a pleasure from Alambic head office that I have been assigned to do this activity for the three days with you uh, guys. So I loved the session. I loved the way all the PG students are excited was excited about this program much before this program has been started, and a very brief um, collaboration has been done by students today. I learned a lot. I mean. Uh, i'm not from the medical field but uh, we are from a pharma field and we understand much of it i have seen many graphical views of bones cutting legs are dislocated so it was wonderful that i have learned a lot of things in the in this three days of the um, this seminar um, and uh, i hope sir uh, you would have loved our support from our side we will keep providing you support whenever the uh, healthcare professionals need from our side we will definitely be with you uh, today in the past we have been with you today we are with you and in future if there is anything we'll be at your service sir so thank you so much all the faculties all the people from alambic pharmaceuticals thanks a lot thank you so much thank you rahul so much and uh... we are very grateful to whole olympic team i will now request uh, 
the chairman of the Orthopedic Foundation of India, uh, who is responsible for organizing this course for the last 26 years. And we have been doing a lot of other courses also. Over to John for his final comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Taneja. I, I don't think I'm responsible for holding the PG course. It's all your initiative, but uh, we've been, uh, it's been a collaborative effort. Uh, and I, I have been involved with the PG course for the last many years. And uh, it's amazing the popularity that this course has had over the years and is still growing. So uh, uh, till two years ago, we used to have it as a physical course. The last two years, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it, uh, we've had to have it online. But uh, the response still seems to be very strong and the demand for this course is still very high. And hopefully uh, the students attending it are gaining from it. Uh, both, both the postgraduate as well as the DNB Auth students. Uh, just would like to thank all the faculty for spending their valuable time to be involved and to participate with uh, us on this course. Uh, all the other people, the secretarial staff, uh, the pharmaceutical company for their help. And of course, all the participants, because without them, the, there would be no point holding the course. And uh, lastly, of course, Dr. Taneja was really the uh, heart and soul behind this entire uh, program. So with these few words, I would uh, just say it's a great job, well done uh, by Dr. Taneja and his team, and uh, also by all the faculty uh, for spending their valuable time and imparting insightful knowledge on the various topics. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, it is my duty is now, of course, Chairman has thanked everybody. You all will be very happy to know that this time we have the students from 15 countries. And uh, you see on an average about 100 students were stuck to the, their laptop. More than yesterday I checked from the YouTube, more than 800 students have seen those lectures already. And it is already on the YouTube. And uh, the, the Ortho TV people have been very nice. They, there was a live demonstration and the live relay of the whole program through the ortho TV that's been extremely good. No courses of any value if there are not many good audience. And this is what we always get encouraged. The students come, join us, and then they send us their feedback. Sir, we want this course to be continued. So we get encouraged and continue these courses. The faculty, you know, they we chose the faculty very carefully. And all the faculty members who have given their uh, lectures here, they have been all internationally renowned faculty and their work is uh, internationally recognized. They are extremely busy people in their profession, but in spite of this, on the request of the our Orthopedic Foundation of India, they all come and make their very significant contribution for our students. The, I have no words. The Alembic has been extremely kind to us and has been helping us in conducting this thing. When I wanted to do this Zoom by myself, I was finding it very difficult. And there MR here, Rahul, who was an extremely nice person. And he said, sir, let me uh, help you. I'll talk to the, my IT department in Ahmedabad. And I will see that if we can do this course for you. I was very relieved. And that is how we got connected with the Olympic people and the whole team of the Olympic. They have been very, very nice and they have taken the responsibility of seeing that our program goes very well. And uh, the, my uh, Professor Bangani, uh, who is just like my elder brother, all the time with me for three days, helping me, guiding me, supporting me. And Dr. Bangani, I'm very grateful to you. Thank you my sir. two secretaries, Meghna and Purnima, they have been working very hard, getting in touch with all the students, with all the faculty members, and trying to get the whole program going on very well. I'm very, very grateful to them. And I hope that uh, we will continue these type of programs next year also. Hopefully, it will be a hybrid program. On uh, 26th and 27th March, we have another very important activity of the Orthopedic Foundation of India, that is the OT technician course, in which we are expecting about 150 OT technicians from all over the uh, Madhya Pradesh. Already registration have started coming. 
This is another very popular course, which will be 23rd OT technician course. So we are going to hold it on 26th and 27th of September. Those who want to join us, they are welcome to come and get contact with us or with my safety. Thank you all once again for being with us and supporting us and encouraging us. Thank you. Have a nice day. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, people. Thank you, now I will thank be you so much, ending the session. So thanks a lot.